Rivers in Blood by Dennis Santanello. Narrated by Dennis Santanello. Copyright 2022. Chapter 1 Soto staggers. Another swamp lies ahead. The thick country grass comes to his chest. He mounts his horse. In the suffocating air, he pulls his horse through the mire. Through the distance is a great land. The land of Mabilia. A land that will not return. One hour elapses. Soto dismounts and goes on foot again. No man comes near. His eyes grow wary. His beard is old and gray. His pale face slowly dies. He makes a fire. A lazy smoke lifts. He takes out his sack. Inside is a freshly severed head. He places the head on the surface of a stump and stares at it reverently. The head sits still. Its blood is dried and crusted. Its eyes are shut, and flies hover around its broken yellow teeth. Then Soto places his hands on the head, and he speaks to it as if it were his long-lost friend. Good day, O king. It was a good day, wasn't it? The fire dies in the wind. Soto sparks another tinder and throws a set of twigs under it. The fire grows. Soto warms his hands. He whispers and prays. Oh, great king, keep rejecting my every word. I don't mind. I don't mind at all. A compromise. Yes, that's what it was. I knew you'd understand. Wasted, was it, you say, O king? It doesn't matter. We'll have to face it sooner or later. And thou slayest. Flames. Blood. Rivers. It's all the same. Soto laughs. I wish you knew her, but you should have seen her. She was beautiful. She broke me. She broke me to fucking pieces. A horse rides up. The rider dismounts. Moscoso, Soto's second in command, makes his way forward. Sir? A silence. Then a spiral. Soto nods his head. Sir? Soto walks towards the swamp. Moscoso follows. It starts to rain. He returns to the severed head. He grabs it by its hair and smears its face with his bloodied finger. Then Soto screams. It is the shriek of the ever damned. He tosses the head and smashes it to the ground. He rushes over, kicks it, and watches it roll down the hill. Then he screams again. The rain stops. The air sears warm and clean. The evening draws, and the moon shines into place with blue embers. Soto's eyes are stained red with shrieks of rage. Soto laughs, and again, Moscoso appears before his side. The scribes, they've returned on Hernando. Tell them to wait. Soto walks forth the river. In slivers of daylight, 
He makes it to his man and surveys. His eyes twitch to the river. His mouth hangs open. He gives into the gaze, a gaze which started ten years ago in Peru. But it is a haunting memory of which he can only see glimpses. His men march, some on horses, most on foot. There are 200 of them. All of them are veterans. All of them are tired. All of them carry 50 pounds of heavy armor made out of rusted steel and iron. They are slow in pace, but methodical. They stagger, just like their commander. Their faces wince in pain. Soto gets off his horse and wipes off his brow. Again, Moscoso rides to his side. He surveys the land, the swamp, and the trees. And the tide pulls in. Here, Moscoso. It's here, just a little deeper. Sir? Soto smiles dementedly. He turns to Moscoso, then mounts back up and rides off. Moscoso shakes his head and squints to the river before him. Soto rides on as his army marches further. The clangs and clamor of their gear overpower the whistles and chirps of the birds. But what overpowers all is the endless slush of the river. And it runs red with blood. I follow the river down and over. I had no idea how much time had passed since I left the desert. It felt like a year. It might have been half. It might have been less than that. It might have only been a month. I really couldn't tell. But in the dark, I saw every star. And throughout every day, the river showed me new lands of far and plenty. And it seemed to be my only friend. I kept asking myself why I was here. In years past, I simply wanted gold. But now, gold was the farthest thing from my mind. The Turk showed me other things. I learned his lesson. But still, I wanted an answer to my questions. What is this life all about? And why do I feel so empty? Every time I posed those questions, the river looked back at me. I felt a deep and pure feeling that I'd find my answers there. And I heard my father's voice call to me. At the river's end, my son. I felt a deep and pure I wanted to uncover my soul from that horrible bargain I had made with Satan. I wanted to see the God I once knew. I wanted to feel. And internally, I knew if I reached the river's end, I would find my answers there. As the days went on, I'd forgotten many things. When I rested, I didn't take a step. I just observed. The further east I went, the more the land had changed. The desert and the plains were all gone now. The land was no longer flat. Instead, the country was low and filled with swamps. The land folded inward into gentle hills and repeated over and over and the river soon turned into streams, light brooks, and sumps. In spring, the lush of grain soon covered the land, and when the heat rose and the rain poured, the air became humid and damp. 
and for days at a time, it felt as if I were in Peru again and in the madness of the jungle. There were times of peace, and equally, there were times of terror. But I still felt empty. I was alive, but I was alone. And I hadn't seen a soul since the day I left Coronado. At times, I felt like Marcos, convinced beyond reason in something that he just could not prove. And in my mind, I heard the voices rattle the voices of my past. They came and went and swirled in their own discretion. Some I listened to. Some I screamed back at, begging them to let go of me. But the voice I heard the most was that of my father. He had been dead for ten years, but I heard him so clearly. And each time, it made me cry. In my dreams, I felt his presence, and I saw his red, bright face light up in the dawn. I saw him sing and milk the cows, and I smelled the cheese and wine on his breath. But mostly, I heard him gently bellow out his tune. And each time, he sang the same three words. The river's end. My reason. My only reason. Each day he reminded me. And each day I followed. But still, my mind was plagued by thoughts. Horrible, haunting, lingering thoughts that I battled every day. I thought of all those horrors of Peru and the desert of all the souls I had taken, and all those thoughts, all those endless, horrible thoughts of guilt ebbed and flowed in the voices of the past. And whether in bright sunshine or the darkness of thunderclouds, the voices emerged. How dare you? How dare you, Sardina? What are you running from? You poor soul. You have no idea where you're going, man, do you? Such a goddamn fool. He's just another Marcos. There is great gold in this land. This river is death. That's all it is. Why in the hell are you following it? Follow the river down. Follow the river down? That's your plan? That's the stupidest thing I've heard in all my life. I should have never let you convince me. There is a land of Cibola, a land of Cusco, beyond, beyond. It is Cusco. Beyond, beyond. You'll never find. Dream, Sardina. When night fell, I looked upon the stars and saw the Turk's smiling face across the sky. And when I stared again at the river, the thoughts subsided. The more I focused on the river, the less I heard. And as I watched the river, I saw it bend and get deeper and wider with each mile. The water was clean and clear, and holy. I went in, but I did not diverge too far. And when I saw my reflection, I had seen how old I became. I did not recognize my face. The quiet returned. I felt a tremendous peace in my entire body, as if an angel had kissed me on the forehead. And over time, I learned to ignore all of the voices, at least for a while. This is because the river showed me two important things. I was not my past, and I was not my thoughts. 
and soon the only voice that remained was that of my father's. It was the only voice I wanted to hear. And every time I heard it, I cried even more. The river's end, my son. The river continued. It surged and tumbled and went deeper. At times, I thought it would boil over. But the only thing I knew for certain was that whatever I was searching for was bound to be there. The more I walked, the stranger the land became. Soon, I came across dense forests with enormous trees. There seemed to be a trail along the stretches of vines. Then it rained. It rained for eight days. More days went by. The rain swept and pounded. When the sun returned, I came across many strange creatures. I saw hawks and falcons perched high upon the timbers. I saw deers and fawns nuzzle at the thick grass. And along the banks, I saw otters swim across the river. I caught fish with my bare hands. Most of the time I ate them raw, because most days were too wet to build a fire. Eating this day reminded me of the people in the valley of the Corazons, and it reminded me of all the time that had passed. But the strangest creature I remembered was a wild boar. It reminded me of the pigs back in Spain but it was much larger. It was solid gray, and it swung its tusks from side to side. And when it ran, it made an ungodly squeal. And although I was starving, I stayed clear of it. My sword was rusted and about to fall apart, and I knew I couldn't take the risk. Weeks went by. I sat on the banks. And as the sun returned, I wondered how far I went. On one late afternoon, I came across a hill that was blue-green, and I spotted an enormous gray mountain. I could see its white caps and its gray boulders. On the backside, the slopes remained green and brown and filled with moss. I assumed that it went on for thousands of miles. More voices entered my head, but I paid none of them any attention. The only thought that surfaced was just how far I got and how much time had passed since I left Spain. More days elapsed. I saw that the river had split into tiny streams. I paused to see which one to follow. But then... I saw smoke emerge from the sky. I followed the smoke, thinking that a tribe was in reach. But when I got to the village, it was abandoned. The wigwams and huts were all empty. There were wooden statues of their gods, beasts and tremendous birds, all carved with such care. The smoke carried on. I searched further. Some houses were left intact, and some were burnt to the ground. I waited, I hoped, and I prayed. But for all those hours, I remained alone. Then, at last, I saw a soul. It was a native woman. She was young and tall. I saw her dash through the trees. I saw her face for a single second. It was covered in dirt and tears. She cried and screamed. But for that second, she was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. We didn't say a word. We just stared. She breathed in and out. And I saw the sadness in her eyes. We stared for another second as the smoke covered above. Her lips quivered 
and her tears rolled down her cheek. But then it was over. The moment passed. She screamed and cried and ran off and disappeared back into the woods. I ran towards her. The smoke grew denser. I choked and lost my breath. She was gone, and there was nothing I could do about it. Again, I took to the banks. I waited until sunrise. At night, the smoke cleared, and she was all that I thought about. She was the first soul I had seen in such so long a time. I imagined her face and the look she gave me. And the endless questions emerged. What tribe did she belong to? Why did she look so afraid? Who was chasing after her? And why was she left alone? I left the village the second I saw daylight and veered south. I saw the mountains east when I turned my head, and I tried to recount my steps. Throughout the morning, I came across denser hills. The rocks and stones below were coarse, and the soil grew muddier with heavy sands. Noon came. I went further south. In the tide, my mind had cleared. But then I heard footsteps. I kept looking back, and I looked up in the canopy. Then I felt a deep pain in my stomach. Something felt wrong. Then everything felt wrong. I heard a roar. At first, I thought it was thunder. Soon again, I smelled smoke. Then, I spotted a wooden craft bobbing up and down the stream. There was no one on board. I chased it down and saw two more rafts float across in the same direction. I pulled the first raft to the banks and noticed that there was something tied onto it. It was a leather sack. And inside I found cornmeal, dried beans, and a wooden cross. But folded deep within it, was a cloth. It was dried and torn and filled with holes. It was a flag of Holy Spain. I held the flag within my hands for about a minute, but then I let go of it and watched it float downstream. I turned away and went further into the forest. The wind turned and the green leaves fell all over. I felt my heart pound against my chest. Then I heard another thunderclasp, but still the sky was bright blue, and there was not a cloud in sight. I lost sight of the river and felt my boots sink into the mud, and it got harder and harder for me to move. Then I felt a familiar terror. I saw a body of an Indian laid on a pile of stones. It was naked. Its face was mauled, and flies had gathered all around. It must have been dead for three days. Its head was gray, and its eyes had been pecked out by birds. It reminded me of Brother Luis's corpse because of how sad and gray it looked. I said a prayer, wishing that it would somehow vanish. But when I opened my eyes, the body was still there. It remained gray, rubbery, and as motionless as the stones it laid upon. I left the body and moved slowly, like a blind man in the fog. I sensed a hum in the air as my boots dug deeper and deeper into the mud. Then I heard screams from near and far. 
I staggered on and saw a pile of leaves. And underneath it, I found another body. It was of a child. And as I made my way down further another fifty feet, I saw what I fear I would. And as I stepped to the edge of the slope to the fallen tree line, I found the ground littered with bodies. The more I looked, the more bodies I saw. There were hundreds of them. Most of them were dead, but not all. Some gasped for air through the fallen ash. I paced further. I left the marsh and stones. Then I heard more screaming. It rang out loud and dissipated. I looked all over, but I couldn't tell where it was coming from. I went as far as I could, trying to find where it ended. Then I heard it again. It was an ungodly scream that shrieked from all sides. Then a bright, bulging burst of light ran right across from me. It was a man on fire. And the smoke tumbled like a bellowing storm. Through the fog, I heard more voices. And as the smoke lifted, I saw the faces of those voices appear through the woods. They came in from a hundred yards away. They carried swords and helmets. They wore the same armor. And they marched in the same dragged cadence that was once my entire life. Then again, I heard the thunder. It shook the ground. But finally, I realized that it did not come from the sky. It came from a cannon. Shell after shell exploded and shattered the sky. Then I saw a giant oak splinter into pieces. And as I watched the flames ignite and burn the forest, I stood and stared and cried. And I prayed that it was all a dream. But it was not. The men marched on. The cannons roared. And in the fading daylight, I saw more men march about the land with swords in their hands. The dogs surrounded me. They lunged and bit at me. And the men pulled them off. They were all Spanish. They spoke to me, and I understood their words. I nodded and shook my head when they asked their questions, and they looked at me strangely. I walked further and saw more soldiers, but by that time it had gotten dark. They did not bother me. I presume because I wore armor just like them. They probably thought I was some strange, exhausted soldier who lost his way. I went about the fires and saw even more faces. And I stayed near the largest fire and tried to warm myself. A horse and its rider rushed out. A young man pulled on the reins, recircled, and shouted at the men. Don Hernando! Don Hernando! Where is he? but the man was not answered. Don Hernando! Don Hernando! The men pointed to the trees. The man on the horse looked back. A minute later, another horse came into view. Its rider got off the horse, addressed the other man, and continued to lurch through the dark. The man approached the fire. He held a bloody hammer and hobbled forward. His face came near. It was burnt, pale and old, with scars all over. But when I saw his eyes, I knew it was him. He spoke with a brittle tone. He came closer, squinted, then shook his head. 
Sardina. It can't be. The other men looked in confusion. The man looked at me long and hard. He neither smiled nor cried. His eyes looked shattered like broken glass. And as I stared, all of my past, the sorrow and the grief, the sadness and the horror, all came back to me and left me empty. Sardina. Soto. We did not embrace. We did not shake hands. We just stared. His hair was gray and thinning. He looked very much like old Francisco Pizarro in those lost days of Peru. And I could tell he was not the same man that I knew before. Much was lost. Much was abandoned. I noticed his grimace the most. He looked beyond hurt. That wry smile of his had been permanently erased, and a painful rage settled in his eyes. He looked like the oldest man in the world. The silence remained, minute after minute. He breathed in and out. I did the same. He stared at me longer, wanting to see if he could control my every move, but I remained still. We held each other's torture, wondering who would say the first words. And we stared. Then he spat on the ground and drew his sword. He looked at me again, lunged at a tree, and sliced off a branch. His face remained the same, cold, gray, and dim. And finally, Soto said the first words. He faked a smile and drew his sword back into his cloak. Still alive, Sardina. Thank God for small miracles. More men arrived. They stared and gawked. Another man on the horse rushed towards me. Who is this man, Don Hernando? Soto waved his hands, but the man continued to stare at me. At ease, said Soto. He's an old friend of mine. Leave us be. The men departed as ordered. We walked away from the fires and onto a private tent about a quarter of a mile down. We did not say a word. Ahead, I saw more soldiers. There might have been a hundred of them. I felt their stares. They looked old as stone. And the further we walked, the less and less I saw of them. Whose men are these? I said to Soto. These are my men, he said. All of them. We left Spain three years ago. Who is their general, I asked. He looked. Then he winced. Then he glared. I am Sardina. He took me to a dying fire. There wasn't another soul for what seemed like miles. We remained in silence. I tried to remember the day I last saw him. It was the day he departed for Spain, and I remained in Cusco. I didn't know how many years had passed. It might have been ten for all I knew. All that time. All that horrible time. We stoked the fire and put more wood onto it. The wind died down. The fire soon grew bright and large. For periods, all we did was stand and linger in the silence and stare at each other's pain. And when he gave me another look, that of disdain and pity, I knew why he wanted to be alone. 
all the questions in my mind surfaced to a boil. But I contained my urge to ask all of them, for I knew it would be too painful to cope with. I wanted to know what happened, but I didn't want to know everything, because I knew Soto had become a damaged man. When the fire was warm enough, we sat across from one another and talked. He asked his questions first. I knew I would have all night to ask mine. He asked me if Coronado, and I told him all I could remember. You followed the fool of fools. That stupid son of a bitch. So what happened to him? Did he die? No. He gave up. Gave up? We found nothing. The desert killed our souls. Coronado went back to New Spain. And you? I'm here, Captain Soto. That's all I know. But as I said those words, I knew exactly what to say next. It was obvious and absurd. It was inevitable and painful. But I had to ask it. What brought you here, Soto? He didn't answer. Again, he left it to silence. He drew closer to the fire. Then he took out his sword and let it aflame. But I asked it again. Why are you here, Soto? He let out a sigh. Then he looked me straight in the face. Probably the same reason you are, Sardina. He took out his sword, held it, then let go again. There's another king that lives not too far from this land. I've killed many of them. He went on. Why am I here? I'm here because of the same reason Cortez went to Mexico. The same reason that brought you and me to Peru. He winced and spat. Then he sighed and looked back at the fire. Dream, Sardina. Chapter 2 An hour passed. Both of us were tired. Too exhausted to even remember. But I could see Soto introspect. He looked as if he were deeply fallen down into a reverie, wanting nothing more than to sleep. We asked our questions. We told the truth. I had forgotten much, and it made me sad. Manco Inca, Soto said. Did you catch him? No, we never found him. I hadn't thought about Manco for years. I stared again at Soto's eyes. They were filled with pain. Then I asked about the Pizarros. But when I brought up the subject, he responded cold and flatly. They all died. And there was nothing more he wished to say about them. Then Soto began to ask me strange questions. He asked about Cabeza de Vaca. That name sounded vague. But in reality, that man was the very reason I had entered the desert. Did you see Cabeza de Vaca? Did you see Nunez? No. Then who did you follow? We followed his slave. His slave? No, that's not true. We followed a monk who followed the slave. And when I said those words, Soto simply laughed 
because it was true and absurd. As Soto stared at the flame, his sword became deep red. He stoked the flame and inhaled the smoke. And I looked up at the meandering evening stars. What's your story, Soto? Who did you follow? He paused and drifted his eyes. Then he allowed himself to think, and he went deep into his reverie. Back to Spain. Back when everything had made sense. And there Soto went. 1539, the year of our Lord. It was only four years ago, and Soto found himself lord of the manor of La Matestra in Seville, which was now his own. Each night, Soto lay beside his wife, and each morning, his wife remained alone. Because before each sunrise, Soto stood before a locked room and stared at his fortune. The room was cold and gray and finely swept. In the middle of the room, thousands of rubies and pearls were piled onto blood-stained swords. Along the outside walls was a painting of Soto himself, dignified and blessed. And at the head of the mantle were the stuffed heads of the great puma and complimentary jaguar. Then, of course, were the two marvelous beasts he had slain in Peru, his favorite souvenirs. But what mattered most were the twelve chests in the corner of the room, which were all his riches and glory of Peru. Three chests were filled with rubies, three chests were filled with pearls, and six of the chests were filled with gold. And with each treasure, a story and a memory. And as he stared, Soto thought long about the great Atahualpa and his swift execution. He thought about the sweat and tears Atahualpa held and all the prayers he sang, which went unanswered. And he thought about the smile each Pizarro gave him on that day. And how the whole of Kerimaka screamed. And the more Soto thought, the more he thought of the fate of each Pizarro and how they all died in their own way. In three years, everything had changed. Old Francisco was murdered at the hands of Almagro's son, Diego. Gonzalo and his cousin, Dariana, betrayed and abandoned each other on their quest for El Dorado and were never heard from again. And when Hernando, the responsible and noble Pizarro, the caretaker of Cusco, refused to obey the crown. He too suffered the same fate as his brothers. But out of all the Pizarros, Soto thought mostly about Francisco. And as he looked at himself in the mirror, Soto quickly came to a realization. He realized that he was no longer Captain Soto of the Pizarros. He was now Don Hernando and very much his own man. But oddly, there was no joy on his face. And as the hours passed, Soto thought more about Peru and what it must have looked like at the present moment. The thoughts dissipated. Soto opened his eyes. He was bewildered, alive, but still unsatisfied. His face let out heavy sighs of quiet despair. Something was missing. There was an ache and a pain. When he grew tired of his fortune, Soto moved out of his room and out into his hometown, Jerez de los Caraberos, and he walked for endless hours. He attended weddings and festivals, and was treated as the guest of honor. 
He dined with the court and drank the finest wine with every dignitary, including the king. But after a month of this, the joy had faded. And after six months, Soto's goodwill completely dissolved into bitter despair. At night, he walked in his sleep and strolled about the city as if he were a deranged lion. He swore and cursed and marched as if he were still in Peru. And though his wife comforted him the best she could, the Soto of the jungle remained. Having been in Spain for nearly a year, Soto's face looked forever agitated. He scowled most of the time. And in his days of relaxation, a glaring sadness of boredom seemed to be an internal fever which he could not escape. Yet the only thing that seemed to quell Soto were the men who returned ashore. They were bankers, beggars, and slaves. And they all had stories to tell. Stories naturally led to rumors, and the daily reports from Peru and Mexico flooded throughout the land. But La Florida remained the mysteries of all mysteries, and Soto and the rest of Spain became obsessed with it. Both Ponce de Leon and Panfilo de Naves explored the land and absurd fantasies of a fountain of youth and a mountain of silver dazzled Spanish ears for months on end. And after each conversation with the men, Soto fell deeper and deeper into trance. More months passed, and all Soto could think about was La Florida. His mind schemed like the rising sun. He calculated how much he would need and what he would find. And back he found himself in his treasure room with maps of La Florida covering his desk. And he stared with heavy eyes onto a map of a peninsula that stretched to an enormous land filled with mountains, rivers, and gold. It was a land that was explored, but it was not conquered. All of Mexico and Peru had been claimed, but La Florida had not. And Soto studied the maps in solemn silence, like a rabbi studying the Talmud. On one day, when he was deep in his study, Soto heard a rat scurry into one of the crevices behind the wall. It left a trail of dung on one of the maps, and Soto went after it with his sword. Later, he spotted the same rat chewing on a necklace of gold. Again, Soto chased after it, but the rat snuck inside the wall and hid beneath the crevices. Soto laughed, then left the room. About five minutes later, he returned with his bloodhound. It took most of the afternoon, but the dog did its job. He caught the rat, tore its back, and chewed it until it died. And when the dog was through, Soto stomped on the rat and watched the blood pour down the stone floor. More months had passed, and Soto remained alone. He looked back to the chest and all of his treasure, and his familiar scowl returned. And each day, an inevitable fact had returned to him, because each day, his fortune seemed smaller and smaller. La Florida, the next obsession. All of Spain wanted to know more, but the man who made La Florida true was the strangest man of all Spain. His given name was Alva Nunez, but for the rest of time, he was known as Cabeza de Vaca. He had spent seven years journeying from La Florida back to New Spain, and his was the most anticipated return since Cortez. Much that was said of him was made up, 
but the truth of the matter was that Nunez was indeed the last survivor of the Naves Entrada some 12 years ago. And when his ship returned to shore, all of Spain had collectively lost their minds. Rumors of him had spread from Mexico down all the way through Havana. His boat had been sighted in due course and was ordered to be protected by King Charles himself. And with Spain still doused in rumors, all knew that whatever Nunez had to offer would spark, ignite, and remind the whole of Spain of their old best dreams. On the day his ship landed, he was greeted by rich and poor men who had traveled 50 miles just to hear his tales. However, Nunez had no time. He was ushered by a dozen soldiers and summoned to appear to the royal court. And in two hours, he found himself on the grand dining table of King Charles himself. And as he made his way to the testifying chair, he stared at his audience. The room was filled to capacity, and the king and Soto sat with their backs firmly pressed against their chairs. For two days, Nunez gave his testimony to the court. He was asked question after question by the dignitaries, but his answers were vague and filled with speculation. Nunez was the treasurer of the Navaez expedition, and being the treasurer, all had thought he would answer in logical, sparse, and concise tones. But when Nunez spoke, he seemed startled, and at times, incomprehensible, as if he suddenly forgot how to speak Spanish. And as he told his story, it became clear that Nunez was a man who endured all too much. He was tall and lean, and his thick beard came down to his waist. He smelled of shit and looked like a beggar. And oftentimes he would switch and speak different languages. All listened and tried to comprehend. Much like Marcos, he spoke of grand tales. But unlike Marcos, Nunez's face was not of joy. Instead, there was a pang of sadness with each tale he told. He spoke of how strange and wondrous La Florida was, and how his captain Panfilo de Navares and his entrada were ransacked by Indians, and how they were forced to eat their own horses to survive. He also told the tale of how the surviving members of the entrada made rafts and sailed the ocean to another land and how he and his three partners became enslaved by the Indians, and his story went on and on. As the second day ended, the dignitaries closed their questioning and asked Nunez to estimate how much gold there was to be had. And Nunez, being the treasurer, spoke of gold, silver, and gems he found in the mountains. But he gave no specifics. Instead, he changed the subject to more ethereal things, like the ever-present God and the healing of one soul, and all but the clergy had understood a word he said. And after he finished, he was served immunity and issued out of the court and commanded not to say another word about the new land, and all were ordered to leave him be. But that did not dissuade the other court. That is, the court of popular opinion. Those who did attend the hearings made up their own stories and repeated them. And so the rumor spread across the land and flared like the raging hot sun. And throughout each day and well into the night, the men told and retold Nunez's tale with flights of fancy and wondrous ecstasy. La Florida is dangerous. They say there are dragons, fire-breathing beasts. He said they ate their own horses. I heard him speak. I was there. He spoke of other things. What did he see? Gold? Silver? Both. More! But he also spoke of the women, naked as the day they were born. 
Just like they said in Mexico. Just like they said in Peru. He's a liar. He's a goddamn fool. He lost his mind a long time ago. How can anybody believe him? I'm starting to doubt myself. Surely there's something there. Surely it's worth something. Nah, it's too risky. I guess it's the king's decision. Whose else could it be? This Nunez, this Cabeza de Vaca, or whatever they call him, he's a fraud. A madman. He could be. Or he could be the answer to our fortunes. He's a waste of time. Only a fool can believe his lies. But, as ordered by the king, Nunez lived in isolation. And although many tried, Nunez refused to speak with anyone. On one morning, Nunez greeted the sunrise. And as he gazed at the ocean, all thoughts and memories came to the surface. The waves crashed, and each time they did, he slipped and fell and remembered. And when he dried off, he made it back to his pen and piece of parchment and made another entry in his diary. But, for whatever reason, the words simply did not come. Another day came, and Nunez returned to shore. He stared to the shore and breathed in and out, trying to find the rhythm. He closed his eyes, and once he did... The reveries and the horror quickly burst into snaps of light. All the memories of a decade came rushing through his veins. A beach. A jungle. A desert wasteland. Bloodied corpses and endless swamps. His captain, Naves, standing on a skull, holding a bloody sword. And his friend, Artis, who had been captured and tortured. When the vision vanished, Nunez stood up and raised his hands. And when he opened his eyes, cold sweat ran down his face. He rushed back to his inn, went to his pen and paper, and wrote down one single word. La Florida. He stared at the word, and the word stared back. And as he closed his eyes to pray, he sensed somebody watching him. He turned his back, left, then right, but there was not a soul. And when he realized it, he returned to his pen. He had very little ink, but he wrote for hours. Somehow, he was able to remember everything, and his words soon surrendered from his mind and on to the page. He wrote from sunup until midday, until he just could not bear. And in the morning, Nunez returned to shore and gazed at the ocean. But there was one man who saw his every move that day. The man could not let go of his stare. The man wanted nothing other than to go back into the void and find another kingdom. And that man was Soto. Soto was still obsessed. He was still consumed. And for a week, he met Nunez before the morning tide and greeted him with a smile. For many, Nunez remained a disheveled man who spoke in tongues and who had clearly lost his mind. But to Soto, Nunez was everything. He contained vital and holy knowledge, and Soto persisted to squeeze every ounce of juice left in his soul. You and I have more in common than you think, he said to Nunez. They tell me a lot about you. I've heard your tale. I believe it. You don't need to convince me. You saw what you saw. I was there. I was in Peru. 
these bastards couldn't dream an ounce of what we saw. But still, Nunez remained silent. He remained lost in the gaze of the ocean, its salt and its waves, and the water came to his boots. You and I have a lot in common, Nunez. We've been freed. Yet, are we kings? Do we look as such? How far did Navaez go? Soto waited patiently, but Nunez gave no response. They call you Cabeza de Vaca. That's a strange name, isn't it? Is it a family name? It must be. And that's how they'll refer to you, decades after you're gone. Cabeza de Vaca. That strange man. The next days passed, but still, Soto persisted. You're a man of few words, Nunez. I respect that. They call us madmen. Dreamers. People who are unwilling to face reality. That's what we are. But they haven't seen what we saw, my friend. That is why they don't understand. And on the final day, Soto uttered the words that pain Nunez the most. La Ferrarida must be beautiful. That new world, I miss it very much. But do you know why, Nunez? All I had to deal with were savages. Savages only hide or need to be killed. This old world, this old Spain, it's filled with dignitaries, laws, morals, things that should not exist. I no longer trust old Spain. I much rather trust the savages. At least the savages of the new world have more to offer, more to hide. Those savages, Nunez, those beautiful savages. You remember them, don't you? Then Nunez finally spoke. He gripped Soto's arms and looked him straight in the eye. They are people. They are not savages. They are people. Just like you and me. Remember that. And when Nunez let go of his stare, Soto smiled and departed and never sought out Nunez ever again. And when Soto returned to his castle, he smiled. His future was settled and cleared, for it now all came down to a simple objective, to convince the king and afford a charter. It would be the last entrada to La Florida, and the dream would continue. The night continued. It had gotten cold and damp. The tops of the trees swayed as the winds grew stronger. I drew closer to the fire. But still, the silence remained. I wanted to say a word, but none came to me. And as I stared at Soto, I saw him talking to himself. He completely forgot I was there. His face was gray. He whispered incoherently for minutes on end, as if to recapture. And it was then that I knew Soto had truly lost his mind. He said three words. La Florida. The lady. The king. He mumbled and repeated. The lady. The king, they're all dead now, dead and buried. He ached and winced, then he yawned loudly. 
He spat to the fire and breathed with an open mouth. He reached into his pouch, and when he unveiled its cloth, I knew immediately what it was. It was the board. It was the very board he carried in Peru. He reached into his pouch and took out all the pieces. They seemed much smaller. They looked withered. There were cracks and chips in each stone. The game. The terrible game that taught me so long ago. Again, stared me square in the face. But I wasn't shocked. Eventually, I knew I would see it again. I tried to think about the last time I played. It was with Tovar, back in the plains. The stalemate no one had won. I looked at Soto, and he looked at me. No, I said. No what? I can't play. Soto laughed. Are you afraid? No. And why? I'm tired. Being tired is no reason. Every man in this army is tired. God is tired. What makes you so special? I have no interest, Soto. This is not about interest. This is about proving what you learned. Not just to me, but to yourself. I looked at his hand. It was scarred and burnt. It was black and locked into place. He aligned the pieces across the board. And as I looked at his hands again, I thought of all the souls he had strangled. And in my mind, I heard all their screams. Then, finally, the words I wanted to say spilled out into the open air. Why do you play this game? He looked at me long and hard. He wasn't puzzled, but he was agitated. He paused and thought long and hard about the question. Then he answered. I play for my mind, Sardina. Your mind? I want to see if I still have it. There was another pause after all the pieces were set. The leaves rustled and swooped and tussled against the fire. I thought about you a long time, my friend, he said. I didn't think I'd ever see you again. Let's see what you've learned. I looked at his eyes. He looked as if he would die at any second. Then he reached over and tried to hand me a piece, but I refused. Take it, he said. I paused and looked at his eyes again. They were red. They were filled with hatred, pain, and unyielding rage. Then he shoved my shoulder primed open my hand, and placed the piece inside. Take it. Take it. Soto forced his will and repeated his words. He too thought of the last game he played with another human being. It was a little more than four years ago, but it was not with Sardina. Instead, it was with the king, Charles V of Holy Spain. What was at stake was his charter to La Florida, and the only man he had left to convince was the king himself. For two straight months, the king denied Soto's charter. He did so with grace and kindness, explaining all the failures that was of Navaez and all the disappointments Ponce de Leon had surmounted, and he did so on three separate occasions. But it was the fourth time which mattered. And over a drunken night, 
the king once again invited Soto to his palace to dine. They talked, and Soto pleaded his case, and again the king denied him. And as the night went on, they ate and drank, and drank again. Then the king stood up and asked Soto to follow him. The king waddled. Having a tremendous fit of gout, he hobbled and leaned his weight on his stronger foot. Then finally he made his way to a locked room. He handed Soto a torch, and they went inside. Inside was all the royal treasure that amounted through the years. There were ten years of treasure. Soto's room was a sixteenth of the size. As you know, this is the reward, said the king. Should have been more. He yawned and clutched at his stomach. Then he closed the door. But as you know too, Soto, the risk is much greater. You understand my hesitancy. I do, my liege, said Soto. There is too much risk in La Florida. Too many things can go wrong. I can't afford to lose you, Soto. I know the risk, but I'm afraid if we don't, we might miss the tide. I'm sure you know its history. I know its history. Then you know of Navaes. I shall warn you once more that Navaes had the same obsession of La Florida. Navaes never returned from La Florida. He's presumed dead. That was eleven years ago. Excuse my frankness, my lord, but Navaes was an idiot. I hate to agree. Why is that, sir? Because I signed his charter. There was a bit of silence. The king took his chalice and finished all the wine. You look broken, Soto. I am. Why? I'm bored. To be honest with you, my liege, I haven't been so bored in all my life. But why? Doesn't Spain have everything? Is this not your homeland? It is my homeland. But the new world seems to be where my heart lies. What the jungle had, I cannot begin to describe. But I thought you said it was hellish. Wasn't it you who said it was the worst place God created? It was but I long to return to it. I have to chase this final dream. You're still hungry. I am, Your Grace. I've waited too long. Yes, that was intentional. I wanted to know what kind of man you were. So far, you've passed that test. Now on to the final test. The king held out his hand and uncovered a piece. It was a black bishop. He hobbled towards the oak table and sat down. Soto followed and sat across. On the table was a chessboard and two chalices of wine. I heard you were an excellent player. You'll get your charter. But you have to beat me first. So they played. They held up their chalices and sipped slowly. Soto glared at the board with hard eyes, and the king smiled. His eyes fluttered and waved. In the opening moves, the king forced a gambit and took Soto's knight. But the second he did, he fell into Soto's trap. The king moved his bishop. Soto captured another pawn. And after another two moves, Soto cornered the king's queen, and later, his castle. More mistakes followed, and the king lost more and more pieces. And Soto took piece after piece with tremendous joy. Then the king tried a desperate maneuver to check Soto from afar. 
but Soto easily deflected it with his corner pawn. And after a couple more moves, Soto closed the game and made it. In total, it only took 13 moves. The king sat in his chair. He was baffled, yet not all too surprised. You're certainly cruel enough, Soto, he said. That's part of the game, my lord, said Soto. You've played this game too long. Your methods are beyond me. Each man has his own method. Luckily, few men can see mine. I can see parts of it. Not the whole thing, though. This is a maddening game, Soto. I shan't play it any longer. Especially with you. Well, you've beaten me. And a deal's a deal. You've got your charter. Anything else you want, you son of a bitch? No, your majesty. Lucky for you, I have a sense of humor, said the king. Yes, your liege, replied Soto. A long silence lingered. After the game, a servant entered the room and handed the king a map of La Florida. Soto then drew up a chair and studied the map with him. Then the king spoke again and broke the silence. You must have a lot of trust in Nunez. Yes. Can I ask you why? He's a madman. As I am, your highness. We understand each other. You believe him? Yes. Yes, I do, your majesty. Belief is a strange thing, is it not? It is, your grace. I believe you, Soto. I shouldn't, but I do. If there is any man who is to conquer La Florida, it is you. Thank you, my lord. Just a word of warning. Yes, my leech. The game changes when you have total control. Keep steadfast. Keep your mind rested. And keep your glass full. You'll have your charter, Soto. I hope you find it all. And as the king approached his table, he picked up the parchment and quilled his signature. And the entrada was finally made official. Then the king merely raised his glass. And Soto stared, smiled, and did the same. Once the entrada became official, word spread like wildfire. Through the autumn, Soto recruited his men and assembled his chief captains, all of which he knew personally. He aligned several from Seville, including Moscoso de Alvarado and Balthasar de la Gallegos, whom he noted to be his Hidalgo captains. Others included Juan Anasco, who was the greatest mariner and cosmographer of all of Spain, and the royal factor and the king's agent, Hernández de Bedima. Later, both Nuno de Tabar and Alferez Diego Tinaco were summoned and pronounced captains of the cavalry. And later still, Pedro Calderón, the Portuguese, André de Vancocelos, and Cristal de Espendola were all promoted to Soto's personal guard. But before the ships came to the docks, Soto made his preparations and gathered even more men, including blacksmiths, butchers, pursers, boatswains, caulkers, general duty sailors, field marshals, and millers and weavers. But Soto favored and spent most of his time with the blacksmiths. They mostly held from Toledo, and Soto handpicked all of them. Soto worked side by side with them. He pounded and hammered out his own swords, and when he finished, the smoke arose. And he stood and smiled and beheld the final deadly product of beautiful Spanish steel. After several more months of gathering the men and supplies, the boats finally landed on shore. 
Hundreds of men from Spain and Portugal paid their fare and joined the Entrada. But before the ships left, the hundreds of men had waited, and along the sand stood two young men, Hector and Vicente. They were only eighteen years old and stood the poorest men in line. They both came from Badojas. Vicente was tall and prideful, with a brimming face of confidence. Hector, though, was much shorter, timid, and jittery. But both remained poor boys with lofty, aimless, and unattainable dreams. And, like all the rest, they stared at the ship and spoke painful, obvious words. I spent my entire savings, said Hector. Everything. All of my father's fortune. I have two, said Vicente. I have no memory of them left. I invested it all into this, said Hector. We'll have to make our memories, Vicente responded. But it's worth it, Hector. It is. It's worth everything. Because it is everything. But as the ships came to shore, their staring had ceased. There were ten ships. An hour later, another ten ships arrived. The men loaded all they had brought, and the scribes and secretaries recorded it all. They brought the essentials. Hundreds of pounds of cured meat and cheese, along with hundreds of bottles of wine and olive oil. Those who could afford them brought their horses. White horses from Balano, drought horses, and black Arabians that seemed the biggest beast of all. But aside from the horses, the men carried slings of arrows, coats of mail, sharp lances, ropes, saddle bows, crossbows, spades, baskets filled with gunpowder, and dozens and dozens of arquebuses, freshly made and polished. After the ships were loaded, the hundreds of men came to attention and gathered, and Soto approached them. He spat to the sand and looked back at the waves. Soto shook hands with the king, and the man waited for his speech, but no speech was given. Instead, Moscoso did the talking, and the formalities followed. A prisoner was brought forward to Soto. The captains incited his crime, which was petty theft. But rather than scold the man, Soto grabbed the man by his hair and hacked off his smallest finger. The man screamed, and blood dripped and gushed to the ground. Soto wiped his blade and made no other gesture. The man then was arrested in chains and brought off the ship. Then the king said his last words. God be with you, Don Hernando. Then Soto bowed, gave the signal, and climbed on board. The cheers subsided into silence, and the tide took over. Then the good south wind propelled, and the ships left shore. And on the sands, not too far from the jagged hilled slopes, stood Alvar Nunez the man forever to be known as Cabeza de Vaca. He stared at the very last ship that was in view. Then he closed his eyes, bent to his knees, and mouthed a prayer. When he finished, he stood back up. And when he opened his eyes, all that was left was the ocean. Chapter 3 But before they reached La Florida, Soto and his army landed in Cuba. There were several reasons for this, legal and otherwise. But for Soto, staying in Cuba allowed him to prepare. In that short time, his army doubled. Out of the thousands of servants and slaves in Cuba, Soto brought the most trustworthy and those who could interpret the most languages. 
He made his wife governess of Havana, and in haste, Soto hired an expensive lawyer and drew up his official will and testimony. Cuba itself provided quite an ample amount of necessities, included food and livestock. And again, everything and every number were recorded by the scribes. Two scribes in particular were assigned to write daily entries of the entire entrada. The first man was named Ranjal. He served as Soto's main secretary and personal valet. The second man was the gentleman of Alvas. He was a treasurer and a scribe who invested much into the entrada and chronicled the journey on his own accord. And although the two men hardly knew each other, the journals acted not just as documents, but as living evidence of all that would occur in La Florida. What they saw, they wrote down, and Soto was quite aware. Indeed, he was glad, because history was recorded, and the whole world would know. As the weeks passed, Soto cleared prior engagements and ordered the ships of the Entrada to immediately report to dock. Even more men wanted to join and lined up to be registered, but Soto did not wait. And on Sunday, the 18th of May, 1539, Governor Hernando de Soto left the town of Havana with a noble armada of nine ships. And on the 25th of the same month, land was sighted. La Florida, the land of flowers. They saw it by the moonlight. The ships set anchor, and the Spanish waited until dawn. A thick fog made the air dense and moist. Then the order was given, and the first platoon climbed out of their boats and on to the land. Their faces lit up in the dark by their torches. They rummaged through. Their boots slammed the surf. The land stretched on with swamps and trees. They followed tiny streams that led east. They heard the snaps of branches and the endless hums of the insects above. And the further they went, the more they heard a whirling sound. The sound of wind. They trailed off to sandbanks, muddied ravines and creeks, and they eventually found a widening river. Then the sun emerged. A bright, bulging, unforgiven blindness cast upon the entire land, and the Spanish sweated in their armor. And the monks and the priests blessed and kissed the sands. At noon, the captains gathered and peered beyond. Some stared at their maps. Fathers just stared and waited for Soto. They watched him appear as he staggered to the sands in a slow and methodical fashion. But Soto seemed amused. He seemed to take pleasure in the horror. He mimicked the birds and whistled through his teeth. He turned to his captains and gave them a cordial nod. Then he broke rank, staggered on, and went about alone. Soto crossed knee-deep into water and turned to see the stream bend to a perch. Beside the brambles, he followed the sunlight. Then he stopped. Below the brambles were petals of wildflowers that floated downstream. A strong wind swept more petals to the ground, and Soto watched the petals dance and saunter down to the water. They were of lavender and lilies, and they raced downstream in a swirling stew of magnified and bursting color. There were petals of white and crimson, of bright yellow, sapphire, and rich, deep blue orchids, and they rested upon each other and became a collective bed of flowers, an orchestra of beauty. Soto marveled at the sight but only momentarily. He drew a heavy sigh and stood tall. His captain stood beside him, 
They waited several minutes. Posoto remained in his own gaze. Don Hernando, said Moscoso. Yes. What shall we do with the natives? We will treat them kindly, as we always have. But if they do not act in accordance, we'll take them in as slaves. They will be vital. We need as many translators as we can get. Naves, what a fool. Then Soto barged forth through the swamp alone. For the entire day, Hector and Vicente unloaded heavy items from the ship and onto the sands. Their captain, Canales, a tall older man with scars on his face, stayed on the ship and observed them. He watched his men carry quilts and canvas. Then he watched them unload the caravans. Later, he watched them unload all the inventory of the blacksmiths, which included anvils, hammers, torches, and specialized flints. And later, he watched the men unload all of their excess armor, plates, shields, and helmets. Towards noon, two other ships had landed. These ships carried nothing but horses. Later came the oxen and steer. Huddles of goats and sheep followed, as did the immensity of flies. And the whole of the air stank and settled. Then came the artillery ships. The light cannons were first, followed by the medium cannons. Teams of lower-ranked men hauled the strips of wood and laid the weight across their shoulders as they climbed the sand hills. The last cannons were carried by teams of oxen and steers. In total, it took four hours to unload them all. And as the mules pressed on the hill of sands, the thousands of pounds of steel followed across. Finally, the last ship made it to shore. The men called it the pig ship, because frankly, it was. There were 500 pigs in all. Most of them were pink and gray, and some were as big as miniature horses, weighing 600 pounds apiece. Their eyes were black and dense, as if space itself. Hector and Vicente looked on and sneered as the beasts pounded their way forth. Their faces were smeared with dirt and snot, and what followed were a cacophony of flopped squeals, scalding screams, and a low rumbling of snorting. All of the hogs were from Trujillo and from good stock, and the majority of them came from Soto's investments he made in Cuba. It took 20 men to escort the pigs to shore, and it took another 20 more to set them up the hill. Overjoyed, the hogs took to their new lands, and like their captors, they relished and squealed and went and forged their way onward. When all the ships were unloaded, Soto ordered all the platoons to march a mile forward. They searched the dead trees of the marsh and came across dense swamps and tall grass. Soto then gave the captains leave, and as dark descended, the men from each platoon made their own fires. The air remained stagnant and void. Not a wind nor a breeze blew, and at sunset, the first five pigs were roasted, underneath giant banana leaves. The heat had stayed through the dark. The flies and mosquitoes danced and hummed, and as Hector and Vicente talked themselves to sleep, their platoon leader, Canales, came to their side. He looked at them with general disdain, but something about them made him smile. Then he closed his eyes and rested, but the rest of the Spanish kept their eyes open. They stared up at the stars. Their eyes were both young and old. They were bright and big and filled with uncertainty. The eyes of Vicente and Hector, the eyes of Moscoso, of Balthazar, of Juan de Anasco, and Cristal de Espendola. And for that night, and many nights to follow, their eyes of their general Hernando de Soto 
remain quiet, confident, and alone. Three days passed. The army marched north and slashed their way through thick vines and shrubs, three times taller than the tallest man in the unit. And eventually, when they had cleared a pass, the men's faces lit up red with blisters. Juan de Anasco led the horses down a narrow path, and around noontime, a new sight was revealed. Six miles down, ten men reported seeing twelve stand-in huts. Each platoon yelled back to each other as word spread, and soon a hundred men converged over to the huts. There were twelve tall straw huts, but each and every hut was empty. They found wooden bowls and spoons. They found spider webs and headdresses. Some men found spears and shavings, and still others found bones of fish and a trail of sticks and necklaces. Towards the edge of the huts, they found a fire pit that consisted of a circle of stones and black oily tar. Below, they found splits of gray thin wood. And in one of the huts, they found full plates of abandoned fish bones that weren't even a day old. The translators were ushered forward. They all confirmed that the village and terrain of La Florida was named Osita. And soon after, the captains gathered and waited on their horses. For a quarter of an hour, Soto expected each hut and retrieved tiny stones which he placed in his hand and studied. When he had finished, he returned to the pit. He drew his sword and held it for a minute. Then he sifted it back into his cloak. But there wasn't a look of joy on his face and the captains continued to wait for their orders. They were just here, said Soto. They probably saw our ships. Moscoso finally came to his side. Don Hernando. Someone must have warned them, said Soto. Have you found a trail? No, not yet, said Moscoso. Then what are you waiting for? The sun had died. Moscoso saluted, performed his orders, and moved the cavalry a mile west. And as the wind turned, a wail of rain pounded and poured onto Soto's army. But Soto kept his head up and pressed forward. His eyes studied the treetops high above, and the rain continued to pour. The next days passed. The land of La Florida went on. It was a constant hell of swamps and streams. And so the 500 Spaniards marched into its interior, fueled by dreams of gold. They were divided into platoons. Half went west to follow the coast. The other half went north and followed the streams. The cavalry slashed their way through the dense jungle. The infantry followed the hills of sand. But, inevitably, the sands dissipated to the marsh, and the swamps returned. Towards noon, the cavalry found the stream's delta. The delta looked clear like crystal. Beneath the canopy, the orchids again floated on the streams in swirls with hues of orange and crimson and green. The water was clear, and the stones and brooks scattered from east to west. Soto brought his horse to the water. He followed the streams on foot. He looked up and examined the tall trees before him. There were elms and oaks against giant sycamores, but Soto looked specifically at the low-level birches and sturdy pines. Then, Moscoso rode up to him. Sir, sir, said Moscoso. What are your coordinates, said Soto. North by northwest, Don Hernando. Exactly Navaes's route. Good, said Soto. La Florida is certainly the hell on earth I expected. Good. 
He looked again to the trees. These trees are very tall, he said. Yes, Don Hernando, they are, said Moscoso. We shall use them then, said Zoto. Cut them down and assemble rafts. We'll need them soon. Send two scouts two miles inland. Send a chopping unit. Send a hunting unit. Don't be afraid to make as much noise as you can. The order was given and the men went to work. They took to their axes and hacked and chopped. And as the rain strengthened, the men sliced and hacked until they gathered enough wood. The other men assembled the timber, tied the twine together, and hammered out nails. And as the heat lingered, their faces turned red as pomegranates. The rain strengthened. The fires died. Another endless fog took over. But the men continued to work. Their shiny armor had already started to rust. Their constant work continued through the day and well into the night. During the morning of the next day, six rafts were assembled. And at noon, there were nine. When the rafts were ready, the Spanish climbed on board. The men switched their heads to and fro. They looked at the treetops and gave into the dizzy hum of the insects. The rafts caught a current and raced carefully down the backstretch, but then the waters became still. While they rowed, they saw bright, small yellow birds, and beyond, they saw a pink and gray swirling skyline. They steered three miles, and within an hour, they landed on the banks. The new land was a dizzying stretch of marsh and sand. The captains gave their order, and the men trekked north. And as they did, a flock of blackbirds flooded the sky. The men porged forward, and the cavalry emerged alongside them. Then, it rained again. It rained for three straight days. The first day was mist and drizzle, and for the next two days, the rain poured into globs of steady sideways streams, and streaks of mud smacked onto every Spaniard's face. At night, Hector and Vicente slept through the heat and drizzle. Very often, they heard a wind. It was an echoing, drowning voice. Perhaps it was of a horror not so long ago, and the two young men spoke sparsely to each other. It feels like God is pissing on us, said Vicente. He must be, said Hector. He must have drunk the whole ocean. On the fourth day, the rain finally stopped. The army marched north through the swamp and cleared a path. All day long, the Spanish slashed away at the tall grass and dense canopies, and their boots sunk and submerged in unleveled mud. Later, they came upon islands of dead trees. Their boots swished and pummeled through the land. Their faces turned red, and their heavy armor became heated coffins. And although the heat had caused the men to vomit, they persisted and moved forward. And for days at a time, the rhythm repeated. The sounds of the swamps consisted of the howls of the giant blackbirds and the humming of swarming bees. Yet, deeper through the trees were the harmonies of stranger animals. Snakes and bats, bears and crocodiles. As a week passed, the captains had already noticed that their men were fatigued. What progress had been made was a mystery, and as the men came forth through the dusk, Soto examined them. He looked at his men and their puzzling, horrified, but determined faces. Yet, through the night, Soto seemed to be in constant study. He stayed awake in his tent, and by candlelight, he studied all the terrain from all the maps he had gathered. But day after day, Soto seemed content with the world and his place in it. Then Moscoso approached and interrupted him again. Why are you smiling, Don Hernando? I feel at home. Feel at home? 
that's close to it anyway. Sir, the men saw natives in the trees, but they seemed to escape. Should we go after them? No. Let them come to us. And when they do, chain them. They're scared. Fear will overtake them. We'll use it to our favor. Break them now. Let them know who their masters are. And never let them forget it. And as days went by, it was more of the same. They found no gold. And eerily, they found no native of any kind. In the water, the Spanish caught fish with their hands. But there were other beasts in the water. The natives called these beasts caimans, and they were enormous. One afternoon, Hector saw and studied several caimans shifting about the water. He watched one emerge above the water, and Hector stuttered and stood frozen with fear. It was the most hideous thing he had ever seen, but he could not take his eyes off it. He studied its movements and watched it waddle along the bank. Its scales were gray and hard and ribbed from top to bottom. It slid from side to side. It hissed and snarled, and its teeth glistened. And Hector just stared, petrified, with his sword in his hand. He walked along the bank and slowed his stride, but his gaze remained unaltered. The caiman opened its mouth and hissed, then it dipped into the water and disappeared, leaving ripples in the mud. A minute passed. Canales approached Hector and slapped him on the back. Ha ha ha, beautiful beasts, aren't they? said Canales. Careful, though. Don't stare too long. They'll suck you whole. As night came, the man rested. Hector, Vicente, and a slew of other men gathered near a fire. Among the men were Diego Valdez, a mean son of a bitch from Seville, Pedro Amaro, a blacksmith from Toledo, and Juan Garcia Naruda, a mysterious Portuguese man who played guitar. They played cards and drank wine and cursed at the mosquitoes that swirled above their heads. All told their tales of how poor they were and how rich they would eventually become after the entrada. And as nights passed, the rest of the men ate, farted, drank, and slept. And each night, Hector and Vicente stared at the stars and contributed to all the voices of the dark. All the gold in the world. I feel it. I know it's here, Hector. What will you do with your fortune, Vicente? I don't know. You haven't thought about it? Sure, i thought about it. But I just don't know. I've been poor all my life. I wouldn't know the first thing to do. Canales emerged from the darkness. He staggered to the fire and sat next to them. You two should sleep, said Canales. We have plenty of work to do in the morning. I can't, Captain, said Vicente. I don't see how any man can. Canales smiled. Then he looked up to the quarter moon and sighed. When you've been in this world as long as I have, sleep becomes the most important asset a man can have. I apologize, Senor Canales. I just have too many questions, said Vicente. You're young. You're supposed to ask questions. I was like you once. Don Hernando was too. That was a long time ago. I have the utmost faith in Don Hernando, said Hector. We all do, said Canales. That's why we're here, is it not? Just remember, though, Don Hernando is only a man. I knew him in Peru. I knew him when he was humble. He's a different man now. Tell me about Peru, said Vicente. I want to know everything. 
I'll tell you in time. But not tonight. Vicente held another question in his mind, but he waited a minute to say it. And when enough seconds had passed, the words came out fast and direct. What do you think we'll find? said Vicente. Canales took a cup of wine and drank it whole, and as he stared to the North Star, he spoke in wistful baritones, and his eyes fell deep into a trance. Now all the gold we ever found was in the city of some kind, and I expect the same case here. The Indians are not stupid. They hide their gold. Sometimes they hide it very well. I do warn all of you, these nights will be the death of you. You'll be men after this, if you survive this. And afterward, you'll be old men, just like me. And you won't know what the hell to do with yourself. Enjoy these nights, boys. Take them for what they're worth. Rejoice in your youth. You'll never get it back. And when he finished, Canales got back to his feet and stood alone beside the fire. Hector and Vicente finally slept. Their dreams were filled with fear and wonder, and their thoughts crept in with constant motion, like the pounding waves of an impending storm. Ten days had passed since the Spanish made landfall. The army made it about twenty miles inland. Yet, other than the remaining slaves of the empty town of Osita, the army found no natives of any kind. The scouts went north and east. They returned hours later and reported no sign of either Indians or gold. Finally, at the dawn of the next day, a dozen natives were sighted. They were a family of six, two young men and four women. As the translations went on, it started to rain. The first set of slaves had no idea what the family was saying. The priest or scribes didn't understand either. And it wasn't until the slaves in Cuba were ushered in that some understand it had been made. Soto spent the entire day with the slaves and translators. He never raised his voice. Instead, he gleamed, sharpened his sword, and waited for the priest and the translators to surmise the babble into understandable Spanish. After the relay was over, the facts were laid out. The native family were slaves of the Timicua. Yet, the most important fact that the family said was that they had expected Soto's arrival. The eldest man spoke. He beat his chest and looked at Soto with reverence and candor. And the rain fell harder. He spoke in haste and went on, reciting a long and impassioned speech. It was translated to the other slaves, and the priest said one sentence. He calls you the child of the sun, said the priest. What did he say? asked Soto. He says you are a child of the sun. And with that, Soto finally smiled. He repeated the phrase over and over. A child of the sun. The sun of the sun. In the nearby stream, the leaves floated across and danced down by the rocks. Then Soto took out a hammer looked to the sky, and searched for the right words. A friar approached him with weary, somber eyes. They fear you, Don Hernando. Good, said Soto. What should I tell them? (laughs) Tell them that this child of the sun is a gracious one, and that he must be loved every single day. In governance, I am gracious, and tell them that these men who ride horses and wear steel are the child of the sun's destined warriors, and tell them that they come in peace. 
the priest went on. Soto retorted once more. Also, tell them that this child of the sun has demands that must be attended to, that they will learn their real God in time, and that he will liberate you from all evil. Then Soto said his last commands. His smile faded, and he looked at all of them again with great disdain. Tell them that their enemies are enemies of the child of the sun himself, that their gods will soon die, and that this child of the sun will burn their souls if they should ever displease him. We will take their women, we'll take their lands, and they will forever know their true and righteous gods, and they shall pay for their sins. They hide in the trees. They tire as their hearts pound. They pray. They are the Timakua. Their faces are filled with angst and fear. They hold on to their spears and watch below. One native remains silent. He stares at the clouded sky. Rain begins to splatter. A bolt of lightning follows. A giant blackbird flies above. The Timakuans are frightened at the sign. They follow it and continue to stare. And as the moon climbs up, their lips tremble. The white and the fear return in the flash. For below, the demons march. They rummage through the trees with swords in their hands. They swing blindly. They are the deranged spirits of the dam. Rain and blood splatter on their faces. They want more. They bolt through. You saw them before. What is it? What are they? You remember? It can't be. I thought they... No, it is them. These are the same devils. They've returned. As the Timakua stare, all the memories return. They see a league of demons a mile wide with streaks of cannon fire. A one-eyed man leads them. Blood in pools. Blood in the sand. Blood all over. And now and present, the demons ceaselessly hover over the land. And as they ride their great beast onward, they tear through the rain and yell and scream. It's them. We strike now. No, we can't. We must. The Spanish marched on. They searched through streams and large rivers. Up ahead, they found abandoned canoes and paddles, and further down, they found more huts. The Timakua hid in the trees. They watched and waited high up top their canopies. And when they were ready, the signal was given, and the natives attacked. They jumped out from the trees and they ambushed the Spanish, shooting arrows and spears. But it was short-lived. The Spanish fired back with their cannons, striking the trees and catching them on fire. The smoke lifted and the natives scattered and fled. They wailed and screamed as the dogs chased them through the bush. And the Spanish yelled back and mocked the natives with screams of their own. Two Timakoans remained on the ground with their faces pointed to the sky. The Spanish approached and tortured them. They demanded to tell them where their base was and where the rest were hiding. The guides did their best to translate, saying that they did not understand the question. And as a result, the Spanish sliced off one native's head. The other native pleaded for his life and finally complied. The Spanish marched for another mile and saw a small housing complex north of the bank. They saw smoke rise above the morning mist 
and approached the town in haste. And Soto gave his command. Kill everything that moves. So they did. The Spanish slashed away. The women and the children fled north, screaming and wailing as the Spanish continued to chase them. In an hour, they killed 30 Timakua. They gathered up the corpses and tossed them into a pile. Most of the Indians were naked as the day they were born. And for those who remained, the Spanish took them as slaves and drove them back like cattle. Afterward, Soto entered the town and looked at the dead Indians on the ground. He looked again to the treetops and the tiny village. Then finally, he looked down at the river. At that time, Juan Anasco came to his side. Soto glared for half a minute until Anasco came within five feet of him. Then Anasco bowed and saluted. Don Hernando, the men caught some more a mile down. We killed most of them. Good, said Soto. Very good. Then he dismissed Juan Anasco back to the village, and Soto continued to stagger alone. And he laughed, quietly to himself. La Ferrarida went on, and the Spanish again marched through the swamp and slogged through the rain and muck. They slashed and cut and forged a path. For the next four days, the bright sun blistered. And of course, the next day it rained. Their horses slid in sloping valleys and struggled forward through the mud. Through the interior, they found more swamps and small sand islands. As they came across a basin, a swarm of mosquitoes hovered over their heads and bit at their faces. And as they neared the sands of the banks, they saw hundreds of crocodiles swimming in low water. Two pigs were led down by the dogs and prepared for slaughter. In the pouring rain, the butchers laid out the pigs on tree stumps and made their cuts. It took a whole hour before the men got the fire going, but somehow they managed to make a medium fire, and they roasted the pig on racks of twine and bamboo. The men watched and waited. It wasn't ready until evening, so the men went back to their own platoons, performed their duties, and waited for sunset. Another day passed. The army marched another three miles, but none reported seeing any Indian of any kind. Moscoso and Balthazar looked back at their men. Then they looked back at the cannon crew. Their task was to push a gigantic cannon through the mud. Hour after hour, they failed. More men assisted, but no progress was made. The men then attached five horses and two mules to a chain and along with the strength of ten men, they finally budged the cannon above the mud. Yet, after this endeavor, the men looked half dead. As they got close to the basin, an accidental round was fired. The shot rang up to the sky and incinerated a giant oak. The men stood frozen and screamed. All prepared and gripped their swords and looked up to the trees, expecting an ambush but then the men reported the false fire. Canales winced and spat as he passed the cannon crew. And with a blatant stare, he growled and made his point. Damn cannons! Lucky no one lost a foot yet. The next day, the stretch of swamp finally ended. They found a valley that led to a deep river. Then Soto ordered their army to rest there for two days. And as per usual, Soto remained alone in his tent, and the captains gathered and looked at their maps, but none had any understanding of just where the hell they were. The captains ordered their men at ease. Most of the men rested and slept the entire day, and the younger men were ordered into the trees to bring more wood for the fires. Hector and Vicente spent the entire morning and afternoon chopping down small trees with axes. They worked fast, and carried load after load back to the wagon. And when the wagon returned, they refilled it with fresh wood and repeated. 
They hacked, chopped, and whistled songs and talked quietly to each other. But as noonday came and as the humidity intensified, Hector began to tire. He staggered and his head bobbed and dipped. Sweat poured out from his entire face and the sun continued to climb. His body convulsed, yet there was much more work to do. So he pressed on and dug his axe through the trees. At moments, visions came to him. The visions were of the first slaughter of the Indians, which was mere weeks ago. He could still see all the blood and the sliced off limbs and heads. And in his mind, he heard the cries of the children. And as he tried to get his axe unstuck, he pulled hard and cut himself along his hands. And the blood dripped and gushed out. Vicente stared at him but he did not say a word. A slight drizzle quickly formed into a downpour. The wagon came again, and Hector and Vicente quickly loaded the carriage. But soon, Hector fell to his knees, clutched his stomach, and vomited all over the wood. The men left him alone, and the rain poured down again. Vicente loaded the rest of the wood back into the carriage, and half an hour had passed. The rain stopped, but Hector remained on the ground. He breathed in deeper and looked as if he were drowning. And finally, Vicente held out his hand and got him up to his feet. But again, he said not a word to Hector. He just gave him the same disappointing look he gave him before, and they went back to camp. Hector slept for hours and was awoken by laughter. He noticed that he was back with his platoon, and he got up and meandered to see if there was any food left. He found a piece of ranted meat and swallowed it whole. Then he walked to a large fire and found Vicente huddled over the other men. At the helm of the fire, Hector found Canales, and he sat down with the rest of the men. For a long while, the men talked, but deep down... They all wanted to hear Canales' story of Peru, Carimaca, Cusco, the Pizarros, and their 14,000 pounds of gold. The men drank bottle after bottle of wine, and when Canales thought it was time, he held his men at attention and told him his tale of Peru. He was in a marvelous state. He was in rare and defined form. He was terrifically drunk, yet all too aware. But still, there was tremendous pride in his face, as if he were young again. He told the tale and slurred his words, and often he gave out a cry and a tear. And the man hung to his every word. If I have to be a son of a bitch, I'd settled to be a lucky son of a bitch. It's luck that got us here. And that luck has been with me as long as I can remember. And Canales went on. We followed the Pizarros. We heard story after story. Stories of Cortez. Stories of gold. None of us believed it. But we were dumb. (laughs) So we went on. We went on for months. Through jungle and marsh. And heat and stink it was hell. It was unbelievable hell. Then came the day. <laughs> he found that small city. They called it Karimaka. <laughs> it was made of stones and wooden walls. The slaves said there was much gold there. But when we got there, it was all empty. And Canales went on. The Pizarros commanded us to stay in formation. And we waited in the square. We were told to wait for the king, Altawalpa. We waited two straight fucking days. Then he made his way down. He didn't look real at first. And his slaves carried him on a golden chair. And in minutes, we were surrounded but we were told not to make a single movement. 
but Pizarro knew what he was doing. And he asked the questions that needed to be asked. He asked about the gold. Well, Tualpa refused. Then Canales laughed and took a drink. And when El Tualpa refused again, we struck. <laughs> we charged. We gorged. There was so much blood. So much fucking blood. We killed everything that moved. It was beautiful. But Pizarro wanted him alive. And we kept his promise. We kept El Tualpa alive. Then we threatened him more. And when he gave up, he showed us all the gold. We collected 14,000 pounds of gold. 14,000 pounds. All the gold of all the world. And it was all ours. And when Canales finally finished telling his tale, he laughed and his men kept still in silent wonder. Fires burnt from platoon to platoon, and more nights followed. There were no skirmishes for a week. During that time, there were rumors of a land in the distance named Apalachi. It was said to be a set of mountains of gold and silver, Yes, Soto commanded his men not to talk about these things until they had found them. And when he surmised his men had enough rest, he commanded them onward. And the march continued. A day later, Balthasar's men came across a stone path that ducked south and bent towards the river. But as another day passed, word spread of a horrible rumor. Elvas and Rangel lightly recorded in their journals, yet all knew the inevitable had happened. The army was running out of food. At noon of one day, Soto's captains held an emergency meeting. Anasco, Moscoso, Balthasar, and the others mounted upon a hill and waited for Soto to join them. When Soto arrived, he was quite agitated. His eyes were strained and he moved from side to side. The captain sulked and stood at attention, and Soto listened to their concerns and grievances. They spoke of their rations and blamed the guides for their wrong coordinates, and when they finished, Soto barked at them in disgust. I know these facts. I know our situation. Do you think I'm dense? The captain shook their heads. But Soto continued to scream. You needn't tell me these things. You're simply wasting time. We should be marching. Forward. We've had our rest. And with that, the captains were all dismissed and were reported back to their men. The heat returned, and Soto rode forth with his secretary Ranghal to his side. They looked over the land. All seemed the same. Streams that fell to large rivers, basins, banks, and tiny pebbles that flooded over stretches of sand. Then Ranghal gave Soto a map. And as Soto studied it, he grimaced and threw the map back at Ranghal. Where in hell are those damn translators I asked for? We're as good as dead without the right interpreter. That's why we're in this hell. They haven't returned, sir, said Rangel. They were supposed to arrive today. Where are they? Last they heard they were with Anasco's unit. Then get off your ass and go there. If I call for savages, I want truthful ones. You hear? The truth is all that matters. If they tell us the truth, they live. A shot rang out. Don Hernando! Don Hernando! What is it, Luis? I've been informed there's a village up ahead. Thank God, said Soto. 
Send ten men and scout out the perimeter. Take the cavalry up the stream. Head them off. But sir, shouldn't we? Now, Moscoso. Do it. And as ordered, the cavalry headed up to the village. But again, there were no natives in sight. They found a temple and several huts. Then they found spears and baskets filled with maize. And later, they found a wooden statue of a five-foot bird with gilded eyes. And as the men searched further, they found a path and a stretch of caves. The caves were diminutive and gray and were covered in thick green moss. Balthazar's men had found them first. They made their way inside each cave with dimly lit torches. When the men came out, they were covered with dust and cobwebs. But each man came back with something. By noon, the Spanish found more caves. And later, they found a buried sack of Spanish coin that was some 30 years old. Moscoso's unit found rusted armor, lances, and swords. And towards sundown, Anasco's unit found horse hides and wool blanket quilted loins. All was set into a great pile. In the firelight, Soto sat next to all the priests and examined what they had found. Trinkets, swords, rusted helmets, ratted clothes, flags, strips of leather, and skulls and skeletons of men unknown. But one thing in particular that Soto examined closely was a leather-bound book. During the afternoon and well into the night, the priest uncovered and deciphered what they could read from the book, and they spoke with Soto directly. Brother Rodrigo, a fat, clean-shaven monk, was the first to examine the book. He wiped off the dirt and dust and studied the ratty, moldy pages. And as he read, his face lit up, and consequently, so did Soto's. What's the last date that was written, brother? asked Soto. It reads, April 1527. Eleven years ago. Is there any mention of Alvar Nunez? Cabeza de Vaca? No. But this was written by one of Navaez's men. A treasurer of some kind. Read on, brother. It says that the men were so starved that they ate their horses and that the Indians kept attacking. It also says that they found some refuge in these caves. And as the monk went on, Soto soon surmised the whole scene in his mind and calculated both the history and the clear and present danger. His captains gathered and remained silent. We are not to move away from this place for at least a day. The savages are close enough. Let them come to us. Take the maze. The captains all nodded, and as night fell, the army made camp and patrolled the outside perimeter of the caves. Soto sat by the fire and listened to the wind. Then he awoke one of the monks and placed the book back into his hands. Do it again, brother. Read from the beginning. And the monk did. Soto stared at the flame and closed his eyes. And as the monk went on, he drifted into slumber and went deep into the recesses of his memory. And like the schemes of a play, he placed all the pieces in accordance and tried to make sense. He imagined what Nunez would have done 13 years ago. He was a man who survived, but was completely damaged. And what was left of him was his memory of all that was seen and unseen. Still, they remained incomplete. There was a move or a missing piece. What it was, 
Soto did not know. So he jumped more and dove further into the void. And when he woke up in the dark, he screamed and shouted. Yet no one heard his cries. The next day came. The scouts spent the first two hours rummaging through piles of dried beans they found hidden in the huts. A fog lifted, and a steady stream of rain poured onto the men. Some of the men went back into the caves, but they found nothing new. When the rain stopped, Soto ordered those scouts to forge ahead to find traces of food. The rest of the army remained at the camp and ate the beans and maize. The other men held patrol and paced a half a mile in the other direction. Then an arrow fired. It sliced through a man's hand. The man screamed and the Spanish retaliated. They shot their hand cannons and fired round after round. The Indians yelled and screamed and shot more arrows, and the Spanish fired back with their heavy cannons. The men continued to shoot. Shells exploded through the trees, and smoke filled the canopy. Then the Indians fell to the ground, and the cavalry gave them chase. They tackled three Indians and lanced them through their backs. More Indians got away and dashed forth, escaping through the swamp. The smoke cleared. A quarter of an hour passed. Silence lingered. Then a faint sound faded in and out. And in the clear, they saw a man dash forth through the swamp. He tripped on a stump and crawled through the mud. Then the man yelled out as the dogs piled on top of him. I am Castilian! I am Castilian! More men gathered. They pulled the dogs away. The Spanish stood stunned. The man looked ravaged and old. His body was filled with bruises and tattoos. His eyes fluttered rapidly. One eye was completely shut. The other eye was open, but clearly damaged. The man shivered as if he had been caught beneath a sheet of ice. Balthazar and the translators came to the scene and was shocked that the man spoke Spanish. Explain yourself, said Balthazar. The man responded. The words came sharp and clear. I am Castilian. My name is Juan Ortiz. I'm from the Entrada de Navajes. Please, you must believe me. I am Castilian. Then Balthazar ordered his men, and they carried the man all the way back to the rendezvous point. The crowd gathered and shouted. How can this be? He says he's one of Navaes's men. He's blind. He's an imposter. What use is he? He knows the land. Then Soto arrived. The men took Ortiz, ushered him into the tent, and departed. The priest and translators were summoned, but as Ortiz spoke in Spanish, Soto immediately smiled and dismissed them. And for an hour, Soto and Ortiz were left alone. They sat and ate cobs of corn at a time. And Ortiz told his tale. Take your time, Ortiz, said Soto. Tell me all you remember. They tell me you are a slave. I was captured. They tortured me. They. Who are they? The Timequa. The tribe. For how long? I don't know. It was autumn when we landed. It was spring when we... That was eleven years ago, Ortiz. Eleven years. Eleven years. But now you're free. We came just in time. It is you that I should be thanking. 
Soto studied Ortiz's eyes. The right side was fine, but the left side was filled with scars and seemed to have no pupil. What happened to your eye, Ortiz? I lost it. Trying to escape. They tortured me. Who did this to you? The Timakua. Who are they? They're the tribe of this land. Some are friendly, but most are cruel. But they were your captors? Yes. And do you know their language? Yes, most words. That's all I need to know. As the night passed, they talked about Spain and Navaes. They talked about the expedition and of the rumors of gold in Osita. Then they talked about the land and how far it stretched. But even so, it came all too clear. Ortiz was the miracle incarnate. He was the man who could save the whole Entrada. For he knew the land and the language. We're blessed. We're truly blessed, Juan, said Soto. You are a gift from God. From now on, I will put you in full command of the guides. I am honored, sir. They shared a chalice of wine, and before leaving the tent, Soto asked his final questions. This mountain, Apalachi, what do you know of it? It goes on forever. I haven't gone too far. These Timakua, do you know their leader? Yes. Is he close? Yes. He's a cruel bastard. He has an army. So do we, Juan, said Soto. What is the nearest town? Osita. Yes, it's a very rich town. They have no silver, no gold. They have plenty food, though. I will show you. In time, you will show us everything, Ortiz. So Ortiz showed the way. Soto divided his platoons. They disengaged and paced for several more miles. And the land was just as Ortiz said it was, a land filled with swamps. Then Ortiz pointed. About five miles east of here is the Swamp of Kale, he said. There are many streams there, many fish. They went into the water and caught bass and eels with their bare hands. They ate on the banks of the streams. However, They were on constant guard. They held tight to their swords, expecting snakes to drop from trees and crocodiles to jump from the waters. But most importantly, they peered into the dark, expecting the natives to ambush. But there was only rain. For two more days, the rain poured and everything was wet and dank. It took another four days for Renhal and Alvas to record their words. And as they waited for the sun to return, they took in what they saw and tried their best to remember. It is with my apologies to his majesty for not writing sooner. However, due to ceaseless rain, precious ink does not suit or write well in the aforementioned conditions. And about the last days of June, the governor, Don Hernando de Soto, commanded the army to pass a swift current, and we followed the footbridges and crossed many streams of La Florida. During that time, we found a Christian named Ortiz, who was one of Navaez's men, and who had survived all this time. After finding this Ortiz, the governor trusted him in guiding the Entrada, and thus we followed him indefinitely. Five days later, we reached a great swamp, which Ortiz had named the Swamp of Kale, 
in which we found an empty village. The governor ordered to take all the ripe maize, which was enough for three months. From there we ate maize and cooked down the stalks and brewed soups and stews. In the weeks that follow, the army endured many skirmishes. The Indians killed three Christians, and those slaves that were captured informed Ortiz and the governor that there was a large province within a seven days walk from Apalachi. It is said to have an abundance of maize and other riches, and it is our hope we shall find such a place very soon. Humbly signed to the Royal Court of Spain, Gentlemen of Alvas, 17th July, 1539. Seven more days passed. As the Spanish rode forth, they came up listless and distressed. They determined that the Indians who guided Ortiz to Apalachi had lied to them. There was no maze, no view of mountains, nor splendor, nor any promise. There were only stretches of streams and swamp. And being that indeed true, Soto ordered the two responsible Indians to be tortured and hung. Ortiz talked to Soto for another hour, but for the remainder of the day, he remained alone and was asked not to be bothered. He remained at the edge of the camp with his guards on watch, and as night fell, he could be spotted playing a game of chess alone. His captains gathered, and Moscoso, Balthazar, and Anasco stood, stared, and pondered. He's still playing that game. I wonder why no one challenges him. They're afraid. It's a good enough reason. Why does he want to be alone all the time? Then Moscoso looked and turned. Let him be alone. Let the man think. He's planning. Planning what? His next move, said Moscoso. He knows how to fight these savages. We're in good hands. Put your faith in God. Let Don Hernando figure out the rest. And as they stared, Soto still remained alone by a dim fire. Night settled to a deep blue dawn and the board was still filled to capacity. His eyes switched back from the pieces to the flame, but as he stared deeper, his eyes began to close. His nostrils flared, and he took in long and deep and painful breaths. And as he opened his eyes again, he buried himself deep within the board, and he tried to find a way. The fire grew and swung from side to side. He looked terrible. His eyes were sullen and his skin was pale. He sighed, stared up to the night stars, and snorted. What month is this? I asked. They say it's October, said Soda. I don't really believe them, though. Then he took the two pawns, held them beneath his back, and presented two fists before the flame. Choose, Sardina. I pointed to his left hand. He unveiled the pawn, and it came up black. He neither smiled nor said a word. He set up the board. But I noticed something wasn't right. Soto hadn't all his pieces. One of his squares was empty. It was his most important piece. Where's your queen? I asked. I don't need her, Soto said. Did you lose her? No. Then why? I've learned to play without her, said Soto. This game will be no exception. So the board was set. 
31 pieces, 15 white, 16 black. I stared at Soto's empty square. Then I held my queen and placed her firmly on her square. I never really understood this piece, I said. No one does, Sardina. He made his first move. And just like almost every game, he moved his king's pawn two squares up to the center. From that moment on, I knew for certain that this would be the last game I would ever play. I felt a pain in my stomach, and I cradled my head. Osoto only stared. You know the point of the game, don't you? To capture the enemy king, I said. Good, said Soto. At least you remember that. Make your move. The Spanish pressed forward. Beyond the Swamp of Kale was a flat and peculiar land. It was a beginning stretch of hills that the natives called Apalachi. Three days they marched without incident. They came upon many paths of creeks and low-level barriers. To the delight of the Spanish, it did not rain for an entire week. It had only been two months since they made landfall, yet the morale of the men remained content. Then one day, they came across a land that the natives called Tano. Ortiz took them to a nearby housing complex just south of a small creek, but it was there that their respite of peace had ended, and days of confusion and panic soon followed. They heard the Indians gather from the edge of the banks, but they did not see them. The cavalry flanked the near side platoons, yet the Indians sought and diverted their attack to the opposite directions. The cannons fired many rounds, but the Indians went unharmed and attacked from the tops of the trees. They launched spears which killed two horses, and in the fog of the cannon fire, the Indians escaped and disappeared. As Soto surveyed the situation, he looked up to the trees. But his captains clearly weren't as calm. They rode up to him with frightened and paralyzed eyes. Don Hernando, they've killed two of our men, Javier and Miguel. These savages are hiding in the trees. What shall we do? Soto looked up again. Then he finally spoke. Bastards want to fight in the trees? Let them die in the trees. Take the cannons. Fire at the canopies. Fire at will. And don't stop until I say so. So the Spanish fired. The blast continued for several minutes. But then all went quiet. And as the Spanish waited for the ambush, The Indians jumped out and caught their rear flank, and the Indians tore and banged off their Spanish armor, and the Spanish sliced away. The skirmishes did not cease. The next day, the same exact event had happened, and the next day still. The skirmishes came in waves, no matter night or day. They lasted for mere minutes to whole hours and they were fought from one end of the village to the other. Even in the pouring rain, the Indians fought. Some jumped to their deaths. Others hid deep within the trees, throwing axes and launching arrows. On one day, the Spanish lost three men. All had been knifed along the throat. One Spaniard was found with an arrow lodged square in his neck, and within a week, Seven Spaniards had been killed. But as time wore on, the Spanish gained their pound of flesh. They hacked countless Indians limb by limb, and they took great joy in doing so. Their dogs gave chase and tore through the tribesmen, and their slobbering mouths dripped in pools of blood. 
Yet the more the Spanish retaliated, the more the Indians remained obstinate. The Indians kept fighting. The Spanish retaliated. And it seemed that the ambushes and counterattacks would go on forever. Not far from the cavalry, Canales' unit dropped off fresh supplies to the cannon crew. They were then ordered to patrol the perimeter of a stretch of low trees. Vicente and Hector talked to each other, but only sparingly. Their exhaustion proved to be too much, and they drifted in and out of sleep. In the dank heat of the night, their bodies seemed to be perpetually collapsing, ounce by ounce. Vicente slept, but Hector seemed to be in a different sleep. One so deep that he couldn't tell whether he was awake or dreaming. And because of this, he walked through the night with his eyes open. But he could not feel his body. He heard voices and followed them. Then he spotted a native child up top of the canopy. The child swayed on a low branch and drank out of a skull. The child looked at him, but he wasn't phased, and the liquid that poured out of his mouth was red blood, and the child slurped it and showed his rotten teeth. Then Hector blinked and awoke to clear consciousness, but the child disappeared. On the day the Entrada left the Swamp of Kale, the Spanish marched through fog and forged a path through a long mile of wood. They made progress and spent three days marching north. From there, the skirmishes seemed to subside. But Soto, as well as his captains, knew this reprieve would not last very long. Soto surveyed the land ahead. It was comprised of dense, thick trees and heavy, tall, and slumping grass. Then he examined the river south with his mind in heavy calculation, and Moscoso came to his side. We need leverage, Soto said. Leverage, said Moscoso. We have nothing to offer them. Forgive me, Governor, but why should we offer them anything? They've killed enough of our men already. Get me Ortiz, said Soto. Five minutes later, Ortiz arrived, and Soto asked his questions. Ortiz, what is this land ahead? They call it Napituca, sir. What do you know of it? I know there are many Indians among it. Naves tried to kill every one of them. They ended up killing us. Ortiz, I need to speak with the chief of these people. There must be a chief, correct? There is, said Ortiz. I don't know if it's the same one as before, but I know there is a chief. I will ask. Ask away, said Soto. Moscoso. Yes, Don Hernando. Spread the word. Take prisoners. Lock them in chains. Dusk came, and the next day Ortiz guided the army north across a stream, and beyond it, as promised, was the town of Napituca. The Spanish marveled at the sight, for unlike the towns they crossed, Napituca was densely populated and among the largest cities they had found. And all of it was contained by large stone fences that narrowed to an arching bluff. There were many huts along the banks, but there seemed to be even larger huts some 200 feet across the bluff. Some houses were 60 feet high, and their residents, some 1,000 Napituca Indians, were waiting for the Spanish to arrive. A scout team sent an initial peace offering to the subordinates of the head chief, but as the Spanish entered the town of Napituca, they were greeted with arrows. 
They fought the entire afternoon and well into dusk. But Soto's men maintained his command. They captured 100 prisoners, locked them in gangs of chains, and forced them to march behind the Cuban slaves. Then the translators asked the slaves for gold and treasure, but the slaves simply did not answer. More slaves were gathered by Anasco's unit cavalry, and at the end of the day, the Spanish captured a total of 300 Indians. As Ortiz spoke with the head dignitaries that were captured, he soon learned that the head chief of Napituca, the Kake, as they called him, was near and would meet the Spanish in the morning. The Spanish refused to give their prisoners food or water, and the prisoners wailed and moaned in the dark. Some collapsed from sheer exhaustion. Others extended their hands and prayed loudly, flooding the air with their songs. But the Spanish, being furious and agitated by their cries, slashed the slaves across their face with whips and knifed them in their stomachs to see how much they could bleed. By midnight, the captains finally understood Soto's scheme. Soto addressed them by a fire. He explained that possessing the prisoners was their leverage. Then he explained that if the chief was held prisoner, then it would be their ultimate leverage, and all awards would follow. And the next day, the army seized the entire land of Napituka, including the chief's favorite son. Upon learning this, Soto rode about a quarter of a mile to a fire pit located between the banks and approaching bluff. Ortiz stayed by Soto's side and informed him that the chief of Napituka was a mere hour away. Soto ordered his men to stand their ground, and they waited the entire morning. Noon approached, and a cry echoed out. Again, Soto commanded each of his captains to restrain their men from any activity, and both sides remained tense and still. Then a thousand Indians gathered and surrounded the Spanish from every side. The translators offered peace meals, beads, and wreaths, but the Indians had no interest. Finally, the Kake approached Soto. He was accompanied by two dozen guards, and he stood naked with tattoos covering his face, neck, and shoulders. The translators moved in closer. Ortiz translated the formalities, but the Kake gave no orders. He just stared at Soto, who remained on his horse. More and more Indians were spotted along the woods, and Soto peered from one end of the bank to the other. Ortiz, yes, sir. Are these all the tribe of Napituka? Most of them, sir. Some are Timikua. Then the Napituka translators approached the Spanish priest, and Soto nodded to Ortiz. Do your best, Juan. The villagers and tribesmen looked at the Spanish. They were bitter faces all around. Then Soto closed his eyes and whispered to himself. Same story, over and over. The Kake replied. He went on for several minutes, but not a word was translated. And when Soto finally had enough, he moved his horse closer to the center and shouted as loud as he could. People of Napituka, I have told you several times, our people wish to come in peace. We expect you to do the same. The translation followed, but the Napituka stood confused, and the more Soto went on, the less and less they seemed to understand. But Soto persisted. If you do not comply, may God help you. We come from Holy Spain. Go ahead, Juan. Then Soto pointed to all the prisoners the Spanish had captured the night before. We have hundreds of your people. 
They will be our slaves forever if you do not comply. In exchange, all we ask is... Soto reached into his cloak and retrieved a gold necklace. It was Altawapa's necklace from a dozen years ago. And the Indian stared. Ask them, Juan. Ask them where we can find it. Ortiz asked and the translators asked again. But the Kake and his people remained stupefied with anger. Then Soto continued. Please, show us this and we will let your people go. The tribe stood appalled with their eyes open, forever locked in a state of confusion. And Soto went on. We have come from a world away. If there is gold, silver, or any precious metal, please show us. It is imperative that we possess these things. Show us, and you will not be armed. Show us, and your people will all be saved. A long silence followed. Ortiz pleaded to the tribe. But the tribe pleaded back. They say, they say that they do not understand, said Ortiz. Then Soto sighed. He uttered words that were only recognizable to himself. Then he sighed again and spat. He signaled to his men. And a minute later, a soldier walked forward, carrying a wooden box. And again, Ortiz relayed back to Soto. They say they don't understand. They have no gold. They say they have no idea what you're talking about, Don Hernando. The soldier handed the box to Soto. Soto then handed the box to Ortiz. Then Soto spoke again. If that is the case, I must show them gratitude. Show them, Ortiz. See if they don't understand. And as Ortiz came walking with the box in hand, he stopped and held it above his shoulder so all could see. Then he set the box down and opened the lid. Inside was the head of the Kake's son. Ortiz clutched it by the hair, and the tribe shrieked in disgust and fear. Soto marveled at the sight. He smiled and seethed from his teeth and stared right into the Kake's eyes. But oddly, the Kake gave no emotion. And Soto spat to the ground, then turned to Ortiz. Do they understand now? And to the shock of all the Spanish, the Kake turned his back, and his people followed. In all the screaming and shouting, another translation came out from the ranks, and a priest forwarded it to Ortiz. They say they will see you in the morning. And with that, the tribe departed, making no other sounds besides their footsteps. The Spanish watched the thousands of Napituka Indians head back from whence they came, and they stood dumbfounded. Soto raced back and forth on his horse, seemingly and perpetually lost in thought. He looked at the giant lake south before the bluff. Then he looked back east to the trees. Then he looked to the sky and realized there was little time. The captains panicked and rode from unit to unit, demanding to hear an order. But none were given. There was little light left in Napituka, so the army rested in angst. The men asked their captain ceaselessly, wondering, fearing, doubting what would happen next. But each time, their captains gave the same response and urged them to keep steady. They smelled smoke from a great fire that was far in the distance. And at nightfall, Soto ordered his captains by a fire. It is a ruse. It is a goddamn ruse, said Soto. Lucky for us, they gave themselves away. The captain stood confused. None replied, and Soto bit his lips and continued. They will attack in about an hour. 
They want us to wait until morning. But if we do, we're dead. So we'll counteract that now. Moscoso, Anasco, drive the cavalry north between the bluff. That's their main entry point. They saluted and departed. Soto switched and commanded the rest. Balthazar, Diego, assemble the artillery south and east. Fire directly into the trees. Give them no warning shots. We cannot afford it. For the rest, follow my lead. The army followed and the captains readied their men on a slight hill just before the lake. A dozen of the heavy cannons positioned themselves triangularly and loaded their rounds. Then, as Soto expected, a cry shouted out from yonder. The cry grew in volume and intensity. It rumbled to a fever pitch crescendo, and it echoed and clamored on for a long, painful minute. It was the cry of the thousand Napituka. Scores of Timikor warriors, lancers, bowmen, and spearmen rushed up the hill and screamed. But the well positioned Spanish cavalry countered. They charged and attacked the tribe, trampling them with their horses. Then Soto sighed, and the cannons fired into the interior, and the plumes of black smoke filled the sky. And, as expected, the whole of Napituka erupted in chaos. Even though the Spanish were severely outnumbered, Soto's plan worked in perfection. In less than ten minutes, one hundred Napituka warriors lay dead on the ground. In five minutes, one hundred more were slain. Several more were incinerated by the cannon shells. Body after body stacked the sand hill and gorges of blood emerged and covered the ground in spews of red and black. The cannons reloaded. They fired and repeated, and Soto watched calmly, switching his eyes from side to side. Out from behind the lake, more warriors rushed the land. They held spears and clubs, but the Spanish were ready for them. The muskets fired a second round. The warriors pressed through and brought some of the Spanish down, but the rounds and rounds of gunfire proved too much, and the warriors retreated back to the lake, screaming and shrieking. In a matter of minutes, the cavalry slaughtered all that came before them. Streams of blood fell like confetti. Soto ordered the infantry to move towards the lake. The Indians held their ground for quite some time, shooting arrows from close range and preventing the Spanish from gaining ground. But time was not on their side. And when they ran out of arrows, the Timakuans charged back. They leaped from great heights and landed on the Spanish backs. Slews of spears flooded the sky. But each time the warriors advanced a charge, they were met with cannon fire. In close combat, the warriors injured many Spanish, but they killed very few. And the fighting went on for another hour, then another. Blood seeped into the mud. Blood seeped into the lake. And it smeared down the whole land, drip by drip. Canales followed Onasco's men, and they, along with their compadres, slashed away at the natives. Soon the light artillery and crossbowmen joined, and the Spanish fired at close range. The infantry followed their progression as the spears fired through the air. The Spanish knocked them off with shields and pressed on, and charge after charge broke down and failed, and more bodies fell to the mud. And from there, the battle became a slaughter. And the Spanish kept coming, lighting their torches and setting the village huts on fire. And the land was submerged in billows of smoke and swirling ash. 
the cavalry rode forth and destroyed the outside flank. But by then, the warriors knew their fate. They had two options. The fight on or retreat into the lake. Half of them fought. The others retreated. Those who fought in the dark swung blindly, sometimes spearing their own tribesmen. And when the last of the warriors fell, the Spanish surrounded the lake and took their torches to light the water. And there they saw the remaining Timakuas swim for their lives. They heard them splash and scream and cry, for the water was deep and cold. The cannons came forth and struck their shells clear into the water, and smoke and steam once again flashed and gleamed about the water. But as they ceased, the cries of the Timakua took over. And as night descended, the only light that remained was from the Spanish torches. Soto came to the scene about an hour later with Moscoso and about five translators. Tell them to surrender, said Soto. We've tried, said Moscoso, but they've refused each time. Very well, said Soto. We'll just watch them die then. And that's exactly what they did. One by one, the Spanish watched the hundred warriors in the lake drop down to the surface and drown. All throughout the night, the Spanish waited and counted down. One hundred, seventy, fifty-five, twenty-one. The remaining warriors swam in defiance, pumping their legs to desperately stay afloat. But after another hour, there were only twelve warriors left in the lake. Their faces looked dead, pale, and gray. They trembled and shivered. They huddled together and saw their breath draw out in the cold, and they screamed and cried. Then the water became very still. They prayed in heavy repetitions, and as ordered, the Spanish merely waited. Some laughed, others marveled, and within another hour, half of the warriors dropped to the bottom. And fifteen minutes later, five more did the same. At last, only one warrior remained. He was the youngest of all. He swam in circles and made the Spanish wait longer than they wanted to. But his strength was clearly waning. The gaps of air surfaced and formed a cloud of fog above his head. He turned from side to side, but at every turn was an awaiting Spanish soldier holding the crossbow. He swam again and went deeper into the lake, and as he looked back, he saw all the Spanish torches. From his view, they looked like tiny candles. He kept afloat and swam for another quarter of an hour. The Spanish shouted at him, and the slaves begged him to surrender. His eyes remained open, but then his face turned blue. His legs locked from underneath. His arms jerked. And in his last painful minute, his body gave out, and he sunk to the bottom. In the morning, what remained of the Napituka were crackling dying fires, the stench of burning flesh, and massive pits filled with bodies. And so the Spanish walked, seemingly in the trance. Hector was no exception. He felt the horror inside, but he could not define it. He walked from end to end with a madness slowly creeping inside his soul and each step he felt buried in burden with tremendous everlasting guilt and pain. He walked towards the monks and priests, but they were not in prayer. No psalms were sung, no blessings were offered. They merely lowered their heads. 
He thought about all the warriors he had killed, and he smelled his bloody hands. Likewise, Vicente too walked in a trance, but he seemed not to be phased at all. Instead, he seemed carefree and accomplished. He smashed his swords against clay pots with his mouth hung open. He looked demented and deeply satisfied. Hector met Vicente along the swamp, and they stared into the lake. Then they heard an awful scream. They turned their backs, and a warrior charged right for them. Hector countered with his sword, and the warrior's momentum flipped him in the air. The warrior landed on his back, and Hector quickly approached and pointed the edge of his sword towards the warrior's throat. But then he stopped. Come on, Hector, kill him, Vicente yelled. But Hector did not move. He looked at the warrior's face, and soon again, Hector's eyes fluttered. He was still in a trance. He stumbled and tried to open his eyes, and the warrior soon bolted back to his feet. Hector! The warrior reached for his spear, but in one swift motion, Vicente slashed the warrior's head and decapitated him. When he finished, Vicente placed the sword back in his cloak. Then he gave Hector a great look of disdain. The two went on and rested near an oak tree. Vicente grabbed the pig's foot out of his bag and ate it voraciously. He then offered a piece to Hector, but Hector refused. Then Vicente spat to the ground and looked at Hector straight in the eye. What's the matter with you, Hector? He gave no response. Hector, what's the matter with you? What the hell were you doing? You had him beaten. Why didn't you kill him then? I hesitated. You hesitated. I... You're what? I'm tired, said Hector. We came here to be kings, not priests, said Vicente. They're not human. Put that through your head. An hour passed. Vicente trudged through sopping grass and spotted a small caiman swimming up to the surface. The beast waddled to and fro. Its scales were dull and green. Vicente waited and watched its every move. And when the moment was right, he reached for his sword and pierced the caiman straight through its forehead. The caiman hissed and whipped its body from side to side. But soon, it stumbled, and Vicente laughed and approached closer. He took out another sword and bashed the caiman on its head until its whole mouth ran dark with blood and Vicente screamed and smiled. Come on. Come on, you. Eat away. Eat away. Hector looked on. He neither returned the smile nor showed any emotion at all. Later, a man came to the spot. It was Jimenez, a slightly older man who was part of their platoon. He looked at Hector and Vicente, and he sighed, and turned his head. There you are. We've been looking all over for you. We didn't receive any orders, said Vicente. What happened? I've got bad news, said Jimenez. What happened? Jimenez did not respond. What the fuck happened? Vicente repeated. They followed Jimenez back to camp. Then when they reached the sands, Jimenez pointed. It was a freshly cut leg, but it wasn't the natives. A huddle of men gathered. Their Captain Canales hobbled on one foot and screamed. Let me walk! Let me fucking walk! Vicente shook his head over and over in disbelief. Hector simply closed his eyes. What happened? A cannonball. 
tore right through him, said Jimenez. Canales stumbled and hobbled. He was wrapped in bloody rags. His face smeared with sweat and mud. Blood sipped through his wound and dripped to the ground. The further he hobbled, the more he hollered. And the men stood and stared at him, expecting him to fall at any minute. Then it happened. He stumbled and fell to the ground. He screamed and hollered until blood spewed from his mouth. The men lifted him and placed him on his back, but still the blood gushed. And Canale screamed until he could no longer. They buried him that night, and at noon of the next day, it rained. Slaves were whipped and transported from endless lines, and Soto continued to stare into the distance. Two horses rode up, and the men saluted. Later, Moscoso and Balthasar approached Soto and gave him their reports. What did you find? said Soto. Both shook their heads. What about Anasco's crew? The scouts north haven't found anything. The scouts east are due soon. Did they find any gold? They did not respond. Did they find any gold? Soto repeated. No, Don Hernando, they did not. Don Hernando, shall I? No, whatever you have in mind is not necessary. But sir, it's not necessary. Where is this cake? We captured him, Don Hernando. Bring him to me. Immediately. The rain poured, and the men brought the imprisoned chief of Napetuka towards Soto. Ortiz and the translators made their way to the scene, and Soto staggered towards the kake, holding a chained mace. Tell him his people fought well, but we are his masters now, and we will be even crueler to them if he does not comply. They will see the other side of justice. The kake moaned, shouting for his subordinates, but by then... They were all enslaved and driven off behind the pigs and cattle. The kake set his fiery eyes onto Soto, and they shared a long glare. Then he mumbled, and Ortiz retorted back. He says... He says... I do not understand. Soto drew closer. He leaned and tilted his head. Ask where he's hiding the gold. The translators ask. "Uh, He says he does not know, said Ortiz. Ask him again, said Soto. Ortiz asked again. The cocky shook his head. His face was filled with disgust and hatred. And Soto looked on, matching his countenance with seas and scowls of torn breath. He still says he doesn't know, said Ortiz. Very well, said Soto. We showed him enough mercy. Cut him limb by limb. Start with the feet. Unleash him. The order was given. The guards unleashed the chief, and Soto grabbed his sword. But the kake had already broken away. He lunged and leaped and tackled Soto to the ground, and with one quick shot, he pummeled Soto across the face with a jagged stone. Then he yelled out to his people, urging them to revolt. But not a minute later, the Spanish surrounded, stabbed, and decapitated the cake, and the slaves turned silent in utter shock. Immediately afterward, the men surrounded Soto. He lay on his back for nearly half an hour. He heard voices which he could not discern, and blood spewed from his forehead and dripped down to his chin. When he awoke, he saw the heads of all his captains. 
took several more minutes, but he got back up to his own power. Water! Bring him water! shouted the captains. Bring the governor water! And when Soda was handed the cup, he slurped his own blood. He spat out and wiped his face with his muddied hand. And as the blood dripped down once more, Soto clutched his head and looked up to the gray, dark sky. Blood only runs like rivers, like rivers. He walked alone for several minutes. No man approached him. They all stared from a distance. Then something crossed his vision and caught his eyes. It was the freshly decapitated head of the kake. It had been placed upon a stump. And Soto tilted his head and glared at it. And as he approached, Soto took out his mace and mauled the already decapitated head with deep, repetitive blows. When he finished, Soto hobbled and studied the wind. He heard many things. He heard the women scream. He heard footsteps and the hiss of maiden snakes. And again, he felt the blood drip from his nose. And he felt it drip down to his knees and ankles. But in some perverse way, Soto seemed to smile through the pain and continued to bleed. Then he opened his eyes, and his men heard him laugh in the rain. Chapter 4 So Soto played without his queen, but despite its absence, it did not deter his confidence nor his concentration. It forced him to be more creative, and despite it, he played on, and he played marvelously. And I could feel myself losing the game with each passing second. He moved his pawns near the center, then he moved his knights. After more moves, we finally reached mid-game. There were no open spaces from either side. And like most of his games, the board seemed crowded with confusion. But Soto remained calm. We sat and played. It was long and awful. He sat up straight and warmed his hands by constantly blowing into them. He wore a heavy deerskin that wrapped around his shoulder. He took in long, deep breaths and heavy sighs. He looked as if he could die at any moment. He moved his pawns up to the center. I countered with my knights. He remained silent. You've seemed the master of this game, Sardina. At least its beginnings. About time. Took you long enough. I broke the silence and asked the obvious. You look pain, Soto. I am. You look as well. I am. What did you find in the desert? I found nothing. Well, you didn't look hard enough. There's plenty. There's nothing, Soto. No, there is plenty. I am the ruler of this entire land. I've killed all kings. This is my dominion, and there is plenty. I will kill all those who dare to take it away from me. That is my testament, Sardina. There is no other. After Napituka, the Spanish headed further north. They came upon another land that was low in elevation and contained deep and long rivers. 
they entered through swamps, dunes, and coasts. And afterward, they saw the ocean. In due time, Canales' men merged with Balthazar's. Hector and Vicente greeted their new comrades with nods and handshakes. But Balthazar's men were reluctant to reciprocate. Onward, the army trekked. Yet in all that time, they found no gold. For an entire month, the expedition trekked the land north to Apalache. But it came at a price. About eight men had died from their wounds. Another four men were berated with scurvy. On several days, the land possessed no food at all. And although it was autumn, the heat lasted from dawn until twilight. The men looked pain, frail, and gaunt. They looked like walk-in skeletons, wrapped in pounds of steel, and their march slowed to a crawling halt. For many days, Soto said not a word to any of his captains. It was Balthazar who broke the streak. Sir, said Balthazar. Sir, the men are starving. General, General, Don Hernando, please listen to me. But Soto merely stared. General, can't you see what's before you? You won't have an army if you starve them more. And once again, Soto ignored him and commanded his army forward. The next day arrived, and it was Moscoso's turn to approach Soto. Sir, General, Don Hernando. Yes, I'm listening. The men are starving, sir. Our rations simply cannot contain us any further. We must find food from elsewhere. Our men are stronger than you realize, Luis. They'll be fed plenty. But sir, just... Just a little longer. No less than a week. But where? Where are we going, General? And again, Soto left in silence. Two days later, they reached a tiny village that was only a mile away from the coast. The village had no chief, and because it was so small, there was a limited amount of food. With great reluctance, Soto accepted the village and their paltry gifts of dried corn. In the streams, the Spanish caught tiny fish. Towards the shore, the Spanish caught clams, small flounders, and bluefish. At night, the men made camp and slept. They were too weak to do anything else. But again, Soto remained alone. His chessboard rested along his side, and his pieces were scattered in a quandary that he alone could understand. In the morning, Tanako, a subordinate of Anasco, approached Soto. But he, too, suffered the same fate. Don Hernando, said Tanako. At last I found you. I... Soto gave one hard, ominous glare. But Tanako did not get the hint. Our men are concerned about... Then Soto took Tanako by his shoulder and threw him to the ground. He drew his sword kicked Tanako in his stomach and barked and shouted at him. Then Soto inched the top of his blade to Tanako's head. I told you, I did not want to be disturbed. You did not listen. Do this again once more, I dare you. You'll know what will happen. Get up. Tanako groveled and remained on the ground and Soto kicked him once more. Disturb me one more time and I shall cut your fingers. Pray forgiveness comes your way. And with that, Tanako got up to his feet, saluted, and made it back to his horse. From then on, no one dared to speak to Soto at all. Two nights passed. The captains gathered around a fire. All were present, except for Moscoso. He remained on watch with the cavalry. 
The men grunted and said their words in dank darkness. All were agitated and sad. There's too much that could go wrong here. There's too much going wrong right now. For once I agree with you, Balthazar. This makes no sense. Why are we waiting here? Those were our orders. But they were not Don Hernando's orders. They were given by Moscoso. It doesn't make sense to bury the entire army northward. I will never question the general's better judgment, but there's sometimes... Yes, I know. We all know. It's his absence that gets me. That's what I fear most. No one can speak to him. He doesn't want an advisement. It's as if he's lost in his own world. I keep waiting for the Indians to ambush us, but Don Hernando seems not to care. Have any of you spoken with him? No one? Just Moscoso. Where is that bastard? I saw him yesterday by the river bend. His men guard the perimeter. And so why are we left at camp? We should be further out. There's more land than anyone can possibly imagine. I haven't spoke to him since we left Florida. That was a month ago, said Anasco. Moscoso gives me my orders. It's as if he's the only one he speaks to. I guess all we can do is wait for our next orders, whatever they may be. But I believe Don Hernando's got us this far. I still trust him. More days came, more days died, and the sopping morning dew proved thick and everlasting. During those days, the army came upon many villages. Upon first impression, it seemed that the Spanish would again slaughter each village. But with great reluctance, Soto held court, and the Indians accepted the Spanish as their guest. However, on more than one occasion, the villagers remained at a distance, and sometimes they simply disappeared into the ravines. While they rested, the Spanish ate. They ate corn and beans and ravished upon the meat of lean deers. They melted raw grains into a starchy white gruel and ate heaps of it at a time. To the villagers, the Spanish looked like starved and ravaged animals, mainly because they were. And as Ortiz spoke with the villagers, Soto remained close to his side. Two translators stood by the chief as a line of translation formed, and Soto listened intently. As night fell, they set up camp, made fires, and kept watch. And as the night continued, a fervent murmur ran through the air. In the smoke, the old men gambled the night away, and the younger men stared at the village girls who danced naked amongst the fires. Soto remained with Ortiz and the villagers. He sat next to them and stared across a great bush of fire. Again, the village told the story, and slowly, Ortiz began to understand. For half an hour, the villagers spoke, but they did not speak with pride or exuberance. Instead, they spoke in flat and truthful tones, and their eyes were of forthright conviction. Then Soto finally asked the obvious. What is it, Ortiz? What are they saying? Tales, said Ortiz. What tales? Tales of the land up ahead. They say it's a kingdom. They say it's rich and beautiful. What is this land called? asked Soto. The land is called Cofita Chete. It is ruled by a benevolent queen. Where is this land? They say it's about a month march away. And when Ortiz finished, a look of calm came over Soto's face. The captains looked back at Soto from a distance. And as the word of Cofita Chete was spread, 
the Spanish huddled over fire after fire and spent countless hours with priests and translators. The next morning, Soto donned a new coat made of wolf skin. Moscoso rode up to him. He asked Soto about his concerns about the food supply, but Soto merely shrugged. Luis kindly asked again, and Soto finally replied. There will be plenty, Luis. She will provide. Who is she, Don Hernando? The lady. The lady? Yes, the lady. The lady of Cofita Chete. That's over three weeks' journey. Which is why we must march now, Luis. Order your men. We must leave this place at once. Onward to Cofita Chete. She will provide. Early autumn came and went, and the army marched north along the coast. Five more Spanish died of hunger. Twenty more fell ill. Slogs of clay and dirt sank their progress, and the more inland the Spanish drew, the harder the terrain. Days and miles later, they plodded through abandoned fields of rye and wheat grass and yellow and brown clusters of straw. The air seemed clearer, though, and for nearly ten days, it did not rain at all. The cannons and artillery crew seemed to be days off course, and with great anger, Soto ordered Anasco and the other cavalry to go back and assist them. The horses slumped and strained as they carried the excess gear. Later, they were replaced by mules. Two more weeks had passed, but with great relief, the Spanish had finally arrived at Cofita Chete. The slaves had pointed and cheered, and it took some time for the Spanish to adjust their eyes. The land itself was a raw wonder. The first thing they noticed were abundant fields of tended crops. There were acres and acres of squash and corn. And the further they went, the more elevation they endured. The hills grew longer within the arches and slopes, and the soil was dark and dense and filled with earthly promise. The town itself stretched for tens of miles. Massive houses and barracks made of wood and straw stood through its center, and the Spanish looked at each other, relieved. But they were not at all joyous. Their eyes were still filled with anger and pain. Hut after hut stretched on for miles, and clearly it seemed that the population was more than 10,000. Natives of all ages and types came out from their huts and looked on at the Spanish. Most of them walked naked, yet their appearance and bodies were much wider than those of the Napituca and Osita. They all looked stronger and much more intimidating. The Spanish made their initial offerings, and the head tribesmen greeted them with great restraint. In time, the sounds of loud drums cracked the air. The beat was constant and frightening, and the people of Cofita Chete danced and prayed. It was their autumn harvest, and their crops were great and plentiful. And although the Spanish expected an ambush at any moment, the Indians of Cofita Chete seemed calm and tranquil. And what made it all the stranger was that they seemed not at all apprehensive nor surprised of the Spanish arrival. On the first day, Soto ordered his men to stay in position. He called a dozen scouts to go forth and explore the territory. As the army reached an elongated area, several tribesmen bid them welcome. Ortiz made his way to the front of the line and took control of translation. Soto stood still and listened. The translators pointed and grunted. Painfully, Soto turned to Ortiz, and Ortiz relayed. They say there is an elder lady queen, but she is not present at the moment. There was a long silence. The tribesmen continued. 
the translators pointed, Ortiz relayed again. But in charge of this land is her younger niece. Bring forth this lady, said Soto. They say she will come to us, said Ortiz. After another minute of deliberation, the tribesmen asked Soto and Ortiz to follow them down to a river, and Soto begrudgingly obliged. Then finally, the food was offered, and the Spanish delightfully gorged on pounds of fish, loaves, and corn. The Spanish requested more, and more was delivered. And the sounds of smacks and gulps and long, satisfying sighs filled the air. The next morning, Soto assembled two divisions and commanded the rest of the army to stay put. The group followed the slaves down to a river and were repeatedly told that the Lady of the Land was to bid them their official welcome. They arrived at the banks of the river and waited a whole hour. Then they waited for another, and Soto and Ortiz stared at the river and the hollowed-out trees on either end. But then, a sound hurtled past the land. Then a cry. Then a yell. The beating of drums soon followed, and the men pointed to a raft floating in the river. The tribesmen rushed out to the edge of the river and kneeled before the craft. The procession began, and the drums beat louder and louder. Is that her, Ortiz? Yes, Don Hernando. That is the lady. And on the edge of the raft, the lady of Cofita Chete stood. She wore a white gown and her black hair whipped in the wind. Eight women servants came upon the raft and tended to her. And as the Spanish tried to get a closer view, the slaves held up a high wooden platform and lowered it to the raft. The lady then took her chair and was raised high upon the platform, and the servants below drew her out from the water and onto the banks. Her subjects bowed. She sat still. Then her platform lowered, and she got up from her chair and walked on to the sands. She strolled in slow and calculated strides, and as she came closer into view, all grew lost in her beauty, and none more than Soto. The lady stared strangely at the assembly of Spaniards, priests, and slaves. She was not more than twenty years old, but her face looked sullen. She whispered a prayer underneath her breath. She swayed her head and stood alone. Then she picked up a thorn stick and ran her finger along the edge until blood dripped down her side. Soto slowly made his way towards her. He approached gently with even steps. He sauntered and waltzed, making sure his boots did not make a sound. But when the lady was closer into view, Soto became unbalanced. He looked straight into her eyes and did not let go of her gaze. And the lady looked back with a blank stare. When the silence was too much to bear, Soto spoke, and for the first time since he was a child, Soto stuttered. Your, your lady, I must oblige in saying that I am captivated by your beauty. And and your land, we come, lands, we come, far away. Ortiz relayed, then the lady nodded and spoke. Her words were stern and dignified, and she spoke in soft and bellowing tones. And at all times, she remained calm. She says we are welcome guests, said Ortiz. They call me child of the sun, said Soto. In truth, I... But the lady interrupted. Again, she spoke with grace, but this time it was short and diplomatic. 
She says she knows, said Ortiz. She says we will feed your men. Her land is plenty, and she is honored that she has found you. Her words seemed to taper in the air, and Soto stared again once more into her smiling eyes. His whole face had softened, as if it had thawed from a deep winter freeze. Tell her, tell her we are very grateful. Tell her that she is very beautiful. His gaze continued. The lady stared at him, but there was only silence. Sir, you were saying, sir? I've seen her before. The lady? Yes. Where? In a dream. A dream? A horrendous dream. The minute passed, and so did the afternoon. The grunts and commotions of the men continued, and a wide and strange fascination took over. The lady turned her way back to the servants and disappeared into one of the houses. But Soto did not follow. Instead, he stayed standing and examined the land to and fro with a look of immense joy. And for the rest of the day and night, he did not utter a single word. Towards the morning of the next day, the men corralled the dogs and horses, and as promised, the lady of Cofita Chete granted the Spanish more food. Servants entered the field and went to work, and towards midday they brought the Spanish hundreds of bushels of corn, beans, and squash. Soto delegated his orders. His men joined the hunters and fishermen of Cofita Chete. The hunters managed to catch three elk and one doe. The fishermen, however, had a tremendous day. They caught 50 bushels of striped bass, flounders, and porgies. The ebb and flow of the waters temporarily made the Spanish calm, and after the initial days of feeding, it seemed as if the Spanish were finally regaining their strength. A day went by, then another. The Spanish found no gold. Instead, they found more Indian slaves, and they auctioned them off to the highest bidder. And while the army stayed in Cofita Chete and rested, Soto stayed by the princess of the land, whom he affectionately referred to as the lady. He asked for privacy at all times and shared many evenings with her alone. They watched the crescent moon fall upon a ghostly sky. Her charm was simply overwhelming. And every time Soto looked into her eyes, he grew spellbound and lost in her trance. The camp seared with smoke, and the Spanish ate more. But the natives of Cofita Chete made sure to keep their distance from them. The captains sat and voiced their own opinions. Hector and Vicente, too, shared their thoughts. It was approaching a year since they left Spain, and they had forgotten much of it. I have a feeling, Hector, said Vicente. What feeling? I don't know. I, I just have a feeling. What is it? This land seems very rich. Richer than all of La Florida. It is. I think we'll find it. No, I know we'll find it. We've come too far. That we have, said Hector. But when? Soon, this lady, I feel she'll bring us there. Let's pray you're right, Vicente. A day passed, and Soto ordered several platoons to march north through the hills. They found thick, dense marshes that went on for many miles, and they followed the slaves to the taller trees. From there, they spotted a stream that was once said to have carried silver. 
for five straight hours. They dug and panned and searched. But there was no silver of any kind. And when the men reported back to their captains, the captains turned to Soto. But he was nowhere to be found. Miles away in the secluded woods, the lady and Soto walked alone. And throughout the afternoon, the lady guided Soto and showed him her world. They strolled through the green rolling hills, and along the budding blossoms of the lilies, they held hands. Soto could feel eyes watching him. He switched his view in constant alert, but as time passed, his vigilance and restlessness wore away. Then the happy silence replaced every fear, and he looked deeper into the lady's eyes and fell into the moment. They rested along the shade of a great oak tree, and Soto's eyes grew deep and heavy. He lay his head on the lady's lap and fell into a deep sleep. The lady remained calm and played with Soto's thin hair. Then she spoke aloud in soft and faint whispers. She spoke of the trees in the mountain west. She spoke of the streams, the hills and the mounds, the history of her people, the ancient mound builders, and all of the ancient spirits of Cofitechete. But with no translators present, her words drifted into the air and vanished. And when she finished, Soto awoke and smiled at her. Then Soto said words of his own. I know there is much more. And as the sun waned, Soto and the lady of Kofita Chete walked together again. And when the stars emerged in the sky, Soto made it back to camp alone. He arrived at his tent and saw his men gathered to greet him. But Soto merely waved his hands and sighed. Another hot and humid day arrived. In the morning, the lady and the elder chieftains of Cofitechete held a meeting with a Spanish near the banks of a small river. Soto gathered near Ortiz and the lady, and as Ortiz relayed the information to Soto, his captains waited on the banks and listened. She says there is a land north by the river. She will take us there said Ortiz. An hour later, ten canoes landed near the edge of the sand. The Spanish boarded ten men to each canoe, and Soto, taking the lady by her hand, escorted her down to the edge of the longest canoe, and they sat at each other's side. The river surged with continuous sounds of slushes and pools. The current strengthened, and the canes bobbed up and down and the slaves rowed for another hour. But then the river settled. They stopped in the middle of the water, and there was no shade at all. It became very still and brown. The Spanish sweated through their armor, and their faces were red and filled with blisters. The heat came from all around, and each man's face looked as if it was about to boil. And through the river, a peaceful but eerie silence lingered. The sky soon became filled with clouds, and Soto gazed beyond and slipped deep into his dream. He muttered to himself, and when he opened his eyes back up, the lady smiled and concentrated on the river. A brisk wind had formed, then a faint drizzle fell onto the canoes, and pinged and patted against the Spanish armor. Then the lady pointed several times east. She repeated the phrase, and Ortiz relayed. She says it's just a little further. And the river went on. Her servants were summoned near a giant oak tree. They spotted an old man wearing rags and holding a cane. His face was weathered and worn, 
His eyes were dim and gray. The lady bowed and kneeled. And then the old man spoke. Soto drew Ortiz and his translators forward. The old man finished speaking, and the lady raised her hand. She then commanded her servants to go forth, and the Spanish followed. About an eighth of a mile later, the lady stopped. Then she spoke in a quiet, honorable tone, and Ortiz relayed, and the translation followed. About ten moons ago, several of her men walked about and discovered this. We assumed it was given by some gods. Gods that looked very much like you, said Ortiz. The servants came across a soft patch of dirt and dug into the soil with their bare hands. Seeing this, the Spanish roared like ravaged hyenas. They rushed to the spot and dug with their swords, and the whole of Soto's men burst out with screams of ecstasy. They dug inside and the dirt flowed in all directions. And because there wasn't enough room, and because the servants worked slow, the Spanish threw off the servants one by one. They dug deeper in fervent haste. They hacked and dug and cursed and swung wildly. And Soto watched with utter certainty as the lady stood by his side. Then one soldier swung his axe. It made a clear, hollow, and distinct sound. The men clawed into the dirt, uncovered an object, and brought it to the surface. All stared at a rotted wooden chest that was covered in moss and cobwebs. It was the size of a small table. But for the Spanish, it remained the most important thing in the world. Soto placed his hands on the chest and opened up the lid. Inside were pieces of gold and sapphire, a hundred pieces of rubies and emeralds, tiny coins of Inca gold, sapphire, and slanted chunks of silver. Soto held each piece and lowered his head. Then he cried, and the Spanish hollered and embraced each other. The lady spoke once more but her words were muddled by shouts and screams. Then Ortiz took the helm and relayed what she said. They are strange, but beautiful gods, said Ortiz. Soto rose to his feet and spoke. And once again, he gazed into her eyes. Ortiz, tell her, let it be known that this is what we're after, that this in our hearts is the treasure we seek, and that we are forever grateful for her and for her people. And like all days, the sun died into night. Throughout the next days and nights, word spread of the treasure and the whole of Cofita Chete seemed to erupt with excitement. The Spanish were enthralled, and the celebration commenced. For the day and the moment had finally arrived. The camps were littered with bottles of wine, and the men finally opened the bottles they saved since Cuba. They screamed and danced. They devoured and gorged the sweet and majestic juice of the vine, and the people of Cofita Chete watched from afar with fright, not knowing what these beasts would do next. The captains all examined the treasure and confirmed its validity. They huddled over their tent, and they too shared a bottle of old fine wine, and they too finally looked alive. That's Inca gold. There's no doubt about it. Sapphire too. But where did it come from? From the north, perhaps. It couldn't possibly be from the north, unless the land goes further out. This land is so vast, there's no telling where it came from. It might have come from the mountains. Wherever it came from, it's a blessing. It means that we're closer than we realize. It's poultry. Yes, it's poultry. 
but our work is finally paying off. We'll search this land inch by inch. We shall. Beyond the captain's tent, in the dense fire of the men, Hector and Vicente, too, shared their thoughts. They sat next to each other in the glowing hum of dusk, watched the sun cast over to the bright noon, and ate their meal of corn and beans, which somehow tasted sweeter than the day before. They were veterans now, bitter and angry, but still intrigued. The thrill they had when they left Spain had finally returned, and each time they looked at each other, they giggled, knowing all the pain they had suffered and endured. I told you, Hector, (laughs) I told you this day would come. That you did, Vicente. I told you when I get those feelings, I just know. Do you think we'll find more? I know we'll find more. Then Hector sighed. For a moment, he looked sad and wistful. Vicente turned and squinted. What's wrong? I don't know, said Hector. What don't you know? It's just... I wish Canales was here. So do I, said Vicente. But when you're gone, you're gone. Then Hector fell asleep. And Vicente watched his friend slip deeper into his own thoughts, clearly overwhelmed. Your father would be proud, Hector, said Vicente. I know, said Hector. His son followed his footsteps, went through the unknown, went through hell, and came back a conquistador. I know, it just seems. Seems what, Hector? It just seems impossible. What seems impossible, said Vicente? Everything, said Hector. Vicente did not respond. He finished his bottle, stared at the North Star, and prayed. Then he handed the bottle over to Hector. Drink some more. You think too much. And as the day went on, all eyes were on Soto. But he gave no further orders. Soto remained alone for hours at a time. He was lost in thought and wonder. He ran his hair through his hands and walked over to the blacksmith and spent the majority of his day there, marveling once again at their labor. He watched the smiths work away as they hammered out new steel and repaired old swords. Through the steam and embers of the fire, the men saluted Soto. And Soto saluted back. The rhythms of blows and shifts and chinks continued for hours. They were the sounds of Toledo. They were the sounds of old and methodical methods that were proper and sanctified. They were the sounds of pain and sheer determination that created new bounty. Sharp and beautiful steel that ruled all the known and unknown. And sense in this, Soto closed his eyes and felt a great peace. The heat rose to an unbearable pitch, but hour after hour the smiths persisted. They wiped off their sweaty brows, and their bodies turned into globs of melting red skin. But Soto remained along their side, given nothing but looks of pride and sheer admiration. And when a new sword was finally finished, One of the smiths offered it to Soto, and Soto accepted the sword with grace and honor. An hour later, Soto returned. Beside him lay the rotted chest of wood and its treasure. Soto lay on his stomach and slowly reached out his hands. Imagine each piece of treasure and the year's worth of hell. Again, Soto closed his eyes and nodded. Pools of drool ran down from his face. There were ten pieces of sapphire, 
blue as majestic as the sea. Soto held them in his hands and inhaled a deep and encompassing breath. He did the same with the silver, and lastly, he did the same with the gold. All the power and the glory, he had now possessed it. Each gem was a spirit unto itself, and when there were no more pieces left to hold, he placed them back inside the chest and said a short and convincing prayer to a god he had long forgotten about. The next day came, and all remained peaceful in Cofitachete. In the morning, Soto ordered Anasco and Balthasar to head a force north and explore the territories beyond the place where they had found their first treasure. And the rest of the army patrolled the lands south and west. At noon, both Alvas and Rangal reported back to Soto and ran the litanies of their inventory and journal entries to him. And Soto nodded and affirmed with minimal attention. When they were finished, Soto dismissed the two and searched far and wide for the lady. He found her an hour later, sitting along the shallow waters. And given no further orders, Alvas and Rangel went back to their respective tents and prepared their daily entries. And they noted all they had recalled. It is currently the 29th of March, 1540. And we have approached day 304 of the Entrata de la Florida. With cautious and humble accuracy, I Raquel, the governor's secretary, report the following inventory catalog. In regards to death, 25. In regards to injured and severely sick, 52. In regards to missing and presumed dead, 17. In regards to food, for many months the stockpile was in dire need of restoring. However, due to the great abundance of the Cofetechete land, the food inventory has greatly been replenished, and all 20 wagons of the previous winter are well stocked with grains, corn, dried beans, and cured fish. In regards to food lost, we have slaughtered some 350 pigs and have lost at least 25 of them. Three days ago, we had slaughtered the very last dozen. They were divided into 16 pieces each, with each platoon taking a calculated portion. Also on that day, we had butchered two oxen. For the small and large artillery, the inventory now remains as follows. 16 cannons, all in proper working condition. 185 arquebuses, 211 crossbows, and 33 cases of gunpowder. For the cavalry and general army, it will be reported in the following weeks, since not an accurate number has been established. Duly noted in humble regards, Gentlemen of Rancal, 29th March, 1540. Beyond the valley was 200 leagues over mountainous territory, and from predictions we would have to cross over very rough and high mountains. But the governor remained focused and steadfast upon the land, which the Indians called Cofitachete. In our initial meeting, 20 Indians came out to meet him, each carrying a basket of mulberries, walnuts, and plums. And in Cofitachete land, we were provided enough food and hope. We met upon a queen who was dressed in a white gown and welcomed us with grace. During the next days, this queen of Cofitachete showed us her vast lands, and on one particular day, she showed the governor a chest filled with sapphire, gold, and silver. We asked for more, and on the 18th of March, the army headed north to a broad land of swamp and deep water. And from that point, great joy spread over to the entire army, for it finally seemed that our expectation of this land were met, and that more plentiful gifts were bound to follow. Gentlemen of Alvas, April 1st, 1540. But still... Soto remained in a daze, 
and when the desire had overwhelmed him, he spent nights with the lady of Kofita Chete. But knowing that he was watched, not by his own guards, but by the tribesmen, he kept in vigilant behavior. Needless to say, this facade did not last very long. Two days later, Soto ordered his men to leave him and the lady alone. He requested each captain to patrol a given area and not to go within three miles of the town. Now is not the time to venture, he said to them. Now's the time to rest. The men complied, and with their request granted, Soto and the Lady of Kofita Chete remained completely alone. They were miles away in a distant wooden area where no servants, guard, or slave, or any man of any nature was present. And in his privacy, Soto took the lady by her hand, and they sauntered through the lands and streams. Her white gown was now sullen in hues of brown and green, and in the wind-whipped air, they made their way onto the banks. Then the lady pulled on Soto's arms and led him onwards through the trees, where they walked for a long half-mile. When they grew tired, they stopped near a shaded slope. Then Soto looked into the lady's small eyes, grabbed her arms, and kissed her long and hard and for hours they made love and ignored the rest of the world. The next day Soto awoke, but the lady was already standing. She grabbed his arm, and they walked further along the streams. They walked for an hour, and Soto looked all about. Where are you taking me? said Soto. But his reply went unanswered. The lady just smiled, rubbed his arm, and blinked her eyes. Soto peered up top the trees, though there was nothing in sight. There was no sound. There was only the ceaseless hum of birds and insects. They discovered a large stream ten miles later, and the lady walked off, bent down, and dipped her hands in the water, and Soto followed her. Then he stopped and looked over to a glistening light. He saw a bed of oyster shells covered in green and brown corals. And about a minute later, the lady returned to Soto with two large gray shells in her hands. She handed him the shells, but Soto looked confused. She said two words and repeated them, but Soto shook his head, noting he did not understand what she said. The lady then opened her oyster with her hands and slurped out the meat with one gulp. She waited for Soto to do the same. Soto imitated the lady, but he fumbled the oyster and it slid in and out of his hands. He squeezed the shell by its end and for long, painful minutes, he tried to pry it open. But he could not. Then Soto took out his knife and slit the shell. In doing so, He cut his hands on the spike, and the blood squirted out and smeared onto his armor, and dripped to the water below. The lady then took back the oyster, cracked it open, and handed it back to Soto. They both stood still and silent, but the lady looked very sad. They made a small fire as the sun went down, and as night came, they made love again. But Soto would not let go of her. He clutched onto her body, and he cradled his hand on her laps as if he were a child, and he fell into a deep, long sleep. For half an hour, neither said a word. The lady breathed in and out and did not blink, and Soto closed his eyes, still with his head in her lap. She watched his chest go up and down, and she heard him snore loudly. Then the lady pulled Soto's head away from her. Soto's lips hit the sand, and when the lady turned over, she sat up and peered deep into the black heavens. In the full moonlight, they sat across from each other and stared at the growing fire. 
The air turned cold and damp, and Soto remained lost in thought. Then when she deemed it time, the lady presented Soto with another gift. It was a string of pearls she made while he slept. She wiped the dirt off and placed it around his neck. They're beautiful, he said. He looked again at her face and held her hair with his fingers. But the lady yawned with tired eyes. He took off the necklace and stared at it for a minute. Then he stared once again to the lady's flat nose and small eyes. And in the silence, Soto sat by the lady and watched her every move. He tried to come up with words to say to her, knowing full well she would not understand a single one. But he said the words anyway. Words that meant so much and captured more. But words the lady could never understand. Still, Soto said them. He lost sense of time, and the words poured out of him. I saw you in a dream. I know you will show us everything. My mother used to sing a song to me every night. I forget it now. I used to know it. You'll remind me, won't you? Please. By the river, towards the rising sun, remind me, remind me. Please remind me, he repeated. By the river. But the lady shook her head. His words rang flat and empty. And the lady stared, not understanding the word he said. Then she closed her eyes and fell asleep. The full moon peaked and radiated. And in Kofitacheti land, many men had awoken. Hector's hands shook as he gasped for air. Beside him, Vicente yawned and swatted at flies. Another day had passed. The savanna heat emerged once again, and the Spanish press onward through the grass. I had a dream last night, said Vicente. It was the same dream I had the night before. Go on, said Hector. I was an old man. But I was a rich man, a very rich man, and I lived on a beautiful island. I lived in the castle, and it was mine, all mine, Hector. And all the gold I ever found was in that castle, mine to hold, protect. I was named King. What happened next, said Hector. Then came the invaders. I saw their ships, and I prepared my army. And then? Then I woke up. What about your dream, Hector? Tell me your dream. I don't really remember. Go on, you'll remember. No, you'll think it's stupid. Go on, tell me your stupid dream. Hector paused, but then it came back to him. All I remembered was the land. It was a beautiful, green, peaceful land, and I remembered walking through it. What else? said Vicente. That's what I remember. Walking? What kind of dream is that? Walking? Were you alone? No. I wasn't alone. There were others. Strangers. They were walking too. We all knew each other. But it wasn't the dream that mattered. It was the feeling. What did you feel? I felt a great peace. But what else? What about the treasure? 
There wasn't any treasure. No treasure? No treasure? No gold? No silver? Then what? What was the point? Hector gave no response. Vicente looked on to the other men. Then he sighed and turned away. Enough about dreams. We have a busy day. Come on, Hector. Let's go. Soto returned to the camp with a lady by his side. He had assembled his men and declared that she would show them the gifts she had promised. And for those hours, the army paced east to the shore. The men muttered and scowled. Their boots sank in the sands. And when they saw the depths of the water, the lady stopped and pointed. All stood perplexed. What is this? One man cried. I don't understand. There were no words or reply. Soto greeted the lady. She bent down to the surface, retrieved the string of pearls, and placed it around his head. Then two dozen of her servants climbed the sand hills and appeared with shells and bundles of grass. The elder statesman entered and spoke to the Spanish aloud. These pearls, Ortiz surmise, these are the eyes of the world. And Soto stood and stared. The servants made their way to the men and laid out a large tarp of deerskin. The Spanish looked at it, and below, they saw a multitude of clear small pearls, white goblets of round and holy purity, half a bushel in all. Then the lady spoke. She says these pearls are for you, said Ortiz. For all the gifts of this land we share. Soto stuttered. Then he waved his hands and said no more. The day ended, and the men made their fires. Their voices cracked with excitement. But an unresolved misery and suspicion lingered, and the men said what was on their minds. Only pearls? I didn't kill myself only for pearls. It's only an appetizer. They are beautiful pearls, though. But there has to be more. There must be more. Tomorrow. We'll find it all tomorrow. We'll search every goddamn inch. I don't know. I think they hid it in the temples. Hid what? Everything. How do you know? I just know. We've waited. We've waited too fucking long. Days continued. The lady summoned a young man to lead the Spanish onward through the hills. The young man stood tall, lean, and gangly. And although his face was very brave, he held a forever confused expression. He was said to be the lady's cousin. Moscoso's men joined Balthasar's, and soon 150 men marched along the wide mounds of the sand dunes and the young man guided them all. The servants repeatedly stated that the land possessed many quarries of silver just beyond the hills. But when they arrived, the Spanish found no quarry of any kind. The next day, Soto assembled his captains and gave his orders. I've asked the lady to show us more of the land, and she has complied. Juan Anasco. Yes, Don Hernando. Move your men three miles south. The rest will gather upon the rendezvous point where we are to follow the lady. There is more to find, and we'll find it today. An hour later, the Spanish found shiny metals along a stretch of jagged rocks. However, all of it was copper, which was next to worthless to the Spanish. Ask them for more Ortiz, said Soto. The night came. 
the people of Kofita Chete performed and danced a long procession. Their prayer was to their falcon god, whom they waited five years to arrive. As the dances proceeded, the priests held a vigil. They bellowed and prayed loudly, trying to drown out all the Indian shouts, but the constant drumming did not cease. More days passed, and more disappointments followed. The Spanish followed more trails and found acres of corn and squash. They ate hearty meals, but found no silver or gold. And soon the spring rains raced along the coast and stayed. Again, they found more lands and thriving villages with thousands of people among them. The Spanish found more beans, more corn, more squash and gourds. But they found no metal, iron, or jewels. The young man showed all the lands, but the Spanish wanted more. Finally, they pointed towards the temples, and as the day came to an end, the young man wept. The Spanish insisted that they show them the temples, but the young man retorted, We've shown you all the lands. It was still not enough. And when the Spanish threatened him with their swords and barked their orders, they pointed back to the temples again. And the young native looked back with great pain. You are forbidden. They are only for the dead. But the Spanish took no heed. They ventured on and ceased every temple, striking and decapitating anyone who stood in their way. This is the land we belong to. It births us all. It is all we know. How can you take it? But the young man's plea went unanswered, and the Spanish whipped him across his back. The Spanish ransacked the temples and searched for their fortune. They struck each totem pole and poked holes in their hard wood. They uncovered blankets and quilts, and they set aflame buffalo skin and straw. They yelled and shrieked and hollered, but after a half an hour, they found nothing. And an hour later, nothing still. Then they took their rage onto the slaves and lashed them with their whips. The young man yelled and screamed and ran. The Spanish gave chase and unleashed their dogs, but by then, he was covered in a pool of his own blood. The young man had stabbed himself in the stomach with a pointed stone, and the Spanish watched him bleed. Another night fell, the captains huddled by their fires. Among those present were Balthazar, Moscoso, Juananasco, Bedima, Tobar, and Tinaco. Soto, however, remained alone. What are we doing? God, would I like to know. Have any of you spoke with Don Hernando? No, have you? Yes, only this morning. What did he say? Nothing as usual. He just gave out his orders. What did your men find? Pearls. Only pearls? Only pearls. No gold? None. Silver? None. Only pearls. Pearls! Wonders of wonder. But what about our rations? Didn't you mention it to him? No, only to Ortiz. Bah! Ortiz! What about him? He's blind for one. We're following the blind man. It's so obvious I can't even laugh about it anymore. He's been helpful. Yes, he's been helpful, but he's been very vague. I blame the guides more than I blame Ortiz. At least Ortiz is Spanish. He might be blind, but I'll never doubt his loyalty. Their talk subsided. Most of the captains left. Only Balthasar and Moscoso remained. You seem to know more about Don Hernando than most, Luis, said Balthazar. 
He trusts you more than most. Yes, I suppose, said Moscoso. So tell me, what is he doing? He's waiting for a move. But even you must admit there's no gold here. If we settle here, if we build here, Don Hernando will not settle. That's what I'm afraid of. It's as if he's lost. Lost? In a dream. Like he always is. And so he was. About a quarter of a mile from the camp, Soto sat beside the lady. Her face was filled with fear. Her whole body trembled. Then Soto reached his hand into the flame, but gave no reaction of pain. The lady gasped and looked away, but Soto continued to stare deep into her eyes. And the misery lingered. The misery morphed into anger. Anger grew to rage. And the days of peace in Kofi Tichete were over. One man in Balthazar's group had vanished and was reported missing for several days. The men searched up and down the marsh. It was Hector who found him. He pointed and all stared at a corpse that was tied to a tree. The Spaniard's entire face had been mangled. The next day, another body was found. It was the youngest in Tanaco's unit, Brother Alberto. Three more bodies were found. All were hung and burnt. When Soto glanced at the bodies, he showed little emotion. He muttered a prayer and walked away. And for the rest of the afternoon, Soto searched for the lady. He followed the stream down the wild cotton and birch trees. A strong wind blew and white tips of cotton swirled like snow. And the sky was filled with clouds. Soto smelled the burning fires and his eyes shuddered back and forth. The smell of the fire pierced his nostrils, and he coughed uncontrollably. In the swirl of the ash, Soto squinted. He opened his hands and repeated the phrase. My lady. An hour later, the sun had died. But still, the phrase lingered. My lady. He took another trail between tall pines and taller sycamores. He inched forward, slow, then slower. He peered within the trees. He saw shadows. Then he found her. She stood beside the birch tree. Her gown sauntered in the air. And Soto moved in closer. My lady. The archers set their sights. They leaned high up top the sycamores. And Soto's head came into focus. They aimed. They fired. But their arrows missed. Soto stared at the lady again. And the next arrows fired. One arrow missed. The other clanged off Soto's armor. And when Soto turned, a warrior with an axe charged right at him. Cannon fire exploded in the sky. A loud eruption struck the trees. And Soto saw the knife slash across the warrior's neck. Screams came out from the distance. They were Spanish screams. They called out his name. Don Hernando! Don Hernando! The screams were followed by more cannon fire, barks, and the shouts of soldiers rushing through the marsh. And the archers up top the canopy fled into the night. Another voice screamed. Don Hernando! Don Hernando! And Soto saw Moscoso's face 
as he stood by the warrior's corpse. Soto was still shocked. He looked all over. He looked to the streams and again to the withered hands. Then he looked at the lady, who stood a hundred yards away. He stared, and she stared right back at him, with sad, hearkened eyes, as tears fell down her cheek. And Soto seethed with pure rage. He pointed and yelled, Chain her! The lady ran, but the Spanish tackled her to the ground and chained her hands and feet. The lady cried and whimpered, but Soto looked away. Moscoso. Yes, Don Hernando. Burn it. Burn the whole town. Moscoso nodded, and within minutes, his men carried forth their order, and Cofita Chete was lit asunder. The Spanish threw torch after torch as faces disappeared in the black and billowing plumes of smoke that engulfed the entire sky. The temples, the huts, the granaries, and anything that stood were all lit asunder. The lady found herself by her servants. They too were chained, and they too cried as they watched their whole world burn. And all through the hours, more cries rang out through time and space. The elders were thrown to the ground and burnt alive. The native women of Colfita Chete were raped and left for dead. And the native children ran away. But then the cries subsided. And what was heard then were nothing but the cinder and sounds of fallen ash, hacks and coughs, and bodies inflamed. Night had fallen, and the madness continued. Chapter 5 Soto sat across from me in the dark, and his horrible game continued. He folded his hands, embraced his forehead upon them. I felt many minutes pass. In between the moves, all I thought about was why he wanted to play his game, and what, if anything, he was trying to prove. We were still at the midpoint of the game. No peace had been taken. The board was crowded. Pawns and knights, and bishops and rooks. Soto had castled. I had not. We both contained well-guarded defenses, and I had not moved my queen. But soon, I felt my stomach tear underneath me. As Soto made his move, an awful pain crept from my legs up to my head. My whole body throbbed. But as my turn came again, I was left with few options. I knew not which piece to move. It was a miracle I hadn't been beaten yet. And I heard the words underneath Soto's breath. They were words he repeated. Words that grew solid with power. And he said them with utmost conviction. And he held them sacred. To kill the king. I raised my head above the board and saw his face glow from the firelight. Upon seeing it, I cringed. It was then that I knew he had gone mad. The madness was deep and all-consuming. It was a madness that I knew too well. It was a madness that was birthed out of conquest, and then birthed again by obsession and suffering. It was madness for madness' sake. And Soto had made his own horror. He stared right through me. He looked long and hard. 
but there was no life left in his eyes. Make your move, Sardina. I made it. It was the only choice I had. I blocked his knight and took his pawn. He fell silent and matched my reticence. Then he moved exactly where I thought he would. He moved his knight to attack my queen. More minutes passed. More silence. And he stayed perfectly still. In the dark. Soon after they burned it, the Spanish left the lands of Cofita Chete. It took two days, but the army trekked 20 miles west. And within the span of three more days, they had trekked 30 miles inland. The lady, now locked in chains and surrounded by slaves, had been transferred to the end of the line. Several times her servants offered to carry her by hand or upon her royal chair, but she refused and walked on foot. All of the Spanish glared at her, and all were surprised that she was still alive. The Entrada marched for five more days, and in all that time, Soto never once came to the lady's side. He merely watched her from afar as the oxen and steers blocked his view. At night, Soto remained alone and murmured and babbled to himself, not caring at all who could hear him. He looked to the stars, but he did not pray. Instead, he retrieved the board in pieces from his sack and assembled them in order. The march continued, and through the heat of the savanna, the Spanish moved deeper through the lowlands. They sweated through their pores and hacked at the tall grass, and they thrust and chopped at snakes, lizards, and all creatures that got in between. Then the Entrada came across a tribe whose houses reached the back stretch of a nearby meadow. As determined by the translators, the tribe was a distant ally of Cofita Chete though they regarded each other in not the warmest terms. The lady was questioned if she knew the tribe, and she confirmed. And it was there that the Spanish ceased their march and rested. In the darkness, before a huge bonfire, the Spanish asked the tribe of the land west. They listened to the rumors and were not pleased. And again, Ortiz was at the center of attention although much of the translation went beyond his comprehension. The tribe asked again and again about the lady and why she was held prisoner, but Soto refused to answer them. An hour later, more tales were told, and Ortiz relayed them all to Soto and his captains. They say there is a land west of here, said Ortiz. They call it Cusa. Is it a kingdom or just a land? asked Soto. They say it's a land. How big is this land? They say it covers hundreds of miles. The tribe went on. Cusco? asked Soto. No, Cusa. But who are its rulers? They say they don't know. They say there are many. There is not only one. Ortiz rested, and a Dominican monk, Brother Alvarez, took over the translation. The tribe relayed their stories, and it went on and on. The Spanish became weary and soon fell asleep. Posoto stayed up and listened to all the tales. Then Ortiz raised his head from his rest. A thought occurred to him, and he noticed that Soto's grimace had not changed. The lady, sir, she knows of the lands to the west. Should I ask her? No. No. You've asked her plenty of times, Ortiz, said Soto. We're not going to play her game. An hour passed. Many more members of the tribe gathered, and Soto sat beside them. 
Ortiz spoke and asked them of the lands of gold, and their response was of many tales, much like Kofita Chete and Osita. They repeated the land that was named Kusa, and beyond it was another land, a great land with rich soil. There is a shaman of this land, a, a medicine man, said Ortiz. He speaks of a king, the one true and... What's his name? asked Soto. Where is the shaman? The tribesmen pointed along the shadows of the fire, and a tall native appeared. He was known as the tribe shaman. He stood gaunt and lanky with narrow shoulders and legs seemingly made out of stone. He glided over the fire. Then he spoke. Neither Ortiz nor the Cofitecheti servants knew what he was saying, but the tribe's elder statesman offered his help and took control of the translation. When the shaman finished, Soto darted his eyes, and the shaman glared back at Soto and returned the gesture. But, unlike Soto, the shaman did not show hateful eyes. Instead, his eyes acted as a reflective pool, and from his pupils, Soto stared at himself. Ortiz relayed. He welcomes you, child of the sun, Ortiz said. He says you know. He tells of the land of Kusa. It is prosperous. Soto's eyes open. Go on. This man speaks of a river. Not just one, but many. He says these rivers were made because their gods cried so many times. Soto jerked his head and spat. But he says the rivers will deem your fate. And that the river's end is the great wealth you seek. Where, said Soto, where are these rivers? The shaman spoke two words. At the end of Kusa, said Ortiz. He says there's a bend in each river, a bend that goes on many directions, and that you are to choose. Choose. These rivers form one giant river, and at the end of it is... is... Is what? He says you know the answer. What? He says you've known all your life. He says there are many rivers in many ways, but there is only one river, and it's the one you're looking for. And at the end, you will find it. Then Soto shouted and threw a handful of sand. What the hell does that mean? He yelled again, and his screams awoke the men. The shaman spoke again, all but three words. It took half a minute for Ortiz to surmise what had been said. The slaves repeated. Ortiz relayed and shook his head. He says you will know for sure when the rivers cross. There is a clear bend, and which way you go will seal your fate. Ortiz stopped. The shaman went on. The monks gestured. Ortiz relayed. He says there is a bend of the river, of which goes two ways. One way leads to the evil spirits of horror and agony. The other way leads to paradise. Yet no one knows the true way. Only the spirits of the pure know. Only the ancients. The shaman stopped speaking. He inhaled deeply, inserted a hot chili into his mouth and swallowed it whole. Is there more, said Soto. 
And what of this king? There is no movement or response. What of the king? repeated Soto. The shaman stood still and glared back. Ortiz asked. The shaman spoke. Beyond the river, there is another shaman, said Ortiz. He says he will tell you. That, that's all he will say, Don Hernando. The sun emerged through the dawn. The fires died out, and the captains waited for Soto. At noon, Soto stared east and peered down the land that seemed to go on forever. Then he turned west and stayed silent. He came upon a stream and followed a narrow path that was scattered with stones. And back and forth, Soto walked, slicing the water with his sword. The shaman was never seen again. He disappeared as the sun rose, and the next day the army marched west. The land went on, and the Spanish negotiated with the other tribes in peaceful offerings, and no scuffle nor incident was reported for several days. A week later, the Spanish came upon a great path to which the natives said bridged two worlds together. But when the Spanish heard these rumors, they could not even feign interest, for their morale was one of pain and constant misery. The path narrowed and the abundant forest returned, and the soil grew sandy. And because the elevation rose steeper, the heavy artillery, cavalry, and backup brigades did not follow. Soto ordered only Moscoso and Balthasar's men to trek through the path, and the rest of the army headed to the valley, set up camp along a stretch of plum trees, and guarded the imprisoned lady of Cofita Chete and her slaves and servants. The guards kept a vigilant watch on the lady as they stopped near the grove. The lady's servants came to her side, and she gave them orders to assist the Spanish in picking the fruit. The day was cloudless, and the sun blinded from east to west. The lady took to one of the trees, and although she was still locked in chains, she managed to pick the low fallen fruit from the ground. She worked fast and without interruption, and in less than ten minutes she picked a half a bushel. She walked down with ease as her guards and servants followed her, and all noticed that her gown had gotten terribly soiled. And to the Spanish, she now looked like a common whore or beggar. It approached high noon. The servants carried twenty bushels of plums and placed them alongside the lady's carriage. And the lady kindly bowed. Moscoso then ordered his men to fall back south and rendezvous back to the main camp. Balthazar's men had already done so hours ago. They moved on for two hours at a tremendously slow pace. After another hour, Moscoso finally told his men to rest and the men led their horses to a nearby stream. The men talked and explained their grievances to Moscoso, and Moscoso pretended to listen. This land just keeps going and going, said one man. Where the hell are we? said the other. Who knows? We have no idea what they're saying. (laughs) We've had that problem for years. As the minutes passed, the Spanish rested on logs. The dew formed and butterflies floated along the streaks of orange and yellow sky. Then Pedro, one of Moscoso's men, came to Moscoso's side. Moscoso noticed a certain pain in Pedro's eyes, and they both stood alongside their horses. What is it, son? said Moscoso. He should have killed her. Who? Don Hernando should have killed her. She betrayed us. Why should she live? It's not my decision, Pedro. I know it's not, sir. It just bothers me. I know it is, but don't let it get to you. You can only control what's in front of you. You hear? 
Yes, sir. Pedro stared at the lady. He saw her sit across the giant sycamore as she prayed with her eyes closed. Though still chained, she raised her hands and pressed her fingers against her chest, and her face glowed bright. Some of the Spanish watched her, but the others ignored her and drifted back into their conversations. She hummed a sweet sound, and the birds joined in harmony. She swayed her head back and forth to the rhythm. She closed her eyes and tilted her head from side to side. And it was clear that she was singing. Perhaps an old song which her father taught her. Perhaps a new song of her own. Or a song which only the people of Kofita Chete knew. But then the song ended. And the lady opened her eyes. A shriek pierced the land and the Indians echoed the signal. The slaves and servants rushed and ambushed the Spanish, striking them with spears, knives, and clubs, and a flood of arrows shot out from the trees. A dozen Indians jumped off from tall branches and tackled the Spanish to the ground. A dozen more pulled the Spanish off their horses and pummeled on top of them. One slave took a Spaniard's helmet and smashed a soldier in the head with it repeatedly. The servants and slaves broke off their chains, freeing those who were shackled and bloodied their wrists while doing so. The others stole as many Spanish swords as they could. But the Spanish quickly took the upper hand. They fired rounds with hand cannons and slashed away. Soon, the air filled with smoke. And a minute later, the Spanish killed 30 Indians, spearing most of them through their gut and leaving piles of steam. In all, five Spaniards lay dead on the ground. Ten more were severely wounded. Moscoso himself suffered a wound to his head and neck, but by then, most of the Indians, including the Lady of Cofita Chete, had fled into the woods. The Spanish gave chase and unleashed their dogs, but as an hour elapsed, Moscoso called off the search. At sunset, the Lady now unchained, summoned her servants and guides. They stood under a stretch of willows and pines and looked at her with great reverence. She simply pointed further and all understood what she had meant. They forged west and with exhausted faces and racing hearts, her people followed. At the rendezvous point, Moscoso's men finally caught up with Balthazar's men and later, they both made it back to camp. Soto emerged from his tent, and Moscoso bowed in haste. Is it true? said Soto. Yes, yes, it's true, Don Hernando. The lady has escaped. Soto gave pause, but he did not sigh. He merely glared and clenched his teeth. What shall we do? asked Moscoso. What we've been doing, we press on. But what about the lady, Don Hernando? She's bound to lead her forces against us. Shouldn't we go after her? No. But Don Hernando, she never mattered. She was a waste of time. That's all she was. She was worthless from the very start. I should have known that. But I was blind, Moscoso. Soto glared once more. Moscoso averted his eyes and remained composed. Then Soto took out his sword and pointed. West is the river. And down it, through it, or above it is what we're waiting for. Another good dream. But not here. And not with her. He exhaled hard through his nostrils. He mounted his horse and rose his sword once more. I will not follow a whore towards Galilee. We cannot waste any more time. Our kingdom awaits!
Then Soto kicked his horse and trailed off into the night. Spring turned to summer. The Spanish marched west for three more weeks, and the cavalry followed south. They met halfway between a narrow stretch of land that dipped across the mountain, and the men looked at Soto from afar with solemn reverence. And as it was foretold, they came upon the land named Cusa. It was a land much larger than what the Spanish anticipated. It consisted of many villages, and Soto marched his way through each and every one. But Cusa had no gold of any kind. For several weeks, a certain repetition followed. The Spanish would ask for gold, the cake of each village would deny that they had any, and Soto would take the cake hostage and burn the village to the ground. And in exchange with one of the head chiefs, Ortiz discerned that there was a trail close by which led down many rivers. The last village, however, the Spanish did not burn. Instead, Soto gave the Kaki refuge in exchange for his life. And in exchange for his life, the Kaki gave the Spanish food and indefinite access of supplies. There was said to be a king beyond west and south, whose kingdom was at the head of the great river. But the Spanish took these rumors with no gravity. Instead, they focused on quenching their hunger. For three days, the Spanish rested and took all the food there was to be had, which were piles of bean plants and large oblong calabasas of fruited squash that the Spanish fondly enjoyed. The army rested in the village for three more days. They were tired and restless souls. Soto knew they needed a rest, but he did so not out of compassion. Rather, it was out of sheer strategic purpose, because he knew there would be a time in the future where they would have no rest at all. Rangel, Alvas, and the other secretaries retrieved letters and offered them to Soto. But each and every letter Soto received, he sent to a flame. On the second day, Soto sent out scout parties to explore the territories. One went north, and the other went east. And on the third day, he ordered another scouting party to head west. When the rest ended, the march continued, and the land of Cusa continued as well. Throughout the month of July, the Spanish marched. They marched through endless pines, hills, and rocks and the familiar trance returned. And again, the course of action spiraled back into rhythm. The army pillaged small villages, but they would come up with less and less. And again, Soto caught each cake of each village, chained their hands, and either killed them on the spot or leveraged them for very little. Then the army came across a set of Blue Ridge Mountains and as Moscoso rode up to the head of the line, he found Soto and saluted. Where to now, Don Hernando? To the mountain? No. We follow west. West is the river. Minutes later, Ortiz arrived. Yes, Juan, said Soto. I have new information from the chief we met today. What does he say, Ortiz? He says there is a river south of here, and that many other rivers merge, just like the shaman said. And two days later, they reached it. They stood at its base. The river was wide and long, and it churned from north to south. Then Soto held a sword to the chief's throat. He says there's another river. He says he'll show us. But for Hector, the days in Cusa felt worse. Many times he remained alone in thought. His thoughts drifted, and the more he resisted, the more they took over. He felt a pain, a pain that would never go away. He slept in the light rain and felt the drops of water brush off his skin. 
He thought about his home in Spain and his mother. He thought about all the debt he accrued to get him where he was now. He thought of how desolate and succumbed he was by fear. And he thought about the day he landed in La Florida and what a rich man he thought he would be. In the darkness, he tried to pray. He prayed for the soul of his father to guide him. When he awoke, he came near a spotted land of tall grass. He saw Vicente a minute later, and he looked long and hard at his face. Vicente, his old friend, sometimes his only friend. He hadn't changed at all. The next day, Hector passed a new stretch of land of slopes and swamps. He passed many wigwams, and all of it reminded him of Napetuka. Then he saw the rest of his men. Some were comrades, some were not. All had their stories. Later, he saw the slaves and the lines of chained servants 200 feet long. Though he was ordered by Balthasar not to look at the slaves straight in the eye, Hector could not help but to do so. And the more he did, the more pain it brought to him. At night, Hector and Vicente shared their meal by a low dying fire. Vicente looked on to the stars. He counted them off and muttered out the numbers. We've come too far, Hector. But Hector lay silent. What are you thinking about, Hector? I'm trying not to. I knew we had to go further. It makes too much sense. We have to follow the rivers. Every time anyone found gold, they followed a river. Cortez, Pizarro, now Soto. This land is much richer, though. It's probably beyond their mountains. Probably just beyond. He waited for Hector's response. Hector said nothing. Instead, he watched the slaves huddled together amongst the fire. What are you looking at, Hector? The slaves. They look like they're dead. Yes, they're slaves. No, they're not. They're more. Vicente turned, then spat. They're slaves, Hector. You give them too much thought. You shouldn't worry about worthless things, Hector. Nothing more was said. In the morning, Hector corralled about 50 slaves and brought them forward through a stretch of thick, hard mud. The harder the soldiers whipped them, the harder they sang. A shriek pierced the air. Then a voice cried. All knew that cry, and all knew it was an ambush. The Spanish looked to the trees. The ambush came from the opposite direction. The natives ambushed from the Spanish oblique side. They moved in cuts and slants. The warriors jumped out of the forest and threw a bevy of spears. They clashed and slashed the Spanish over and over. And soon the slaves broke out and ran for freedom. Hector stood still as he watched each slave disappear out into the distance. He tried not to show it, but the more he saw, the more Hector's face filled with admiration. He was overcome by their defiance and their will to endure. But his admiration was not shared. Hector's fellow men chased after the slaves, caught them, and brutally stabbed each one. And again, blood fell down like rain. One soldier continued to lash and lash an already gored slave. Hector shouted at him to stop. The soldier stopped and turned. It was Vicente. And again, Hector paused and witnessed the pure evil his friend had succumbed to. He stared and studied the righteous rage of wrath and scorn on Vicente's face. And the longer he stared, the worse Hector felt. Vicente ignored and kept slashing his sword. And all Hector could do was watch.
A half hour later, Soto commanded to make an example of the slaves. The soldiers gathered five slaves and wrapped them along tall planks. From there, they lit torches and burned the slaves from underneath. One of the slaves was a young girl, not even ten years old, and Hector watched on as she screamed. He wanted to save her. He wanted nothing more in his life to do so. But he couldn't. When it was over, the remaining slaves were slashed with whips and driven off into chains. And Hector walked alone and cried. But the voices shouted in echoes, and Hector heard every one. They came upon a deep and wide river. The priest bellowed dirges, and their echoes rang off from the banks of the river to the sands. And the Indians slung single file and slumped forward in their chains. The following hour, Soto divided his units into smaller platoons. Half went north. The other half went west through the mainland. In the mainland, the men hacked at the tall grass and walked about the banks. Later, the men split into teams of two and searched for any indication of gold. A storm seemed to brood right above them. The sky turned gray and looked as if it were on fire. And below, the sound of the Spaniard's boots slamming the surface matched its chord and harmonized with the thunder. Their faces still appeared desperate and distraught. Their eyes and mouths were open with frenzy. Their backs were beaten, and the heavy rain kept pouring. Through the mud, Vicente and Hector forged side by side as they slid back and forth from across the sloping plains of pines and rocks. They moved in the dark with their arms stretched, reaching for something they could not see. When they had enough, they rested underneath a tree. The rain trailed off for half an hour, and Vicente watched the river, while Hector fell asleep. The river slushed and rolled. Then a voice broke out. It was Balthazar. You too. What did you find? Nothing. Nothing? Not a thing, sir. Stop staring, Balthazar said. He pointed west. Go there. Find something and report back by nightfall. So they did. The heat returned upon the low country. Vicente led. Hector wearily followed. After an hour, Hector clutched his stomach. He ached and moaned. Then he knelt to the ground and vomited out his nose. But Vicente kept going. He took out his crossbow and pointed up to the trees. He studied the wind for several minutes. Then he fired a single shot. Lees fell, but did not make a sound. Up ahead, a large hawk swirled above his head, and in great hesitation, Vicente aimed his crossbow. But by then, the hawk disappeared. The rain returned, and Vicente went back to find Hector. But as he did so, he discovered a path an eighth of a mile from where he stood. Vicente walked the path between the patches of bramble and went on for another half mile. His eyes widened and gleamed. It seemed familiar, perhaps from a dream, and he moved with excited haste as if he had been struck by a lightning bolt. He set a marker of ragged cloth underneath a stone. Then he returned to Hector shortly after and spotted him sitting on a stump with his armor covered in vomit and blood. I found it! I found it, Hector! I found a path! It's not far! Come on! Let's go! Don't die on me now, man! But Hector laid to his side and closed his eyes. And Vicente wasted no time. He retraced his steps and returned to the marker. The path led down to a small basin. 
Then he found another. He saw the heart of the Blackwoods and many fallen trees. From his spot, he heard the river surge. Then Vicente heard another voice. He looked behind and found Hector hobbling through the bramble. Vicente smiled. Hector did not. They went out a mile, then another. The rain returned. It came in harder and pelted against their armor. The wind shifted and ripped at their faces, but they pressed on. They yelled out, trying to find the other men in the platoon, but their cries went unheard. Again, the two marched on, and again, Vicente led the way. They came upon a pile of carved-out wooden planks and broken bits of fishing nets. But then, the path had stopped completely. The trail ended. All that was left was the mound and the river. The rain held off. Up ahead, they saw dense boulders. Below, they saw a deep gorge. It had gotten dark. And in an hour, the stars emerged from the tips of the oaks. Now what? said Hector. I don't know, said Vicente. We'll have to wait till morning. So they did. They rested and slept in the rain. Hector awoke many times by mosquitoes that swam into his ear. But Vicente kept wide awake. And as the night passed, they whispered to each other in painful, incoherent mumbles. As soon as we see the sun, we'll return to camp, said Hector. No, said Vicente. We follow the path till we find another. We were told to find something, and damn it, we will. We can't return with empty hands, Hector. Not again. We come so far. So far. This is not life. Of course it is, Hector. There has to be more. Of course there's more. No. You don't know what I mean, Vicente. More. Yes, more. No. No what? There's more to life. It's not this. What more? What more could there possibly be, Hector? In the morning we'll be kings. What are you talking about? I'm just... Don Hernando. You are my savior. Don Hernando, I plead to you. I've wasted too much. All I have, it's nothing. Tremendous treasure. Unbelievable treasure. It's nothing. From God himself. It's nothing. We've solved our maze. We've reached the river's end. Hector, it's over. Can't you see the light? The stars shone. The words died. And the morning came. But as the clouds took over again, the sun disappeared. Hector turned many times. None of it made any sense. We're lost, Vicente. Admit it. We're not lost, Hector. Have faith. But the truth begged to differ. They walked another mile. Vicente pulled 20 paces in front of Hector. They came across a brook and walked for another two miles. And with great joy, Vicente screamed. He pointed and cried. Then Hector came to his side. And there, they saw the giant fork in the river that the shaman had foretold. And both stood amazed.
There it is. There it goddamn is, said Vicente. You doubting son of a bitch. We should tell the others, said Hector. No, said Vicente. We have to see where it leads first. Not a word was uttered. There were only stares and the surge of the tide. And Vicente continued to smile. Take your pick, Hector. It's now or never, man. God be with you. The two looked at each other, then trudged on their own way. Vicente went south, and Hector went west. Hours passed. Vicente followed his path, but he did not find what he was looking for. Instead, he found more of the same. He found more marsh, more willow trees, and more mosquitoes that swirled in multitudes of swarms. And the further he went, the angrier he became. He prayed aloud, and sweat poured out from his face. He began to swear, then he shouted in rage. He thrust his sword and slashed all that was before him. When he grew tired, he rested in the shade, and he sweated until the sweat cooled. And for a straight hour, he lay on his side and shook his head. But for Hector, he took his time. He followed the river down twists and bends. His eyes glazed in the trance, and throughout his walk, he felt the grief and sorrow in all things. He heard the voices of his dreams and the voices of all the pain he and his people had caused. He reached out and tried to pray. But then, a curious thing happened. The voices changed. There were voices of children. And suddenly, the pain was gone. He walked a mile. Then another. He rested and took off his armor. He took off his shoulder blades, breastplates, and leg greaves. Then finally, he took off his helmet. Lastly, he dropped his sword. And on that heavy pile of steel, Hector stared at the rust and holes and stains of blood. And in silence, he prayed until he cried. But then, the silence broke. Another voice came in sweet and clear, and Hector stumbled and staggered towards it. But at the moment he saw it, he stopped, and he saw it clear and whole. It was not gold. It was far greater. It was what he was looking for his whole life. She smiled. She said not a word. She only showed him her heart and held his hand, and they disappeared within the light. But Facente did not find what Hector had. He found no gold, nor silver, nor jewels, nor any glory of God in the highest. Instead, he remained alone in his misery. He marched up and down the banks of the river, and for two more hours, he slashed away at the grass and screamed. Then Vicente returned back to the fork of the river and went west. The day ended. He reached the banks and found a middle passage through tall oaks. Then he screamed again. Hector! Hector, where are you, man? And in the pouring rain, Vicente heard a sharp pinging sound. Then he saw the pile of armor. He went over towards it and found Hector's sword, breastplate, and his arms and leg greaves. And Vicente shouted and cried, Hector! Hector! But still, no reply. And all went back to silence. And when he could no longer stand it, Vicente took Hector's sword and helmet and raced back to camp. As they waited, Soto stayed with Ortiz. In two days, 
they came upon another old man whom the natives said was a shaman. Ortiz confirmed it, and indeed, it was the same shaman they met before Cusa. They listened to his story, and Soto watched his men return from the river with empty hands. The old man babbled. He spoke of the prophecy and many other things, and he groaned and shut his eyes. What is he saying, Ortiz? He speaks of a kingdom. Go on. The old man spoke again. A rustle of wind swept across the land. How close is this kingdom? asked Soto. Ortiz asked, and the man responded. He says it's closer than you think. More men came back from the river. More men sighed. Anasco's men rode off with horses, while Balthazar's men rode off with the mules. And Soto watched them all. What of this king? He must have a name, no? said Soto. Tuscaloosa, said Ortiz. They call him the great Tuscaloosa. What does he look like? They say he's very tall, like a tree. That he's stronger than a buffalo. That he eats his enemies when he kills them and drinks their blood. With that, Soto said no more. Vicente returned to the camp an hour later. He lay his head on a stump and slept. No one asked about Hector. No one cared. The rumors of Tuscaloosa were much greater than the loss of one man's friend. And like any rumor, it filled the air and festered into every Spaniard's mind. One more kingdom. One more. And as the dawn broke to the next day, the maddening gaze of Soto returned to his countenance, and it stayed throughout the day and for the rest of time. He shared the stare with all of his men, the maddening stare of the conquistadors. Then he gathered his entire army and said all but two words, and his army nodded and set forth. We march. And off they marched, off yonder, to the land of Tuscaloosa, off the river south. Chapter 6 As they overlooked the hill, Tuscaloosa, the last and great king of Mabilia, rose at sunrise and stood in its haze. And as he finished his final prayer, he rolled his feet in the wet grass and stared. He carried a baby ox on his broad and bulging shoulders, then laid the ox upon a stone and sacrificed it. He watched the hawk swirl above his head and descend on the carcass of an antelope, and he watched them chew, squawk, and feast. More hawks flooded the sky, and the sight made him smile. He took out a spear and dug it deep into the hard sand and stones, and as the wind turned, he felt the blood rush to his face. Tuscaloosa's son watched him from afar and disappeared beyond the hill. Then the great Tuscaloosa strode through his land and watched the tens of thousands of his people gather and pray to the sun. He joined his warriors soon after and shared a meal with them. They gorged and swallowed long slabs of ox, and Tuscaloosa greeted each warrior with a smack on the shoulder and an affirmative nod. When he finished his meal, Tuscaloosa climbed back up the hill and looked down at his kingdom. An hour passed, but he remained alone. At dusk, 
his son approached him. They walked down and reached the river. They stood ankle deep beside the water, and from there, they prayed. His son sighed. Tuscaloosa tilted his head. Father. Yes. I had a horrible dream. So did I, said Tuscaloosa. He smiled. His son did not. His son asked his questions, and Tuscaloosa answered. Did you see the skies? I did. Were they red? They were red like blood. Did you see the river? Yes, I saw the river. Did you see the bird? I did. Did it die? Yes, it dropped from the sky. Shouldn't we prepare, Father? Prepare? Yes. No, we need not prepare. We will welcome it, whatever it is, whatever it may be. We'll let it come to us. There's no need to prepare. A week passed in Tuscaloosa land. It rained three times, and the whole of Mobilia was covered in mud as the late sweltering summer approached. Strange servants emerged from the woods and approached Tuscaloosa. A crowd had formed, and excitement and confusion soon followed. Hours later came the ruler, and as the lady of Cufita Chete made her way to Tuscaloosa, she looked very sad and tired. She bowed to Tuscaloosa and spoke. Her servant stood and relayed her words. Tuscaloosa immediately noted the lady's beauty as he fell deep into her eyes. Her face was beautiful, but bruised. Her body was slender and tight, but the most distinctive feature was her eyes. They held a strong and prominent fear. I've come to warn you, great Tuscaloosa. I've come to warn you and your people, said the lady. These spirits are coming. Tuscaloosa's eyes fluttered. He yawned and lost focus. The lady yelled and pointed. These are evil, evil souls, she said. They will kill you all. I know these things, dear lady. I sense them. You needn't warn me. The lady's face turned to shock. She pleaded at Tuscaloosa with her hands raised high. If you wish to survive, you must leave. They are within days of you. They are more powerful than you can imagine, O king. There will be a terrible war, and you will lose it. They've destroyed my kingdom. They'll destroy yours just the same. Tuscaloosa remained silent. His face remained calm. The lady continued. They have no mercy. They'll burn you all. Leave. Please leave. It's the only way. Then Tuscaloosa approached the lady. He turned to his people. Leave? Our people do not leave. We fight. We die. We do not leave. The lady sobbed and fell to her knees. Tuscaloosa looked down at her, and the lady pleaded all she could. Her face was red and filled with tears. The river will run red with the blood of all your people. Then let it run. Let the whole river run. Let it freeze in the winter. And let it thaw in the spring. Let the river run as it always has, red or not. Do what you do. I only come to warn you. 
and I thank you graciously, my lady. Then Tuscaloosa rose his hands in defiance. He shouted and turned to the crowd once more. And so it be, and here it is. Let them come to us. We've been waiting for this battle our whole lives. The crowd cheered, and Tuscaloosa rose his hand. The lady uttered her last words. She couldn't be heard, but she said them anyway. She stared at Tuscaloosa, bowed, and sighed. I'm sure you have, O oh king, but so have they. And as foretold, September had passed, and so did the kingdom of Cusa. And as October rolled in, the Spanish marched on. A strange and peaceful week had passed. Then another. But on a sweltering morning, they found the city and the great kingdom of Tuscaloosa. And on that sweltering morning, the Spanish found their new kingdom and its surrounding cities. They came across a rolling green hill and saw the fires of the village that seemed to go on for miles and miles. They spotted the palisades and the enormity of the land. They fixed their eyes on the gigantic fortress that set upon its center, and Soto examined the huge mounds, and the rolling green land reminded him so much of Peru and the lands of Machu Picchu so long ago. Moscoso. Yes, Don Hernando. Take Ortiz. Go down. Tell them I want to see their chief. Yes, sir. Tell them I am the child of the sun. They will know. They don't fear death. They can't anymore. Sir, these people, we will oppose our will. That is all you need to know. Soto mounted and followed the cavalry. His captains rode close behind him. The army divided into twenty platoons and approached a massive fortress. They stopped and planted small wooden crucifixes to the ground, and when they got close enough, they halted and stood in formation. On the other side of the hill, Tuscaloosa stood with his army of five hundred warriors in back of him. The rest of his army, the six thousand of his beloved comrades, remained in the nearby towns of Mobilia, some five miles south. And in the wind, they heard each other's echoes. But Tuscaloosa ignored these echoes and looked away. He bent over and sharpened his axe against a slab of stone. He gave a solemn glance to the river, and a small yellow bird landed in front of him. He breathed long and hard in the warm air, and he stared at the orange clouds above his head. Then his son came to his side, and Tuscaloosa smiled, watched the bird disappear, and handed his son his axe. They're within the river, cried his son. We stay, said Tuscaloosa. Why? You must learn, my son. Then Tuscaloosa stood up, walked forward, and his army followed. At midday, the armies met, and as a custom, the priests and the peacemakers made their way down first. They were soon accompanied by Moscoso and his team of five cavalrymen. Behind them, the whole of Soto's men marched a quarter of a mile in phalanx position and the Mobilio warriors watched them all. Immediately, the drums of the Tuscaloosa army blared, sounding louder and louder. And within minutes, the armies were within 200 yards of each other. The drums overtook the screams, and the leaders walked towards each other. And it was there the Spanish first caught glance of the great Tuscaloosa. 
They shook their heads in bewilderment, for he seemed to be the tallest Indian they had ever seen. Soto initiated his first peaceful gesture. He brought forth a coat made from freshly skinned deer, and the servants quickly brought it to Tuscaloosa. After the exchange, Tuscaloosa squinted and spat to the ground. Ortiz rushed in and replaced the priest. He read the decree, which Soto had rewritten. And in the slew of spoken words, Soto and Tuscaloosa glared. The translation continued. They stared deeper, and all the memories of Peru flooded once more through Soto's mind. Then Soto drew forward and whispered to himself, Just like Altawalpa. He turned to his subordinates and threatened them with his sword. Do not translate a single word. Soto faced Tuscaloosa, and with great delight, he said his words. He held the bloody spear and placed the tip firmly upon the ground. This is a land of bastards, and you must be its king. Hello, great king. It is our pleasure. We welcome you, O great king. You are a great chief, I hear. A king of kings. You'll never understand a word I say, so I will tell you everything. I am the devil. I am a liar. I am a child of the sun. Nothing was translated as Soto commanded. Tuscaloosa's glare turned into a slight smile, and Soto continued. You will welcome us like long-lost friends, and I know you will want us all dead by the morning. We want nothing but the same. So, dear king, whatever shall we do? Tuscaloosa snarled and closed his eyes. I admire your honesty, said Soto. Soto ended his speech and said not another word that day. Another offer was made. The Spanish brought trinkets from all the places they traveled, but Tuscaloosa refused each and every one. Then Tuscaloosa turned his back as if Soto and his army did not exist and his people followed him through the dark. Dusk settled. They shared no meals. They shared no offerings. Another night came to pass, and a great bonfire was made. Tuscaloosa and his army remained well within reach, and Soto's army made camp and remained baffled as the day they were born. In all waking hours, Soto did not sleep. He sat by a dying flame and heard the wails of the warriors from off yonder. Then in the morning, Soto stood up and stared directly at the interior walls of the palisades. With a small band of priests, translators, and horsemen, Soto drew forward. And just as he thought, Tuscaloosa was already waiting for him. Ortiz commanded the translators and commenced another trade. The meeting was long but peaceful, and it dragged on for an hour. Many times the translators had balked, but Ortiz commanded them to repeat the gestures of the previous day word for word, and all waited for Tuscaloosa's response. An initial trade commenced. It was of stones for bundles of straw. A trade of fresh fish and bottles of wine followed. Bands of food were brought to the Spanish, consisting mostly of fish, clams, and oysters. After the trade, Tuscaloosa spoke, and Ortiz relayed the words to Soto. He says we have been invited. He says he will be pleased to share his food with us, and that tonight we shall dine together. Soto smiled. Then he waved his hand. 
tell him that I greatly accept his offer. At dusk, a horn sounded. The whole of the town came and surrounded the Spanish and kept their distance. And soon, a thousand of Tuscaloosa's people emerged from the darkness. And as promised, the Spanish sat and ate their meals. The Mabila servants served their meals on giant fig leaves. The meals consisted of the fat of goats and rams, baked calabasas that were stuffed with corn and dried beans and long and sumptuous legs of venison that were seared and slathered in hot chilies. Though delicious, the Spanish ate their meals with heavy skepticism. Among the pits were many bones and skulls scowled about the fire. It was later said by the priests that these bones were of the tribe that the Mabilia destroyed two years before. Later, they were brought the soup that contained the marrow of both buffalo and the skulls that lay it upon the ground. A priest approached Soto and announced that he was summoned to sit next to Tuscaloosa. With Moscoso at his side, Soto sat adjacent to Tuscaloosa and marveled at his appetite. He watched Tuscaloosa swallow and gorge his meal like a rabid wolf. He watched Tuscaloosa breathe heavily through his nose, and he watched him eat spicy chilies, dozens at a time. And as he came to the fire, Soto watched Tuscaloosa urinate and spread his arms to the sky, shouting a prayer to his gods. After the meal, the women danced and gyrated to the rhythm of the drums. More chilies were served during the next course of rounds, and as the Spanish ate more and more, they screamed and hollered for water. And the Mobilia smirked and laughed. The first stars of the night emerged. Tuscaloosa gathered his translators. He spoke in a deep and powerful tone which matched the depth and the power of his giant athletic body. With grace, Tuscaloosa told his stories without pause, and the Spanish imagined the tale word for word. Tuscaloosa told the tale of the day his father died. He cried many times as he told his tale, and his eyes grew soft and dim. And Soto sat and listened. The fires of the night burned and died, and Soto slept in a small tent not far away from the houses. But he slept only at a sheer exhaustion. His mind still raced, and he thought about his next move and what pieces would fall. Morning arrived. But even before sunrise, Soto and Tuscaloosa were up, and they met each other on a soggy hill. They climbed for about a half an hour, and it began to rain. It rained in slants and gushes, but Tuscaloosa gave no hesitation, and he pressed on through the mud. When the rain ended, the sun returned, and as it did, Tuscaloosa stopped and prayed. The heat returned. The air grew dense, and each man sweated from head to toe. The translators paused to catch their breath, but Tuscaloosa kept at prayer. Soto studied Tuscaloosa's bulbous nose, his wide face, and his thick, dark lips. And when Tuscaloosa finished praying, Soto asked his questions. The translators responded. Tuscaloosa gave no answer. Then, Moscoso handed Soto a rapier, but Soto refused. Clear that away, he said. And as ordered, Moscoso placed the rapier back in his cloak. Some hours passed. The priest recited mass beside a set of willow trees, and a half a league beyond them, the Mobilio priest and priestesses danced a slow, drawn-out dance to welcome the midday sun. Each downbeat of the drums reverberated and found its way into Tuscaloosa's pulse, 
though he kept his hands quite still. A light appeared from the clouds, and Soto said his words. We were told of your riches, great king. We kindly asked to see them. But again, no answer was given. Tuscaloosa took Soto two miles north to the hot springs. Steaming hot water emerged from the ground, and Soto stood amazed. The deep, trenched water bubbled and seemed to boil. Above the stones, the water fell in long and pristine streams, and it hovered over in thick clouds of vapor. The two remained alone. They set their translators away, though they knew both their guards, servants, and warriors were watching their every move. Tuscaloosa undressed, and he waited for Soto to do the same. It took Soto quite a while. He undid his armor, cloak, and pants, and Tuscaloosa loudly mocked as Soto's pale, white, and sickly-looking flesh. Soto shivered, but after he entered into the warm water, he felt at ease. Tuscaloosa swam to the edge of the spring. He stood and rested, and Soto followed. An hour went by. They bathed and kept silent. Tuscaloosa nodded and drifted off into a deep sleep. But Soto remained aware and alert. His eyes turned red, and as Tuscaloosa snored, Soto spoke again. We've trekked your sacred mountains. We followed the great river, and it led us here. Here to your glorious kingdom. How far does your kingdom go, great Tuscaloosa? How dark will it be when we take it all? But Tuscaloosa's eyes remained shut. Again, Soto stared. And when he looked up to the sky, he smiled. Finally, the servants came forth and tended to Tuscaloosa. They did the same for Soto. They bowed and fanned leaves. And Tuscaloosa opened his eyes. And Soto nodded. An hour later, they dressed and left the springs. They came across a river, a mighty one, but it was not the largest. They watched the crest gleam, fold, and run against the mud. And for a single second, Soto looked and thought of how he got here. How much time had passed, how many rivers he had passed, and how far he still was. From the hill, he studied the whole of the Mabilia nation. He noted the twelve towers and the fortresses, and he thought of all the gold that was days from being had. Night came, and the festivities commenced. The Spanish drank and rested. The drums banged and boomed. The mobilia women danced and gyrated, naked in the dim moonlight. And the Spanish took the ones they most desired. During the midnight hours, Seto shared an entire bottle of wine with Tuscaloosa. They emptied it quickly each taken long and absurd swigs. And all throughout the night, Soto watched the sweat pour down Tuscaloosa's bulbous nose. To return the favor, Tuscaloosa took out his pipe and lit it afire. He smoked deep, hard drags and passed the pipe over to Soto. Then Tuscaloosa spoke. My son said he had seen you in a dream. The words drifted into space. Tuscaloosa then took Soto's hand and sniffed each finger. Then he took Soto's hand and held it near the flame. And as it burned, Soto did not flinch. He merely stared. Tuscaloosa released his hand 
and Soto responded with a smile. Then Soto held a chess piece and showed it to Tuscaloosa. He handed it to him, but Tuscaloosa simply tossed it up into the air. Then Tuscaloosa let go of his stare and departed. He joined his people and danced the rest of the night away. And Soto and the Spanish solemnly glared at him, like statues amidst the dark. This horrible game, it was still there. It simply would not end. I knew I was going to lose, but I didn't care a damn. But I knew it mattered to Soto. The whole world seemed to depend on it. Even in the flicker of the firelight, I saw the blood on his battered hands. And Soto once again strangled the board with his eyes and waited for me to blink. Nothing made sense. I saw no openings. I saw no seeable way. His army, his control, and his fear were all present in those tiny pieces. Indeed, this was his game. And indeed, Soto had probably invented this game. He invented it before time and before God. And the times in between the moves, I thought about it all. Throughout all the battles and all the blood, Soto remained alive. If I would have killed them then and there and put him out of his misery, perhaps I could have saved more lives. But I was afraid. Definitely afraid. Like I always was. For the fear pervaded and controlled me, just like it always did. And Soto knew it all too well. There was no joy in Soto's face, no solace or comfort. He looked numbed and damned and dead all over. We paused for the longest time. I faded in and out of sleep. And neither of us made a move in all that time. He had lost his mind. That was the only thing I knew for sure. I knew it because I had once lost mine. But I knew Soto went further. God could no longer help him. For, in his mind, he had become his own God. Self-sufficient and not of this earth. He abandoned all. And I saw it in his eyes. The ceaseless evil. He was dead inside and I could no longer feel pity for him. Then Soto made his move. His back bishop took my pawn. The center was gone, and he had gained complete control of the board. For three more days, the Spanish stayed in Mobilia. But as the days unfolded, there were no more celebrations, or dances, or prayers. There were only demands and denials. On the first day, Soto stalked Tuscaloosa and repeatedly asked for gold. And Tuscaloosa, as expected, did not utter a word. On the second day, more and more native guards separated Tuscaloosa from Soto. They pointed sharp sticks and arrows at Soto when he had gotten too close to Tuscaloosa. And Soto threatened to unleash unbridled holy hell to all the lands if this behavior did not cease. But his threat went unheard. Soto paced up and down Mobilia, desperately wanting to reach an agreement with the king. But Tuscaloosa refused to hear a single word. And on the third day, the 18th of October, 
Tuscaloosa retreated into one of the houses and never returned. In the morning, Soto gathered his men and approached the tent. He took Ortiz, a dozen archers, three horsemen, and one heavy cannon. Then Soto gave his captains each their orders, and their men went on and stood in formation. And for an entire hour, Soto shouted out his final demands. The decrees were read by the priests, and the Spanish proceeded with their tired formalities. They whispered and wondered and waited for a signal. But Tuscaloosa remained in his tent and refused to speak. Soto, though, remained obstinate. He said his words, his last warnings, and his demands. And he spoke with all conviction, weighing his words carefully, as if Pilot on the throne. It's quite a strange thing, O king, is it not? Your kingdom is quite large and very beautiful. I shall hate to see it all burn. You are an intelligent savage. No doubt. I will not deny that. More and more warriors emerged from the houses as it reached noon. Soon, thousands of warriors shouted in all directions, rattled their drums, cried to their war gods, and encroached forward. But Soto went on. But you know what we want. We've told you many times. We've come all this way. We cannot breathe without it. Just give it to us. I'm offering you a chance. One final chance. You know what we want. We know what you're hiding. Just give it to us. And all of this will be avoided. Then Soto called out Danasco. Take a slave. Cut his throat. Save the head. Then send it to Tuscaloosa. Why the head? said Anasco. Tradition, said Soto. Tuscaloosa received the slave's decapitated head about a half hour later. He laughed heartedly and tossed the head to the ground. In the rain, Tuscaloosa simply smiled and embraced the sky with open hands. Then Soto climbed up on his horse. He stared back towards the houses and said these words. They say beyond the river is the city of gold. And in that city, we shall see God himself. Just beyond. They say you too are a child of the sun. They say a lot about you, O oh great Tuscaloosa. They say the same of me. We must be brothers then. I accept that. Pleased to meet you. Hold on to your beliefs, great king. But you must understand, brother. We come in peace. But we will not hasten to kill you. All of you. If you do not comply. I know you're about to ambush us at any minute. It's the stock and trade of you savages. It's the only thing you know. We've asked you kindly. We've warned you. You think we're not gods? Good. More and more immobilia warriors gathered from either side of the hill. Soto ordered the heavy artillery to move towards the end of the tree line. Then the cavalry maneuvered ahead of them. The archers stood along the wooden palisades. The captains commanded their orders and the main infantry divided into pairs and sprinted down the hill and towards the gate. Then Soto raised his sword and drew it back into his cloak, and the men halted. 
On the other side of the hill, Tuscaloosa shouted. His booming voice still echoed in shouts and shrieks. The warriors jeered and cursed. Finally, Ortiz approached Soto. He says we will not dine with him tonight. He says all of our men are to clear out of this land this instance. We are to... But Soto interrupted. Tell him we shall do no such thing. Then Tuscaloosa spoke no more. The Mobilia drums took over and sounded across the entire land. Cracks and booms and hisses and thuds. And in the chaos, Tuscaloosa bent over and picked up a spear. He ran and threw it and screamed with all his might. And Soto, watching him, just smiled, just as he did at Katimaka. Soto returned the gesture and signaled for a cannon strike. The explosion burst and shook the earth. And the battle for Mobilia began. The warriors sprinted out. They surrounded the Spanish and killed as many as they could. The Spanish found themselves trapped inside the fortress. And through the smoke, the warriors rushed and speared and tore away. Another cannon exploded. But by then, the warriors had already seized the center and ripped apart Soto's formation. Soto turned from side to side, realizing just how outnumbered his army was. He quickly sounded a retreat, and the Spanish headed away from the town in full panic, and the warriors went right after them. In the first hour, twenty Spanish soldiers lay dead on the ground. They had been speared, scalped, and set on fire. Hands and feet tossed into the air, and blood stained every blade of grass. Along with the men, the Mobilia women took arms and catapulted themselves to battle. The Spanish archers rallied, set, and fired. But the Mobilia warriors continued to strike deep and hard. They sprinted downhill with spears in their hands, and they launched and jousted and toppled the Spanish. Bright bulging fires let the ground asunder, but as the cannons kept firing, the hull of Mobilia soon turned into a fog of boiling ash, soot, and smoke, and the Spanish cavalry reacted with utter confusion. The Mobilia warriors continued to sweep along, outnumbering the Spanish. Endless surges pierced through Spanish formations, and Tuscaloosa himself ran into battle with a spear in one hand and a Spanish sword in the other. The Spanish gradually retaliated and gained ground. What followed in the next hours was an endless stream of madness and sheer cacophony. Blaring trumpets, booming drums, spears and clubs, swords and pikes, streams of slicing arrows, blazing musket fire, screams, shrieks, and blood all over. At the midpoint, the ground was littered with bodies and dead horses. Limbs, whole torsos, intestines, and organs scattered all about. Already a thousand mobilia corpses lay dead, and the remaining four thousand continued to fight with everything they had. But what finally swayed the momentum was the constant barrage of cannon fire. The blast wore down the mobilians, and the Spanish kept firing. Shell after shell pounded the earth, and the huts and temples and stables and granaries were all lit asunder and incinerated. Another hour passed. Two thousand more warriors lay dead on the ground. It was then that the infantry finally gained control. They spun and sliced away and Soto relished it all as he watched the spears fall down from the sky. He directed the cavalry to catch the Mobilias off their rear flank. 
the cavalry dug deep into the advancing party, and they slashed and trampled and lanced. The battle was over, and the slaughter began. And the story remained the same, much like all the battles Soto had ever fought. And through the fires, the Spanish cut and slashed away. The army reached the corner of the gates, took rusted whips and mail, and pummeled the mobile archers one by one. Their faces were mauled into bloody pulps and were later decapitated. And in the spews of blood, Soto watched his men. He saw Vicente seethe with demonic rage, and he watched him and many other Spaniards stab and stab every warrior they came across. Since there were no more shells to fire or any shrapnel of any sort, the Spanish artillery ceased the fire. And the rest, the thousands upon thousands of others, cleared away from Abilia. But those who stayed made sure they died valiant deaths, including the great Tuscaloosa himself. The Spanish burned what was left of Mobilia. They threw torches to each and every longhouse, and the thousand remaining natives screamed, ran, and fled the city. Throughout the nights and days after Mobilia, Soto staggered on alone for hours at a time. His armor was stained in blood and filled with arrows. Below, he walked upon the corpses of warriors, women, children, and horses. They were all dead and forgotten. His eyes fluttered in the fallen ash. His nose inhaled the swirling smoke, and his face seemed to gleam besides all the embers of the blood stank land. In the twilight, the men found Tuscaloosa's corpse beneath a pile of splinters. When Soto approached, he nodded and studied it closely. All that was left was the torso and the head. His legs had been chopped off. His face had been scorched and burnt. And his skin turned purple. Soto paused, then requested to be alone. And throughout the starless night, Soto remained with Tuscaloosa's corpse and dined with a bottle of bitter wine as his men watched on from afar. Long live the king, said Soto. Hours passed. Soto laughed. He dipped his finger in the bottle, approached the corpse, and pressed the wine along Tuscaloosa's dead lips. And as the wine splattered and dripped, Soto howled again and shivered. The night's getting very cold, O oh king. He stabbed the corpse one last time, and Soto fell to his side and slept. The morning after, Soto returned to his men. The trance continued. Rankel first approached him. They discussed the casualties. Did you get a number? Uh, yes, Don Hernando. How many? Ours or theirs? Ours. Fifty. Don't lie to me. Is it fifty or is it eighty? It's eighty, sir. How many wounded? I don't know, sir. I, I pray not to guess. Soto watched his men as they made it through the smoke. They choked and slogged. There were no cries of joy. There was no celebration. There was just silence. It was a victory, only on the ground, but not in the mind. They winced and hobbled and tended their gaping wounds, and the monks gathered around the Spaniards and blessed every corpse. The captains found each other late that afternoon, but they said not a word, 
Instead, they stared at Soto and his dead giant eyes. And once more, Soto sat by Tuscaloosa's corpse and said what was on his mind. Oh, great king, you're the only one who seems to understand what sweet power we once had. Well, the tide has turned. One can only hope to die quick. Every man needs his leverage, but not all men understand. Nothing more than years. Nothing more than pieces on a board to capture, to capture. But I cannot have my lady, nor can you. Such are our fates. You and I, ha, we continue to worship our cruel gods. But we never ask why. Then Soto severed the corpse's ear. He watched the blood pour onto the grass, and he placed his hands along the stream, but the blood remained. Soto placed his hands in the water again. The blood still remained. A whole painful minute passed. And the longer Soto stared at Tuscaloosa's head, the longer the head stared right back. And after a minute, Soto screeched and hollered. Then he grabbed the head by its mangled hair, and he cried with every ounce of rage he had. Go ahead! Scowl at me! Scowl at me and weep! You're dead! You son of a bitch, you're dead! Scowl! Cry! Worship me! Worship me! Chapter 7 The game was over. There were three moves. He would win again. Soto knew it all too well. Pawn takes bishop, knight takes pawn, bishop mates king. I saw no other way. And he waited, waited for me to make my move. But I made him wait longer. I did so because of all the pain he had caused the world. There wasn't an ounce of sympathy I had left for him. He remained a ghost. His spirit died a long time ago, and it was replaced by the spirit of the damned. Nothing could be resolved or forgiven, though what made it worse was knowing I was guilty of the pain too. I was involved. I took part of the madness, and I caused much pain to all these people of this great mysterious land. I took part in the madness and the evil, though I had not known it at the time, because I too was lost in that dream. And I was convinced that it meant everything in the world. But Soto was still lost. He was lost in the dream. The dream that died so long ago. His focus was not on the present. It was of the future what he was about to conquer, what he was about to hold. He made his deal with the devil, just like Pizarro, just like Coronado. He said his words, but I hardly listened. They say it's near the river Sardina, towards the river's end. They say we'll find it. That's why Coronado failed. He didn't go deep enough, but we will. Mark my words, we will. He went on. 
Join us, Sardina. We need you. We've come just in time. Redemption. <laughs> Redemption. There'll be no other games to win, Sardina. He went on. I could no longer look him in the eye. I couldn't believe it either, Sardina. I still can't in some regard. But we're close. We're very close. You came just in time. Just like in Peru. I know. I know it only seems. But you remember Peru, don't you? You remember the gold? How it made us kings? How could you forget? You must join us. But in that instant, it came to me. Three moves would beat him. The moves were strung together by some miracle, but they were there all along. They came to me full and whole and clear. And I found a way. I made the first move, knight to his empty queen. Soto smiled, and he shook his head. Strange move, but I've seen stranger. You're a good man, but this is not your game, Sardina. It never was. You shouldn't feel ashamed. He countered quickly. I did as well. Bishop to king. And he took my queen with no hesitation. Then he unfolded his hands, tilted his head, and looked me straight in the face. And in a deep and mangled voice, he repeated his plea of madness. I'm going to ask you one more time, Sardina. Will you join me or not? I shook my head and returned to stare. And as I did, I made my final move and I removed my hand. No, I said. And the game was over. Soto moved his king in all the possible moves one could make, but none of it made any difference. He had lost. I had no feeling, nor did Soto. He took his king and laid it to his side. He stared at me, deeper and deeper, and he tried to take my soul. Then Soto cleared the board with one smack, and the pieces flew into the air. He drew the board to the flame, and he yelled into oblivion. He screamed long and hard, and he cried like a child. He was only a man. He panted and exhaled, and again the silence returned. Then I stood up and said what I wanted to say for all that time. No, Soto, I will not join you. It's over. Then I turned my back, headed for the darkness, and walked away. But Soto persisted. He chased me through the woods. He was probably only a hundred yards away, but I kept moving. Sardina! I heard his steel rust as he slashed his sword to and fro. His hollers and shouts pierced like cannon fire. It is not over! This is why you are poor! Come back, Sardina! Play me again! I'll beat you! I'll beat you with four pieces! I saw him stagger and heard him race through the dark. But I kept on moving. Sardina! I turned and looked at his face for the final time. And that was the last I saw of him. And throughout the night, I moved and followed the moonlight. I heard the men's voices. 
I heard their screams and their grunts, but I was beyond them. I had passed the fear. It took me my entire life, but I felt it in every way. I was buried underneath that fear for the longest time, but I knew I had passed it. I could not bear to live that life again. It wasn't real. Being a part of that world, being a conquistador, meant destroying the land you walked upon, owning it, and denying all the rest. It meant living totally within the mind. And I knew I could not live that life anymore. In the morning, I thought of many things. I took off my armor, but I kept my sword. I searched for the river with the remaining hours of sunlight. But the further I went, the more strange the land had become. Many times, I found hollowed-out gray trees filled with chunks of ice and mountain snow. I trekked beyond a green hill of jagged, dense rocks. But the further I went, the more my mind crawled back. I fell into a walking dream and imagined Soto speaking to his men before their last crusade. Those bastards those soulless souls. I knew them because I was one of them, and I felt the utmost pity. And in my mind, I heard Soto's preposterous speech, and I could see the sweat and blood of every man who heard his evil, empty words. He would march them to their deaths. And the next morning, Seto's men gathered. All two hundred of them stood and listened. The survivors, the tired, the mad, the battered, and the wounded. They all stood for one reason. It was a horrible and obligatory one. They wanted to hear their leader for what many hoped was for the final time. And Soto spoke once again. Abandon what you think. We will see to the river's end. All that is our kingdom. Our kingdom. No one else's. Remember why we came. Remember the days in the fields. We did not come here to suffer gladly. We came to conquer. And conquer we shall. In Peru we've conquered because the Incas bled. So it will be the same. They will all bleed. He slid his finger and watched the blood drip down to the ground. Then he shouted and waved the finger so every man could see. You see this blood? The blood of the everlasting covenant? It is our blood in our land. These savages think it's theirs. It is not. It will never be. This river is stained with blood. We will follow this river down. This entrada will go on until we find our kingdom. We will march. We will march! And so they did. Soto steadily rides on with Ortiz. Moscoso rides not far behind. Vicente, some three miles west with his unit, carries through. He looks to the sky and dares it to rain. The army marches on. They know little about their direction. They know less of what is ahead. Autumn days pass. The men grow wary. The march goes on. Days grow shorter. 
winter arrives. The cold settles with raw winds. The march goes on. Frank House studies what he has written with his shivering hands. The paper reads, December 1st, day 542. Clumps of snow smear the page. Frankel's eyes do not waver. Elvas writes as well, but not as much. He watches rain turn back to snow. Soto rides on. Moscoso again rides close behind. Balthasar and the others remain furlongs away. The next day comes. The march goes on. It might be Christmas, it might not. Only the priests seem to know for sure. But they were clearly as doubtful as anyone else. All I remembered about that day was the Mass was held and that our prayers were never answered. We reached another river and the ice had formed and covered the land. We searched for the remaining three days and all that time we came across no village. We came upon another river the natives called the Mississippi and we pressed on. It was a bitterly cold day, and it snowed for much of it, and the mud-soaked land turned white for miles. The rain, the heat, the cold, the constant marching. How long can one endure? No one wants to say it, but all see it. All see it every day. Don Hernando has lost his mind. I simply cannot write anymore. And at this point, I, nor anybody, knows what to do. All I wanted to see was the river. All I wanted to do was see its end. I walked for many days, alone and burdened. South was my only direction. It got colder. The land did not change. The rocks seemed the same. The sand seemed heavier. The sun, although bright, faded slow and cruel. And for a long, hard and horrible day, I thought I had returned to the desert. But in reality, it was about to snow. I rested by a set of shrubs and watched the sky grow purple and black. The night came. I found it impossible to sleep. I smelled the smoke. Soto and his men were only miles away. Probably only five. In the silence, my thoughts emerged. The thoughts of my horrible past and each memory and thought struck my head like pings of pelting rain. In my sack, I emptied all that I had carried. I held a chess piece, a white knight, and I stared at it for hours. And when I saw Soto's face reflected in the cracks, I held the piece to the flame and watched it burn. The next day I pressed on, one step forward, then another, one step at a time. Then I saw it. It was the largest river I had ever seen. It was deep and wide, and it looked just like it did in my dreams. I went in and soaked my entire body. And for that brief moment, I cried and felt the touch of God. And I knew it was right. I knew it was pure. It was true and beautiful. And in that river, everything made sense again. I saw many things, not just memories, 
but real things. I saw Manco and the Turk. I saw the spirits of the Corazons, the people of Tiji, and all the rest. All those who tried to make me see, they were all there for me. All had gathered, and they all confirmed. But then I saw her, the woman, the native woman I saw before I reached Soto. It seemed like years ago. I found her by the brook. She sobbed and stared into space. She was all alone. Dirt covered her face, but her eyes were deep and soft. Her skin was brown and her hair was black and curled and it danced in the wind. She covered her arms and shivered. I heard her cry and whimper and tremble, and I could see all her pain. We stared at each other again, and in that second, it was just as the first time I had seen her. And I realized she, like the river, was the most beautiful thing I have ever seen in my life. But when I tried to smile, it was not returned. She turned back and ran, and I watched her disappear into the woods. And for the rest of the day, she was all that I thought about. The next day, I let the river guide me. My heart was filled, but it still ached. And for the next hundred days, I followed that river, and I vowed not to stop until I reached its end. Whatever I was searching for, whatever I had forgotten, I knew I would find it there. Then I thought of Soto and his men. It was impossible to stop them. I could only warn the Indians of their arrival. I knew these people would fight with all they had to protect their lands. I knew they would do whatever it took. And I knew they would do so with utmost bravery. And I took it as my mission to warn them of Soto any chance I could. But that too was an arduous task. I had no translators. And each time I tried, I knew they did not understand me. Each tribe I spoke to, I felt very much like the Turk. A strange man with a strange tale who was only warning the inevitable. And on those nights, I felt cold and damp, and I stared up at the moon. I thought about all the blood, all the pain, all which would be forgotten. And each night, I awoke in the darkness and screamed. Then I washed my face in the river and smelled the blood that was forever stained on my hands. And I knew Soto wasn't far. And Sardino was right. The Entrada was a mere ten miles from where he stood. Soto's army reached the very same river, the Mississippi. And throughout the cold and damp January, his men marched. West and south of the river, the Spanish found the various kingdoms of Cochoya and Cuicdolautum. They found another set of villages of the Pacha and Aquacho tribe that were large and dense in population. All of these kingdoms were warned beforehand of Soto's arrival, but none took any heed to these warnings. And each time, Soto repeated his madness. He held his bloody sword and asked for the chiefs of the land to be summoned to him. And when the chief was brought forth, Soto asked for gold. And when Soto was denied, he decapitated each chief so all could see. And his men took in more slaves and women, and they slaughtered the rest. And their march of death continued. Rankel wrote again in his journal, 
to overlook the frozen solid river with Moscoso. He made his daily count. He lowered his head and sighed. Many more days passed. There were gray skies with no sun. And as the days passed, the army suffered painful and unbearable hunger. Sir, may I have a word with you? What is it, Rankal? said Moscoso. The rations, we're... I know, said Moscoso. I've heard. We'll have to make do. I don't see how we can, sir. We've lost too many servants. We just don't have enough food. We found it before. We'll just have to find it again. And with that look, the look of incredulity and prosperous faith, Moscoso departed. Soto sat by Ortiz in the dying light. They spoke and rambled. The blind man and the madman. Their voices cracked and strained. Beyond the south, there are lands of plenty. Where are we, Juan? Another child without his... Where are we, Juan? Lands of plenty, food, food and land. Ortiz dripped his head and fell to slumber. Soto continued to listen to the villagers. And when he had enough, he took a knife and slit a man's throat. Then he walked away and went alone. And in the dark, Soto remained alone. He talked to himself and the universe. He shouted and cried. His dreams and reality were woven into each other. They were seamlessly welded together and indistinguishable. And his madness continued well into the night stars. He spoke his words aloud with drunken conviction. Beyond. 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 His servants trudged back and forth. The rest of the men stayed back and watched. Flag. Where is the flag? Give me the fucking flag. The servants brought the encrusted stained flag of Spain to Soto. And he clutched it to his bosom as if it were his child. And as Soto spoke, all of his men stared. And the madness engulfed. My special friend, Holy Spain, I shall never return. Images floated through his mind. He saw familiar souls. He saw Coronado, Nunez, and Sardina. The images stood like statues. He spat in disgust and waved his sword. And Soto approached each one. All this blood, all these rivers. But where are the fruits? Where are our fruits of victory? His army stood and stared. They cringed and sighed and shook their heads. And Soto screamed only louder. They're deeper, deeper. And that's why you've all failed. You didn't go deep enough. You were all wrong. You bastards were all wrong. You quit too soon. You all be forgotten bastards. Because you haven't suffered enough. Nunez. I know why they call you Kebese de Vaca. No one believes you. Because you are wrong. They are not people. They are mere savages. Savages! Coronado, I never met you in my life. But that doesn't matter. You will always be an idiot. 
But Sardina, you, Sardina, you disappoint me the most. You make me so fucking sad. You could have had it all, man. You could have been a king! February ended. The Mississippi thawed. But still, the madness drew them forward. We build rafts, said Soda. So they did. One last hope. The land down south. And still, the river flowed. My body ached. My head was numb. I had no idea how much time had passed. Soto's men were right in front of me. I hid my view from them and stood behind a tree as I heard them shout and swear. I heard them grunt and slash, and I heard the cannon blast one after another. Then I saw their wooden rafts approach. Some dozen men crowded each one and my eyes fixated on the face of one young soldier. He couldn't have been more than 18 years old. All the pain and all the sadness, I saw it all in that young man's face. He was young, but he looked so old. This old young man, his gray and dead eyes looked just like Soto's. He reminded me of myself before Karimaka, and he reminded me of that day, that day on the beach with Francisco, the day I lost my soul. Another man cried out his name. Vicente! Vicente! The scream grew louder. Vicente! The young man responded. And when he did, I let go of my gaze. And I watched the raft disappear. The 3rd of March. Another day. Cold and brittle. Another village lies ahead. The army slays its residents and pillages for food. They take bushels of grain and dry corn but they find nothing else. There is no kake, no chief, no ruler of any kind. Soto screams and hobbles. He gives the signal, and they torch it all asunder. I smelled smoke from the south and a burn from morning to dusk. Black plumes of smoke filled the air. Then another hour passed, and I heard screams. They were screams from slaves. Most of them were still in chains. They ran down the hills and past me. I saw about 50 of them, men, women, and children, young and old. And all of them had an everlasting sadness in their eyes. The smoke clears at twilight. Five miles away, two tribes emerge and form. They settle and negotiate. They plan accordingly. They sharpen their spears and arrows, and they pray to the moon and the tide. They pray for healing, and they pray for guidance in the coming days. They will fight the Spanish tomorrow. They will defend and attack and defy. And as the day drew, I saw something I never thought I would. A set of tribes stood their ground against Soto's army, and they simply did not surrender. They stood united and fought the entire day. They saw me, but they paid me no attention. They were waiting. They were ready and focused. 
they closed their eyes and prayed, and I understood. They blew in their fist. They screamed at the sun. And when the battle began, their eyes lit up in utmost defiance. And it reminded me of Manco and his brave Incas. And for that day, the tribe stood defiant and outfought Soto's army. They defended their lands and held their ground. The 1st of April. Rankow tries to finish his diary entry. The ink won't come out. His hands turn black. The gentleman of Alvas doesn't even try. His head throbs in pain. The army passes through once more. The river finally thaws. Sunlight returns, but only slightly. The army keeps marching. Soto rides on. His horse gives out and collapses. Both fall to the frozen ground. His men assist him. Soto calls them back. He bends over, takes out his sword, and slices the horse's throat. Blood runs down his hand. He presses his finger to the wound and gives it a taste. He gets back up. Horse! Immediately, another horse is brought to him. Soto mounts up. He says one word, and his men follow. Vamos! Snow turns back to rain. Soto looks at the river, lost in thought, lost in gaze. He speaks to himself. He answers back. Just like Peru. The 15th of April. Soto's eyes twitch in and out. Demented. Beaten. Gone. Balthasar catches up with him. Soto ignores him and slips deeper into heavy dream. Don Hernando, Don Hernando, the men need to rest. One more week. There? No response. Soto dips his head up and down. The dream overtakes him. Don Hernando, do you hear me? Soto snaps back his head. The world comes back to him. He forms a sadistic grin. We come from Spain. We come from Holy Spain. Soto shows Balthazar his hand. His finger bleeds. Blood drips to the ground. He points to the river. This river, this is it. This is the one. Well known, Balthazar. Well known to you and me. Don Hernando, the men, they can't go on. We must. They can go on. They're half dead, sir. They're starving. Look at them. They can't go on. They can't possibly go on. Can't you see? Can't you see, Don Hernando? Just beyond. Just beyond. We're here. Soto now gives in fully to the endless gaze. His mouth hangs open. He grins. Sir! One more march. One more. To the river's end. We're there, Balthazar. The 29th of April. Rain pours. Soto leads his army down the river on five barges. 
he stands on the helm. His head still. His eyes bloodied. High tide. The currents whip left to right. The barges float like tiny corks. The men scream, trying to keep their balance and their hope. Several fall overboard. They make landfall. The slaves commiserate. They wail and curse. Soto grabs one of the slaves and strangles his neck. Ortiz! What are they saying, Ortiz? They're setting up an ambush, aren't they? Aren't they? Soto lets go and pierces the slave in the stomach. He turns to his men. Where are we? Where's Ortiz? The first of May. Soto approached the medic as the afternoon slipped to dusk. Inside the tent laid Ortiz. His face was pale and his body motionless. Soto stood by his side and asked his questions. And Ortiz babbled incoherently. They say you're dying, said Soto. That's by far the best news I've heard all day. You've been given your last rites, Ortiz. Eduardo is a good priest. Your prayers will be answered. Ortiz tried to raise his arm, but he simply didn't have the strength. Don't strain yourself. Words don't matter to you anymore. I doubt if they ever did. Don't make a spectacle out of it. You should have died many times, Juan. I'm surprised you lasted even this long. But for some reason, I trusted you. Only a madman trusts a blind man. And here we are. Ortiz hacked and coughed out blood. It spilled down his entire face. Soto looked away. No one ever listens. All they do is cough and die. If you're going to die, Juan, please die quickly. We can't see you suffer. You've been a good man, Juan. But I must tell you the truth. I never liked you. And that's all I'll ever know for sure. When I first met you, I thought you were a gift from God. I really did, Ortiz. But ever since that day, it's become clearer and clearer what you really are. Ortiz's face remained blank, cold and gray, and he finally shut his eyes. You're a blind man. You're a blind fucking man. And we've been following you all this time. Took me two years to realize how blind you were. And how blind we were. I should have known. But I fell in love with you. I fell in love with the idea of you. A savior. A guide. A wise man. You're none of these things. You never were. But this is my fault. It's all my fault. I followed you. I followed you down to hell and kept going. And I'm the fucking fool. Ortiz coughed and hacked again. He spat in Soto's face. But Soto only smiled. I'm the fucking fool! A harsh wind blew in from the east, and a half hour later, Ortiz finally died. His body lay upon a pile of wood, and Soto ordered the men to set it afire. 
In the morning, they held a vigil in the pouring rain. It lasted only five minutes. Soto did not attend. The rain swelled, and the captains called attention to their men. And at midday, they went off again. And the march continued. The 5th of May. It was the last day Soto had stood. In the morning, he fought his last battle. However, the night before, he went out alone to search for his kingdom. He went to the rivers of blood to fight the ghosts and demons of the past. And in the darkness, Soto followed the stars that no other man would dare to follow. The rain had stopped, but Soto pressed on. Blood kept pouring down from his nose to his chin. His muddied boots clanged the dirt. He brought no horse. He brought only his sword and his will. He was miles from his men, and throughout the twilight until noon, Soto pressed on. His mouth hung open. His eyes bleared and strained. Through the fog, a warm air had returned. He saw a trail of smoke from the east, and he followed it towards the end of the bend. Through the marsh, he saw a village. It was abandoned, but it had plenty food. There were rows of corn and beans and squash all ready for harvest. Then Soto saw a dead possum with its tail severed and its entrails carved out in green pus of mold and excrement. Throughout its entire body swarmed a mass of maggots that were inhaling it whole. And Soto watched with insane pleasure. Then he went out to another hill. He heard a bird cry. And he looked in all directions. His gaze continued. He nodded and drifted in and out of sleep. Then a branch snapped. His eyes opened again, and his head swerved up and down. Images floated across his countenance, and he vomited out of his nose. Then Soto heard voices. Voices of the past, familiar, faint, and peculiar. They came in clear. He peered and saw a distant flame. It was bright and bulging. And amongst the fire stood his cohorts, Almagro and Francisco Pizarro. He watched and listened to their scheme as they delved their grand Cusco in half. He stared directly at their faces, but they never once looked at him. He shouted at them, begging them to respond, but they simply ignored him. Then other voices spoke. The brothers Pizarro, Juan, Gonzalo, and Hernando. And Soto watched them gathered around the table and listened to them speak the first holy language, the language of gold. This gold. The land is full of it. Finally, finally, brothers. All rivers lead to gold. These Incas have it all. These Incas are bastards. We shall kill them all. We don't have to kill them all. We just have to live with them until they're conquered. All will be gained, my brothers. All rivers lead to gold. They've always have. Then all went quiet. Their mouths disappeared in the fog. Their faces vanished as well. Soto rushed forth and screamed their names. Francisco! Gonzalo! Hernando! Juan! But all the brothers had disappeared. Soto walked further. 
a queer light appeared from the river south, and a child ran out into the distance. The child's eyes were big as the moon, and Soto followed him for a quarter of a mile. The child approached the river and jumped in, and Soto merely watched. The child fell to the bottom and drowned, and the river turned red with blood. The blood came in many forms, the blood of all Soto had slain, the blood of the Inca and the Hussar and the Timakua and all the tribes who had no names, the blood of all that made the dream. And soon the screams came from deep within the river's heart, the shrills, the cries, the moans and the shouts and the river went on and surged. And soon Soto's entire body submerged in blood. He stood, he smiled, he drank, and he savored. But then the river receded. And internally, Soto knew what that had meant. The kingdom was nigh. The kingdom was his and his alone. It rained again, and Soto shouted and waited for all the gold in the world to fall from the sky. The rubies and emeralds, the silver and the turquoise. But there was no such thing. There was only rain, only water. The mud crept to his knees, and soon again the water turned to blood. And from within the red mist, Soto saw the royal court of Spain with King Charles at the helm. They were all dressed in their finest garb, and their teeth were stained with wine. Soto shouted at them, but it did not matter. They ignored him and walked away, each looking solemn and perturbed. Soto rushed forth and swung his sword at them in rage, but they all disappeared. Blood rained again. Soto staggered. His entire face was splattered and ravaged, and the blood kept falling. Then Soto heard a thud. He saw heavy blocks of wood fall down from the sky. He followed the streams and shards. And below, a golden glow had emerged. And in that glow were a set of rotted wooden chests. And inside each were riches beyond Soto's wildest dreams. His fortune and glory. He approached the first chest and opened it. It was silver, whole and pure. He cradled it like a mother would do to a child. Then he found another chest filled with rubies. And he found another one not too far from that. Then he saw a much larger chest filled with gold. And he closed his eyes and cried. When he had awoken, the gold was still there. All the rubies and silver, sapphire and turquoise were still there in their rotted wooden chest. The rain stopped. Then Soto felt a sharp pain enter through his back. And suddenly, he couldn't move. A man came out from the bush. His head held down. His face sad. And Soto instantly knew. Sardina! Sardina! But Sardina did not reply. The man came closer. Soto hobbled and winced through the pain. We're here, Sardina! Sardina! The river leads to gold! Look at it! Look at it, you sad son of a bitch! Soto laughed. He laughed good and hard until he coughed. I can't believe it myself. 
Sardina kept walking. This is why we've suffered. We've won. We finally won. You shouldn't look so sad. Your dream has finally come. This dream. Our dream. We're right here. Behold our kingdom. Sardina. Sardina, you stupid bastard. Why are you walking away? The pain swelled and got stronger. Soto sweated throughout his entire body. Suddenly, he could not move. He riled in pain with every step he took. And after ten paces, Sardina had vanished. And Soto was alone again. He returned to the chest and gathered his fortunes. Another snap of a tree branch startled his ears and sounded like cannon fire. Soto turned from side to side. Then he heard another snap, clearer than before. Then Soto turned and saw the lady. She was dressed in the same white gown he remembered, and indeed, it was her. The lady of Kofita Chete. And Soto was overcome by the same palpable feelings of unstoppable lust. And he gazed for what felt like hours. My lady. She remained too far off in the distance. Again, her black hair flowed and whipped in the wind. My lady. Her gown fluttered. Her face grew stern. She was still young and bright and beautiful. My lady, come closer. I want to. I want to. The lady stood silent. Soto hobbled closer. They stood ten feet from each other, and tears fell from her eyes. My lady, why? Why are you crying? Why are you crying, my lady? Then the lady turned her back and ran, and Soto dashed right after her. He slashed through vines and shrubs and heard an ungodly squeal. Then the ground shook. He saw a black boar the size of a mature ram. It had tusks on either side of its face and it snarled and ran. And Soto stared and smiled back. Soto crept forward with his sword in hand. Then the boar lunged after Soto with all its weight and force, and Soto fell to the ground. Its heavy tusks pierced through Soto's armor and ripped right into his knee. The cut was deep and hard, and Soto yelled and buckled. He struck the boar and slashed his sword across its face. The boar shrieked and spun wildly as a trail of blood dripped down to the mud. Soto fought through the pain and got back to his feet. The boar scampered back to all fours, but it was too late. And in all the pain and agony, Soto lifted his sword and plunged it straight down the boar's neck. He repeated it seven times, each blow more powerful and methodical than the next. And after he finished, Soto clutched onto the boar's body and ran his hands through its intestines. The rain fell again. Soto returned to the chest. Those of gold, silver, and sapphire, and of rubies and pearls. He wiped the sweat and tears off his face. Then he marched on. His armor was rusted and red and blood continued to gush out from his knee. The rain fell harder. The river ran again. Soto stopped his stride. His mouth hung open. 
He saw two of the chests near the great oak. They seemed so very far away. He approached the chests, and the golden light glowed. Then a figure stepped forward from behind an oak tree. Soto halted and blinked several times. Sardana, come back, huh? But it wasn't. It was the lady. She stood in between the chests, and light radiated from her entire body. And in the fallen rain, they stared at each other long and hard again. Her eyes looked very sad. The lady cried. A light exploded from her body and blinded Soto for several seconds. Then the light disappeared. And Soto remained standing. His eyes twitched. But the lady was still crying. Why are you crying, my lady? It's only blood. It's only... He took one last step. And the lady shrieked. The shriek pierced and echoed through the land. And the lady and all the chest of Soto's fortune levitated and vanished in the air. The chest fell back to the ground, but the treasure was gone. There was only corn, beans, and straw. For an entire hour, Soto screamed and slashed away at the fallen rain. Then, complete darkness sended over the land. He swung one last final time, and he fell to the ground. Each captain remained in silence as the inevitable fell upon them. Soto was found the next day, and his men ushered him into a tent. The torches flickered in the moonlight, and the voices murmured in the dark. Is he dead? No. He was stabbed. Who did it? I can't tell. Is he dead? No. He's fallen ill. They say he has a fever. Did he say anything today? No. Did he open his eyes? Yes. Several times. He should have died a year ago. As days went on, Soto remained motionless in his tent. His face was gray and he barely breathed. But he wasn't dead yet. His men surrounded him. Some prayed. Others merely waited. Another week passed. The priest gave him his last rites. Three more days had passed. And finally... On the 21st of May, Soto died. The funeral commenced the following day. The captains gathered, and Moscoso spoke to each of them. I will give no speech. I will tell only what is necessary. Don Hernando has died. I am now in charge of the Entrada. We shall bury him in the river. We shall bury him tonight. Balthazar sighed. It took him several more minutes to gain composure. Why are we burying him in the river? He asked. This was his request, said Moscoso. Those who believe he was mortal were absolutely correct. But to those who believed he was a child of the sun, let them still believe. Let them still wonder. That was his request. And so the night came, and the entire army gathered. They huddled around a wooden box, 
and the slaves carried the box and loaded it onto a raft. They lit their torches and rode five leagues into the river. The monks hovered over the box and they recited a dirge and they gave Soto his last blessing. Then they lowered the box and wrapped it in chains. And they watched the box sink to the bottom. They said their prayers, but none of them had cried. And when the box sunk to the bottom, they rode back to shore. The next day, Moscoso held the army at attention. The monks read aloud. The secretaries recorded, and Alvas and Rankow looked at each other with absolute disdain. But Moscoso repeated what was most important. The entrada was finally over. They would head back west to Mexico. New Spain, old Spain. Anywhere but here, Moscoso said. They marched and trudged and left the river for good. During the night, one soldier could not keep from crying. He cried and cried again. And he wailed and sobbed and cursed at God as he sat alone at a fire. Moscoso went over to the man. They talked, but not for long. Get up, Vicente. Thinking is not good for the soul. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sir. I'm lost. We're all lost, said Moscoso. New Spain awaits us. You should focus on that. I don't know what's right or wrong anymore, said Vicente. You'll remember said Moscoso. But we fought so hard. We gave up so much. We went so far. We did, Vicente. And we lost. But sir. Then Moscoso looked at him for the final time. He sighed and pointed west. The dream is dead, son. It might take your entire life, but you have to accept it. It's done. I walked for another month. I was exhausted. I no longer knew anything. But still, I felt. I felt pain, guilt and horror. I thought I had died many times, but I was still alive. And the river kept going. Soto was either dead or king by now. I didn't give a damn about him anymore. But still, his voice lingered in my mind. Dreams. Dreams, Sardina. Dreams. That's all they were. Horrible and evil dreams that caused so much pain. And the realization of it made me sadder. I spent my entire life searching for something that just wasn't there. But still, I wanted to find my real answer. The answer to why I'd gone so far for so long. The answer was beyond gold and beyond fortune. The answer was of truth and beauty. It was an answer of goodness and meaning. And when I found it, I knew I would finally feel whole. And my father's words still called to me. Go beyond 
Go beyond my son. At the river's end, you'll find your answer. So I did. I kept going. And I knew for certain that my father was right. I rested along a meadow of beautiful flowers and flowing streams of jumping fish. And from there, I saw another tribe. I waved my hands in peace. The tribe stared at me, but not a single one of them was frightened. Then a man approached and offered his hand. As he got closer, I realized he was not a native. His beard was thick and heavy, and he appeared very young. He was a Spaniard, dressed in tribal guard. He spoke to me in Spanish. I couldn't believe him at first, and it took me a long time to respond. What is your name? Sardina, I finally said. My name is Hector, said the man. Welcome, Sardina. What brings you here? I didn't answer. I didn't know how. I looked at him long and hard. He did the same. I shook his hand, but then I looked into his eyes. There was so much joy and peace and understanding. And he looked like the happiest man on the face of the earth. We welcome you, Sardina. I looked over to his tribe. He nodded to them, and they all nodded back with grace and certainty. Then Hector walked and pointed, and I followed him. Ahead was rich soil and a stretch of small houses. And at midday, I saw the children planting corn. In that instant, it reminded me of the people in the valley of the Corazones. They planted with their hands and pressed their feet upon the soil. And with each seed, they whispered a word and a prayer. Hector joined them and obliged me to do the same. We planted the entire field in less than an hour. And in all that time, we hadn't said a word. The sun died, and the younger men of the tribe gathered sticks for the night's fire. Hours later, I sat next to Hector and his wife, and we shared a meal. We shared a pipe and smoked. Then we talked for quite some time. Where are you from, friend? I wish I could remember. I forgot why I came. I did too, Sardina. But I finally found what I was looking for. And it's here. It's here. This is my wife. These are my people now. I am one of them. And I am grateful. A few hours passed. After a long prayer, the rest of the tribe went to sleep. I stayed up with Hector, and we kept each other company along the fire. I looked at Hector's face, and when his wife carried his newborn and brought him to his side, I saw his face light up with great joy. And it was then that I realized who Hector really was. These are fine people, I said. They're my family, Hector said. Your wife is beautiful. Thank you. She's everything. Your whole family. They're so beautiful. They're everything. And I knew when Hector said those words, he meant it. I saw it in his eyes. 
You look tired, man, he said. I'm very tired, I said. What is it, Sardina? Why? I still haven't found it. Found what? The river's end. What's there to find? Yes. I don't know, I said. You don't know? No. I see, Hector said. We stayed silent for a long time. Then I finally asked him. Do you know where it is? I do, said Hector. Will you show me, Hector? I will. It's not as far as you think. We'll go in the morning. I'll take you as far as I can. And in the morning, we trekked. I knew I had only a few hours left with him. I didn't count the miles. I just looked at the sun. Then about midday, he paused and pointed his finger. And there it was. The river's end. The land had ceased. The river led to an endless sea. Then Hector looked at me and let out a sigh. And after another minute, he shook my hand and departed. And I was alone again. The sea was endless, just like the jungle and just like the desert. It was empty and painful. And I closed my eyes. That voice that guided me soon drifted into the clouds. And when I looked up, I saw my father. I cried as he smiled down upon me. And for an hour, I searched in tears. It felt like an eternity. But I knew something was there. And I felt it deep within my soul. And there she was. She stood before the palms. I closed my eyes, thinking she was a dream. But she wasn't. She was the same woman I saw long ago. She stood still, and she looked right through me. But her eyes were soft. The fear was gone. There was only love. I stood frozen and I gazed at her. For she, like the river, was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. She didn't say a word. She didn't need to. She wasn't frightened. She neither quivered nor did she move. She stood and she stared longingly with ease. And when I looked again in her eyes, I saw the whole world. It was alive and beautiful. It was at peace with no judgment. It was the world I once knew the world I'd longed for and missed dearly. And I saw it all in her. We moved towards each other and kept our gaze. And when I saw her smile, I finally found what I had been searching for my entire life. And she was it. Then she came by my side and rested her head along my shoulder. I held her body and she looked up. And when she did, I cried. 
At the river's end, all the thoughts were gone. All the pain, the misery, the strife, and the madness were washed away by the tide. And as the sun faded down, we looked at each other again. And each and every second, she restored my faith in everything. Then she dipped her head into my shoulders, rose up, and showed me once more all the glorious world that was all around me, that was here all this time, that I just could not see. She pointed to the trees, the river, and the upcoming orange moon, and we watched the sun die in the clouds. Then our eyes became one, and she held my hand.